Novel title. Modern Weapon Cheats Travel Through a Fantasy World by author, Tomahawk. Raw source, https colon slash slash encode.sosatu.com slash n7244 bl slash volume 03 volume 03 chapter 01 volume 03 chapter 01. In order to counter the demon and beast tribes of the Elza's magic empire, which boasted physical capabilities said to be several times or even dozens of times greater than those of humans, the Empire launched an invasion against the Demon Confederation with several dozen warships, numerous magical weapons created by transients, and automata as new weapons, along with a force of 300,000 soldiers. The invasion had been ongoing for about three weeks. The Demon Confederation, caught off guard by the sudden invasion of the Empire's forces without any prior warning, had deployed its troops along the border within fortresses constructed to form defensive lines. Learning of the Empire's large-scale invasion of the Canary Kingdom through spy reports, the Confederation had never anticipated the Empire's simultaneous dual-front assault, thus being taken by surprise by the unexpected onslaught of the Imperial forces. The demon forces, entrenched within the fortresses, aim to stall for time and await reinforcements against the Empire forces that suddenly cross the border without warning. However, they found themselves helpless against the overwhelming assault of the Imperial forces, who advanced with an array of magic-infused weaponry such as lance-shaped magical cannons incorporated with magical barrier spells, armored with defenses impervious to ordinary attacks, and deploying magical humanoid war machines devoid of any emotions but to obey orders, functioning as ruthless killing machines. Despite desperate resistance from the demon forces entrenched within the fortress, predominantly composed of soldiers relying on their martial prowess rather than magic, their compatibility with the Empire's magical weapons and automata was abysmal. As a result, within approximately three weeks, the Imperial forces, with their overwhelming might, systematically conquered one fortress after another, breaching the formidable fortresses erected by the Demon Confederation along the border. Subsequently, the Empire swiftly advanced into the territory of the Demon Confederation akin to lightning strikes. The main force of the Demon Army, led by the Demon King, confronted the advancing Imperial forces on a vast plain. However, due to the battle with the transients claiming to be heroes, the Demon King was injured, and the Demon Army suffered severe casualties from the Imperial forces, leading to a retreat. They failed to halt the Imperial advance and were unable to repel them from their territory. Having breached the fortresses and defeated the main force of the Demon Army, the unstoppable advance of the Imperial forces continued. They raided cities and villages along their march route under the pretext of the righteous cause of the Lo Yuan religion. In the raided cities and villages, atrocities were committed, and ultimately, following the tenets of the Lo Yuan religion, every single demon was slaughtered. Furthermore, the Imperial forces captured any humans found living alongside the demons in the raided cities and villages, ostensibly to convert them but in reality, to reduce them to slavery. Amidst such scenes of infernal chaos unfolding daily across the territory of the Demon Confederation, the forest, dense with lush foliage and towering trees hundreds to thousands of years old, witnessed the frantic flight of two elven sisters. The city where the sisters resided had also been devastated by the onslaught of the Imperial forces, as the remaining demon army and the city's militia resisted desperately to allow the townspeople to escape, the sisters narrowly managed to flee from the city amidst the chaos of war. However, just as they sought refuge in the forest, they were discovered by Imperial pursuers leading the charge ahead, with a determined expression, was the elder sister, Sarisa, trailing behind her hand clasped tightly, was the younger sister, Lydia, still tender in years, ha, ha, sis, I can't run anymore, Lydia, you're almost there, so please do your best, but I can't move my legs anymore, saying that, Lydia put her hand on a large tree and sank to the ground, breathing heavily, Lydia, stand up quickly, if you don't run away, you'll be killed, sister, go first, Although Sarissa was encouraging Lydia, Sarissa's own body was tired from running while caring for Lydia for a long time and was screaming. So it was obvious that she couldn't run for a long time. However, Sarissa ignored her own fatigue and encouraged Lydia, trying to get away from this place as soon as possible. Look what you're talking about, Lydia. 
Let's go. Just as Sarissa was about to continue, she heard a rustling sound coming from the bushes around her, and the reason her sisters had to run so far away appeared. We've finally caught up. Don't let your demi-human appearance bother us. It was the Imperial Army soldiers who came out from the bushes and surrounded the sisters in pursuit. That's it. Have you already caught up with me? Sarissa was upset that her pursuers caught up to her much faster than she expected. Don't you think you can die easily after putting so much effort into us? We'll torment you thoroughly and then kill you. Tears welled up in their eyes as they listened to the soldiers' words and imagined their own tragic future. That's when the soldiers approached to capture the sisters, who had given up on running away and were trembling as they hugged each other. The soldier's arm suddenly flew off as he reached out to the sisters. Jaya, oh, it's mine. My arm is ah. Uh. The soldier whose upper arm was blown off immediately put pressure on the wound, but a huge amount of blood dripped onto the ground from the wound, causing the soldier to thrash around on the ground in agony and sprinkling blood. The Imperial soldiers and the elf sisters froze in a daze, not understanding what had happened to the soldier writhing in front of them. Oh, hey, it's okay. Hey. What happened? Ah, my arm is. When the soldiers came back to their senses and tried to move, they were shot in the vital points of their bodies, their brains and hearts, and died. In front of the sight of Imperial soldiers suddenly dying in front of their eyes without a sound, the two, not knowing what was happening, trembled and hugged each other tightly, enduring the fear. R. R. I would fugigo LP. The last remaining Imperial Army soldier tried to run away from the scene, trying to escape from the scene while uttering a loud voice that didn't seem to be human, unable to bear the unknown fear, but as he ran a few steps away, he was interrupted by other soldiers. Similarly, he was shot in the head and fell to the ground with a thud, his brain plasma spilling all over the place. Oh, are you done? In the forest, where every single soldier of the Imperial Army had been killed and the only sounds left was the chirping of birds and the rustling of grass and tree branches, Sarisa gently raised her head, slowly looked around her surroundings, and muttered softly. I heard a sound like when Imperial soldiers appeared, scraping through the grass, and then a humanoid creature I had never seen before, completely covered in grass, appeared and surrounded the sisters. The sisters were so frightened that they lost consciousness in front of the creepy creatures that were gathering one after another. Why haven't the supplely troops arrived yet? We can't advance any further like this. In the encampment of a certain unit that had been ordered to attack from a different direction by the main force of the Imperial Army, which was advancing straight toward the capital of the Demon Alliance, the irritated voice of a nobleman, the commander, echoed. It seems that someone is attacking the Supplely troops in the forest along the Supplely route according to the soldiers' gossip, they're saying it's the Grim Reaper. Grim Reaper? It's probably just some surviving demon scum or something. Just kill them already. W well, it seems that it's not quite the work of the demon clan then who the hell is attacking the Supplely troops? We don't know. No one has seen the attackers, after all upon hearing the report from his anxious subordinate, the commander made a decision. All right. In that case, send out a unit to uncover the identity of this so-called Grim Reaper. With those words from the commander, 40 magical weapons, 50 automatons, and a thousand soldiers were dispatched to the forest where the Grim Reaper was said to appear comprising about half of the unit. Well, well, the enemy seems to be getting serious. One of the special units sent promptly to the Imperial Army to carry out various missions, including surprise attacks with one-strike withdrawals, assassination of commanders, requests for airstrikes on enemy bases, and cutting off supply routes, is the Delta 2nd Platoon. Clements, a second lieutenant in the platoon, clad in a forest camouflage ghillie suit blended seamlessly into the forest as he watched the Imperial Army's troops approaching the woods in formation through his binoculars. We've got quite a selection here. Next to Lieutenant Clements, eagerly waiting for the enemy to come, was Second Lieutenant Shimohai, known as the White Reaper, with a confident smile on his face, holding his favorite Mosin Nagant M28 rifle. It's a good selection indeed, but isn't the enemy's number a bit too much? Lieutenant? As Lieutenant Clements muttered, a radio transmission came in. This is Hound Dog 01. Attention all personnel. According to reconnaissance by the RQ-11 Raven, the enemy is approaching us with a force consisting of 40 magical weapons, about 500 automatons, as well as light infantry, 
riflemen, and mages, totaling approximately 1,000 to 1,500 troops. Considering the difference in strength, we'll lure the enemy into the trap zone and annihilate them. Begin your actions. Understood. That's the plan. Let's move. Lieutenant Clements replied to the platoon leader's call sign, Hound Dog 01, and then signaled to Second Lieutenant High, who was gazing at the Imperial Army soldiers like a predatory beast with sharp eyes, to begin moving cautiously to avoid detection by the enemy. What in the world is this? Three days after sending the troops into the forest where the Grim Reaper was said to appear, all contact with the dispatched unit was lost, despite repeatedly sending messengers to establish contact. Not even one of them returned. Consequently, the commander himself, accompanied by the remaining forces, went to the forest where the Grim Reaper was said to appear. What they found there were the mercilessly destroyed remains of magical weapons and automatons, as well as the silent corpses of the soldiers. Three days ago, the Delta Second Platoon, which had intercepted the Imperial Army troops, skillfully led them into a trap zone deep in the forest. As the Imperial Army unit entered the forest, magical weapons stood in a single line as their vanguard, wielding shields and magic cannons vigilantly, while automatons marched in formation as the middle guard, followed by infantry in a slightly dispersed formation as the rear guard. The trap was cunningly set up to ensnare the Imperial Army unit. As soon as the Imperial Army unit entered the designated trap zone, all traps were activated simultaneously. First, the jumping mines buried in the ground leapt up to a height of about 1.5 meters and exploded, while at the same time, the claymore mines with directional fragmentation were detonated, releasing metal balls in all directions in a 360-degree radius. Many infantrymen were injured or killed by a sudden storm of metallic spheres that raged through the forest. While landmine attacks had little effect on automatons, magically shielded by robust armor, and automata, which could continue functioning unless their vulnerable head parts were completely destroyed. They were decimated by concentrated barrages from MK.19 automatic grenade launchers and M2 heavy machine guns immediately after the landmines detonated. Particularly effective in decimating the automatons was the MK.19 automatic grenade launcher. The ammunition utilized for this weapon consisted of 40 mm x 53 grenades the M430 multi-purpose grenades capable of killing personnel within a radius of 5 meters from the point of impact and inflicting injuries within a radius of 15 meters. These grenades could penetrate approximately 5 centimeters of armor, making them effective against lightly armored targets such as infantry fighting vehicles and armored personnel carriers, as well as groups of infantry. Notably, the ammunition used by the M203 grenade launcher consisted of 40mm x 46 grenades primarily designed for anti-personnel purposes, with no compatibility with the 40mm x 53 grenades used by the MK.19 automatic grenade launcher, representing entirely different ordnance with a vastly different effective range. Despite withstanding the onslaught of MK.19 automatic grenade launchers M430 multipurpose grenades and the 12.7mm rounds from the M2 heavy machine guns, the surviving magical weapons, forming defensive formations, attempted to shield the remaining infantrymen from the barrage. They began to retreat gradually, seemingly planning a counterattack. Yet their indiscriminate firing of magical energy bolts from magical cannons missed their marks entirely. In response to this token resistance, rebounds per game 7S, M72 laws firing anti-tank rockets, Type 87 anti-tank guided missiles, and FGM 148 Javelin anti-tank missiles were launched as a retaliatory measure from Delta Second Company. Magical weapons, subjected to concentrated attacks from anti-tank rockets and missiles capable of destroying heavily armored vehicles such as tanks, were swiftly annihilated. Subsequently, despite approximately 300 infantrymen surviving the onslaught, witnessing the annihilation of their magical weapons and automatons, they attempted to flee from the forest, deeming themselves outmatched. However, they were met with a sniper squad and Lieutenant High's Mosin Nagant M28 and KP-31 submachine gun, resulting in their complete elimination, leaving none alive within the forest. Unaware of these events, the commanding officer was agitated, 
questioning aloud, all our magical weapons and automatons are destroyed, how did the enemy manage to destroy our magical weapons, they should have been equipped with high level fire magic resistant magical barriers incorporated into their armor, furthermore the fact that there are only our soldiers corpses and not a single enemy's corpse what does that imply? Corpses littered throughout the forest were all those of their own soldiers, either shot through the chest or head, killed instantly, riddled with numerous bullets, or reduced to ashes, leaving three distinct types of casualties. Moreover, the magical weapons and automatons, once considered invaluable assets against the superior physical capabilities of the demon race, were now shattered into pieces. Is there truly a grim reaper lurking within this forest? The commanding officer felt a chill run down his spine as he surveyed the grim scene before him. As he attempted to issue a retreat order to the scattered units within the forest, eager to leave the area as soon as possible, he was interrupted by the screams of soldiers and continuous explosions originating deeper within the forest. Remaining here meant certain death, as the male commanding officer turned to flee. He witnessed the moment a bullet pierced through the forehead of a subordinate standing behind him. As his subordinate slowly collapsed backward, struck by the bullet, the commanding officer, staring blankly, was also struck in the head by a 7.62 mm bullet moments later, losing consciousness forever. Direct hit on the initial target, headshot. Ignoring the report from Lieutenant Clemens, who served as the observer next to him, Lieutenant Hay, camouflaged among the surrounding vegetation in his gilly suit, smoothly operated the bolt of his Mosin-Nagant M28 and loaded the next round before pulling the trigger again. The next shot also hit, headshot, with astonishing speed. Lieutenant Hay took down two men who seemed to be commanders, prompting the soldiers around them to run out of the forest towards the outer perimeters. Damn! The trees are obstructing my shot angle. Lieutenant Hay muttered in frustration, while Lieutenant Clemens beside him exclaimed in amazement, as expected of Lieutenant Hay to consecutively hit targets' heads from 400 meters away using only the iron sights of the Mosin-Nagant M28 without a scope is truly remarkable. Stop boasting and let's chase after the ones who fled. Ignoring Lieutenant Clemens' words, Lieutenant Hay swiftly gathered spent cartridges and began to move. A. W. Wait a moment. Lieutenant, we don't need to go after them. Sergeant Slowcorker is stationed over there, so it's fine, right? Without listening to Clemens, Lieutenant Hay dashed off with his Mosin-Nagant M28, prompting Clemens to hurriedly follow suit. Leaving Clemens behind, Lieutenant Hay positioned himself on a perfect sniping point atop a hill. He took aim with his Mosin-Nagant M28, scanning the forest and systematically picked off enemies visible through the gaps between trees. I'm back. Several days after annihilating a unit of the Imperial Army during patrol duty, Lieutenant Clemens returned with Lieutenant Hay to the makeshift base where four MH-47G helicopters were parked. Welcome back. Greeting the soldiers who had been waiting and those who had returned earlier, the two went to their assigned area to rest. It's about time President Nagato and the others arrive here. Yes, indeed. If everything goes smoothly, we should reach the capital of the Demonic Union within the next two to three days. Once the President arrives and starts the counterattack in the capital, we'll finally be able to withdraw from duty. That's true but it's so boring. Shall we go check on that thing? Despite trekking through the forest all this time, you're still energetic. Lieutenant I'll go to sleep. Leaving a bewildered Lieutenant Clemens behind, Lieutenant Hay headed to a specific location. Hey there, any findings? Have you figured anything out? Addressing the maintenance personnel inspecting the three relatively intact captured magical weapons and two automatons aboard the MH-47G, Lieutenant Hay inquired. R. Lieutenant. So far, all we've determined is that these two weapons utilize basic electronic components in their control systems. Without further analysis back in our homeland, it's hard to say much I see. Well it seems these weapons are indeed made by outsiders, just as our intel suggested. Yes, considering the technological level of this world, even basic electronic components are unheard of, it's undoubtedly the work of outsiders. If they're capable of making something like this, it's likely they'll create more troubles things in the future. Indeed, the prospect is worrisome. 
Lieutenant Hay and the maintenance crew discussed with furrowed brows in front of the captured weapons. Preparations for dispatching troops to the Demon Alliance nation were progressing steadily in Purubim, where the command headquarters overseeing national defense and military operations convened a meeting with the heads of various departments, with Kazuya leading the assembly. Next, the Special Operations Commander. How are the special forces operating in the Demon Alliance nation? Well, sir, without any significant casualties, all units are smoothly carrying out their missions. However, due to the disruption in the Imperial Army's chain of command caused by the actions of our units and the resulting halt in supply delivery, the advancement has mostly come to a stop. I sent them as a delaying tactic, but it seems to have been more effective than anticipated. Kazuya nodded satisfactorily as he heard about the accomplishments of the special forces engaged in guerrilla warfare, disrupting and sabotaging Imperial Army operations across various locations in the Demon Alliance nation. All right. Next, the transportation commander. What's the progress on road maintenance, expansion, railway network construction? and material transport plans to the Demon Alliance nation. Yes, sir. In response to Kazuya's query, the transportation commander stood up and proceeded to read out the contents of the documents in hand. As for road maintenance, expansion, and railway network construction, things are proceeding smoothly. At this rate, we should be able to complete all stages within the scheduled time frame. Regarding material transport plans, we have prepared three times the expected consumption amount and arranged for their delivery to the necessary locations at the required times. For further details, please refer to page 15 of the report. Understood. Is there anything else to report? At Kazuya's inquiry, several individuals raised their hands. Then let's start with the Minister of Intelligence. Yes. First, regarding the Elza's magic empire, reconnaissance satellites and high-altitude reconnaissance aircraft have thoroughly surveyed the territory. As a result, three new airborne fortresses similar to the one encountered in the fortress city battles have been discovered. However, as those three seem to be incomplete in terms of upper-level structures, it is presumed they are under construction. Additionally, apart from the airborne fortresses, we have found several mobile fortresses, both land-based and maritime. More troubles things can't they wait until our forces are fully ready? Well, fine, keep an eye on those fortresses 24-7. If needed, we'll blow them away with concentrated use of SLBMs, submarine-launched ballistic missiles, or ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, equipped with conventional warheads. Anything else? While listening to the Minister of Intelligence's report, Kazuya frowned noticeably and prompted for further information. Yes, regarding the Regalis Empire, located 15,000 kilometers across the sea, surprising discoveries were made through the use of backup reconnaissance satellites. What is it? It appears that the Regalis Empire possesses technological capabilities comparable to those of the First World War, weapons included. Huh? Before coming to this world, I was given an explanation that it's a fantasy world with magic and demons. What's going on? This seems more like a sci-fi fantasy world. Is it pointless to nitpick? Or has everything become acceptable already? Come to think of it, didn't Phyllis say something like that? If they possess technological capabilities comparable to the First World War, why hasn't the Regalis Empire expanded to our continent? Don't they have territorial ambitions? As Kazuya pondered this question. He threw it to the Minister of Intelligence, who promptly provided an answer. It seems that the Regalis Empire is currently engaged in a large-scale war, leaving them with no spare capacity to interfere here. Additionally, there's a dangerous sea area called the Misty Sea, inhabited by gigantic marine creatures, separating our continent from theirs. It's likely they're not willing to risk danger by coming here unnecessarily. The Misty Sea so that natural barrier means the level of development differs between our continent and theirs? Well, whatever, it's pointless to dwell on it. I see. Then, keep monitoring the movements of the Regalis Empire just in case. Yes, sir. Understood. With the Minister of Intelligence acknowledging, Kazuya proceeded to the next agenda. Next, the Minister of Technology. Ha, regarding the magic furnace, we've received technological assistance from the Kingdom of Canaria and we've finalized plans for mass production. However, when we talk about mass production, well, the presence of sorcerers is indispensable for the manufacture of magic furnaces. Therefore, 
will utilize captured sorcerers to produce and must produce these furnaces. Additionally, regarding the magical weapons and automatons confiscated by the special forces operating in the Demon Alliance, it appears that basic electronic devices are utilized in their control systems. According to the reports, we'll need to investigate further, but there's a possibility we can produce these ourselves. As the Minister of Technology effortlessly presented the updates, Kazuya wasted no time in responding. I see. Then commence the mass production of the magic furnaces. Once the selection of ships to be equipped with these furnaces is finalized in consultation with the Navy Chief, report back. As for the magical weapons and automatons, conduct thorough investigations. We'll decide whether to proceed with mass production after that. Understood. Seating himself. The Minister of Technology addressed Admiral Chittas, who was the last to remain. Lastly, Admiral, ha! There are several matters to report, so I'll go through them in order. Firstly, preparations for dispatching troops to the Demon Alliance have been completed. The ground forces consist of a temporary division comprising M1A2 Abrams, Type 10 tanks, M2 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles, various striker armored vehicles, Humvees, and others. The aviation units include AC-130 ground attack aircraft, F-15E fighter bombers, A-10 attack aircraft, as well as various helicopters, which will be deployed to the base planned for construction near the capital of the Demon Alliance. Negotiations with the Demon Alliance regarding the construction of the base and other matters have been concluded. Next, regarding military equipment, weapon upgrades and refurbishment projects are 85% complete. Furthermore, weapons produced in the underground weapon factories of Parabim are being progressively deployed to the units, which is expected to alleviate weapon shortages. Additionally, about half of the training process for the volunteer militia units, composed of settlers who migrated to Parabim, has been completed. To date, Parabim has tentatively accepted around 4,000 prospective migrants from the Kingdom of Canaria from whom Kazuya has recruited volunteers and formed the volunteer militia units. Come to think of it, I completely forgot about creating those volunteer militia units. How are they performing? I'll just say we have high hopes for their future performance. Well, that's to be expected. Ah, uh, I remember now. I believe the weapons issued to the militia were mostly outdated, but I trust they're being properly managed. I assure you. We've implemented stricter weapon management regulations even compared to the self-defense forces. Additionally, to deter any misconduct where a militia member might attempt to remove weapons for personal reasons, we've embedded micro-explosive devices in their minds. Should any of them attempt to unlawfully take weapons, they can be eliminated instantly. That's reassuring but with this, we can finally put an end to our worries about insufficient military strength, weapon shortages. Yes, with the massive production of weapons in Parabim's underground weapon factories and their subsequent deployment to various units, Kazuya grinned with satisfaction, pleased that strengthening their military capabilities had become more manageable. After the meeting concluded, Kazuya returned to his room and sat down in a chair to take a break. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door and General Chitters entered, excuse me, what's up, Chitters, dash, and who are these children, Kazuya tilted his head as he glanced at the seven girls and women in maid uniforms, who had entered the room with General Chitters, well, Master Kazuya, since you mentioned directly heading to the Demon Alliance country, as a precaution, we've prepared additional assets for you besides the personal guards, Chitters explained, additional assets, Kazuya's face tensed slightly at Chitters's words, and the maid-clad girls stepped forward, bowing their heads. Observing these girls, Kazuya suddenly realized something. Hey, Chitters, are these girls by any chance yes? As you suspected, these are individuals we purchased from the underground dungeon of the capital. From the right, we have the vampire sisters, elder sister Rena and younger sister Lena, Ogrel, Lamia Shale, Dark Elf Luminous, Fox Folk Curot, and Wolfkin Wilhelm. I thought so. No wonder they looked familiar. Approaching the seven girls who were standing up with their heads lowered, Kazuya was met with a unanimous, intense gaze as they lifted their heads to look at him. Chitters, what's this about? Receiving the overly fervent gazes of the girls, Kazuya glanced at Chitters inquiringly, to which she responded with a slightly troubled smile. Well, you see for some reason, all of them are deeply devoted to you upon waking up. It's likely that when you healed them using your complete healing ability, your magic mingled deep within them, 
fostering this devotion towards you but the details are unclear. So there was such a brainwashing like side effect of the complete healing ability, as cause Yuya pondered over the implications of the complete healing ability, Chitters provided further clarification, also beside their names, they had lost all other memories. What? Perhaps due to the treatment they endured in the underground dungeon, I see, in front of Kazuya, who wore an indescribable expression, the girls, having undergone not only Chitters' training but also a one-sided ideological education exploiting their lost memories and their fervent loyalty to Kazuya, finally met him, they wore smiles as if flowers had bloomed, brimming with joy at finally meeting Kazuya. Volume 03 Chapter 03 From the forward base of Purubim located within the unreturnable forest, the extensive expansion and development of the roadway connecting Canary Kingdom through the demon-allied nations to the construction of a railway network, along with the establishment of a massive military base, surrounded by concrete walls and modern facilities, situated 20 kilometers away from the capital of the demon-allied nations, named Dale's Base after its geographical location. Probum swiftly completed these tasks utilizing mechanized engineering units, commencing full-scale deployment. Slightly delayed from the first wave of deployment, Kazuya also descended upon the demon-allied nations aboard VC-25 Air Force One. As Kazuya descended the ramp of VC-25 Air Force One, he glanced over Dale's base, observing numerous freight trains arriving one after another, unloading supplies and weapons onto the base. While at the airfield parking area, various large transport planes such as the C-17 Globemaster III, the world's largest production aircraft in 124 Ruslan, and the N-225 Mraya, known as the world's heaviest aircraft, equipped with six Progress T-18T engines on its wings, were unloading cargo consisting of tanks, armored vehicles, self-propelled artillery, and personnel. Within the lined-up hangars, maintenance crews were preparing combat aircraft such as the A-10, specially modified by Lieutenant Colonel Rudel's Rudel Squadron, and the F-15E Strike Eagle a derivative of the F-15 Air Superiority Fighter, armed with low-drag conventional bombs such as the laser-guided Paveway 2 and GPS-guided Stam kits, as well as MK-80 series General Purpose Bombs, CBU-87-B Cluster Bombs, CBU-72 Fuel Air Bombs, Napalm Bombs, and other aircraft-mounted bombs. Additionally, modified C-130 Hercules transport aircraft equipped with a Gore 12 25mm Gatling gun, a 40mm cannon, and a 105mm howitzer, known as AC-130 gunships, were being loaded with a large number of shells to rain down artillery fire upon the Imperial Army for ground suppression. Furthermore, on the runway reserved for scrambles, the world's first stealth fighter classified as a fifth-generation jet, the F-22, equipped with AIM-120 CM RAM missiles and AIM-9 liters m Sidewinder missiles in its weapons bay, stood alongside the F-2 fighter, developed based on the F-16 multi-role fighter as a successor to the F-1 armed with 93-type air-to-surface guided missiles, AGM-65 Mavericks, and AIM-9 liters-m Sidewinder missiles, resting its wings in readiness for a scramble. It's worth noting that strategic bombers such as the B-52 Stratofortress, B-1 Lancer, and B-2 Spirit, which are not deployed at Dale's base due to maintenance issues and to prevent potential destruction by enemy forces on the ground, only land in emergencies and conduct bombing operations flown in from Purubim's homeland. Observing the steadily assembling forces at Dale's base with a satisfied expression, Kazuya, accompanied by Chitters and the maids, made his way towards the base's command center. We've been expecting you, Supreme Leader. With these words, Kazuya was greeted by the base commander, Major General Myra Iarias. With her arm and shaped eyes and glasses, Myra I's beauty evoked the image of a career woman. She nervously guided Kazuya to his seat and began her report once he was settled. As you may have already observed, the units that have arrived at Dale's base are all preparing for deployment. Once the formal signing ceremony for the alliance with the demon allied nations is completed, and upon your orders, we can immediately proceed into action. You work fast. T thank you very much. With a proud and respectful salute in response to Kazuya's impressed words, 
Mirai, Kazuya, and their entourage departed for the Demon Allied Nation's capital, where the signing ceremony for the alliance would take place at the Demon King's castle, aboard a Humvee. Contrary to Kazuya's expectations of a sinister castle based on the name Demon King's Castle, the Demon King's Castle visible from the capital's entrance was just an ordinary one. As Kazuya and his companions entered the city area below the Demon King's Castle under the guidance of Count Oliver, they gazed at the streets from their carriage. Those people, them, they're mostly refugees who fled from villages and towns engulfed in the flames of war. Although the Demon King has instructed to extend a helping hand to those who sought refuge, the reality is that the sheer number of refugees makes it difficult to provide adequate support. Amidst such conversation, Kazuya observed refugees sitting dejectedly on the roadside with tired, somber faces, while heading towards the main castle of the Demon King. What does a Demon King look like? I wonder a giant man with horns, perhaps. On his way to the room where the Demon King awaited, Kazuya realized belatedly that he knew nothing about the Demon King and let his imagination wander regarding the Demon King's appearance. Here is where the Demon King awaits. Count Oliver halted before the door of a room adorned with lavish decorations and made his announcement. The Demon King lies beyond this door swallowing nervously, Kazuya steeled himself and proceeded through the door. Ark welcome to the Purubim Kingdom of Demons. Pardon me for this appearance can you overlook it, please? Ah uh, um, understood. A woman? And she's covered in wounds? Upon entering the room, Kazuya saw something entirely different from what he had imagined. The Demon King was not a rugged, horned man as he had pictured. Standing there was Amira Rosangel, the valiant female leader of the Demon Alliance, bearing wounds all over her body with a missing left eye and tightly wrapped bandages from her right elbow to her fingertips, blood seeping through, her ample chest heaving with labored breaths, yet maintaining her dignity, welcoming Kazuya with the aura befitting a demon king. Come to think of it, didn't Count Oliver mention that the demon king was injured? But I never expected it to be this severe and now that I look closely, even the attendants around the demon king are covered in wounds. Surprised by the fact that the demon king was a woman and heavily injured, Kazuya responded to Amira's greeting with wide eyes, then discreetly glanced at the attendants around her, all of whom bore wounds similar to the demon king's, yet, some of them seemed to harbor unfriendly glances. Well, I suppose it's inevitable. If you witness your kin being massacred by humans en masse harboring hostility toward humans is only natural. As Kazuya took his seat, contemplating the hostility mixed among the attendants around Amira, the ceremony for forming an alliance commenced. Well then, let's start with some introductions, shall we? Ah, I am Amira Rosangel, the Demon King of the Demonic Union. Just so you know, I'm an ogre by race. Ah, you can call me Amira or Rosangel, whichever you prefer. Huh? Oh, and about this tone of mine, it's just how I naturally speak. If you could overlook it, I'd appreciate it. Amira's casual tone caught Kazuya off guard, prompting one of her attendants to widen their eyes and hastily whisper something to her prompting Amira to add a final remark. I don't mind, I'm not a fan of formality either. Is that so? Ah, uh, thanks, that makes things easier. Despite enduring the pain of his wounds and sweating profusely, Amira flashed a warm smile when she heard Kazuya's response. Well then, let me give a brief introduction about myself. I am Nagato Kazuya, the leader of Brubim or you could say, the president. Feel free to call me whatever you like. I look forward to working with you. Amira R. Likewise, nice to meet you, Kazuya. After exchanging introductions and introducing their respective subordinates, there was a moment of pause. Suddenly, Amira bowed deeply to Kazuya. Your Majesty. Ha. Huh. Your Highness. What's this about? Hey, cut it out. I wanted to say this from the beginning. I truly appreciate your dispatching troops this time. The soldiers you sent earlier, too. Thanks to them, hundreds of our compatriots were saved and we've had time to reorganize our forces due to the Empire's slowed advance, I'll definitely repay this debt. Ah, I'll be expecting that. Amira's vassals clamored in shock at the sight of their queen bowing to another country's king, but they fell silent at Amira's reprimand. Kazuya, hearing Amira's sincere words, smiled and thought that they could get along well. Well then, uck about the documents. I need to, um, sign. Hold on a moment. I can't just stand by and watch this. Question mark Amira, 
expressing her gratitude to Kazuya, raised her head to sign the documents that were prepared, but Kazuya stopped her. Seeing Amira struggling to speak while enduring pain, Kazuya couldn't bear it. He got up from his seat, approaching Amira with a puzzled expression, and gestured with his hand. I'd appreciate it if you could put down your weapon and chitters and the others, lower your guns. Stop it, all of you. The moment Kazuya gestured towards Amira, the guards directly under the Demon King's command had their swords and spears pointed at Kazuya's neck and vital points. However, in response, chitters and the others aimed their guns, ready to shoot the guards or the Demon King at any moment. Despite the tension reaching a critical point, both sides' soldiers obediently sheathed their weapons in accordance with their respective leaders' orders. Sorry that was my fault, cause you you apologized as the hostile aura emanating from the royal guards seemed to slightly dissipate at his words, bringing a hint of calm back into the room. By the way, the aura emanating from Chitters and her group remained unchanged. What were you trying to do by approaching me like that without any explanation? Amira inquired. Oh. It's nothing. Your wound looked painful, so I thought I'd try to heal of this wound? Yeah, it's a bit of a doozy. It's from some weirdo shouting about being a hero for the Empire. Seems like they were using some special equipment. No matter how much healing magic or potions they used, this wound won't close. I see well, it's worth a shot, Kazuya replied, shaking his head in frustration as he smiled at Amira, who wore a resigned expression. He then raised his hand and activated his complete healing ability. As Kazuya's hand hovered over a mirror, a faint light terminated, and a visible change occurred in her body. Huh? What? What's this? Huh? To the astonishment of her retainers, who either groaned in disbelief or fell silent, Amira's seemingly incurable wounds not only healed but her right hand and left eye, which were believed to be lost forever, returned to their original state. Amira cautiously touched her right hand and horn as if to confirm the sensation, then removed the bandage covering her left eye, letting light into the darkness that had enveloped it. She first gasped in surprise and then trembled with joy. They they're back, my hand and I are back. Ha 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 ha. This this means I can finally get revenge on that bastard. As Amira clenched her right hand tightly, gazing at it, laughter erupted from her, and an immense amount of magic overflowed from her body swirling around with a roar. After containing the overflowing magic, Amira, her face flushed with joy, turned to Kazuya. Thank you, Kazuya. Thanks to you. Wait, what's wrong? Hey I'm exhausted, Kazuya wheezed. Kazuya, having exerted all his magical power to heal Amira's wounds, was now fatigued. Wait, did I just use my complete healing ability on Amira without considering the side effects? I hope everything's okay. Watching Amira's A's sparkle like a child given a toy, opening and closing her right hand repeatedly, cause Yuya couldn't help but ponder over his actions. Well, let's get the signing done for now, he suggested. Yeah, good idea, Amira agreed. In the end, with no way to confirm the side effects of the complete healing ability, cause Yuya decided not to dwell on it and prompted Amira to proceed with the signing. And with the signing completed, the alliance between Parabim and the Demon Coalition was officially formed. Volume 03 Chapter 04 After the signing ceremony, cause Yuya gladly complied with Amira's request to have a private conversation, and they relocated to Amira's chambers to chat. Well, I'll be. Is that so? Yeah, it is. As they conversed in Amira's private chambers, their wavelengths seemed to harmonize perfectly, and the two of them chatted away like old friends, thoroughly enjoying each other's company. And just as a brief pause fell in their conversation, almost as if timed perfectly, there came a knock at the door. Excuse me, your majesty. I've brought the two of them. Oh, they're here. Come in. I thought I'd take this opportunity to introduce Kazuya. These are my daughters. Upon Amira's words, Kazuya shifted his gaze towards the door, which then opened to reveal Amira's daughters accompanied by palace guards. You two, make your greetings. He's a benefactor of mine and our, Yoka Alliance. My name is Fane Rosanga. Mother, your wounds, are they healed? Huh, mum, what happened? Your injuries are healed. You two, can't you behave yourselves? Dash. As they entered the room, the older girl glared at Kazuya with hostility, while the younger one, with a curiosity akin to a cat with a new toy, directed her gaze towards Kazuya. They both attempted to greet Kazuya, but midway through, they noticed that Amira's injuries had healed. Without thinking, 
They moved to rush towards Amira, but her stern reprimand caused both of them to recoil, their brown skin quivering in response to their mother's scolding. Sorry about that, they lack discipline. It's all right, it just shows they care about their mother, doesn't it? Isn't that a good thing? Well, yeah, but I wish they'd be more aware of time and place. In response to Amira's apology, Kazuya replied, and Amira couldn't help but smile slightly, her cheeks relaxing. Come on, you two, greet them properly. Why yes nice to meet you. I'm Fane Rosanga, Amira's eldest daughter. Nice to meet you, I'm the younger sister, Rihanna Rosanga, call me Lean. Despite sneaking glances at Amira, prompted by her mother, the two girls introduced themselves. Fane Rosang bore a striking resemblance to Amira in appearance, with her naturally long hair and a prominent bosom contrasting with her slim figure. However, her serious demeanor gave off an impression completely opposite to Amira's carefree personality. On the other hand, Rihanna Rosanga, still young and retaining a childlike innocence, seemed to have inherited her mother's carefree nature, exhibiting a lively and cheerful personality. Yet, there was a mischievous glint in her eyes, reminiscent of a little devil. Like her sister, she too wore her hair long, but unlike Fane, she tied her long hair into twin tails. Nice to meet you, I'm Kazuya Nagato the president of Parabem, and this is my deputy, Chitas Katyama. As Kazuya and the girls exchanged introductions and greetings, Fane and Rihanna took their seats on the newly prepared chairs, and Amira spoke up. By the way, Kazuya, I have a favor to ask. Would you mind taking care of Fane by your side as a maid or whatever for a while? Mother, that's at Amira's sudden request. Fane stood up with a bewildered expression and looked at her mother. Fane, be quiet. So, what do you say? Can I ask why? Well it's for her education. She's smart like me, but a bit too rigid in her thinking. As a potential candidate for the next demon lord, I want to expose her to various experiences to help her grow. Next demon lord candidate? Isn't the ruler of the Yokai Alliance hereditary? Oh, we're more of a survival of the fittest kind of society. It's natural for the strong to lead and the weak to follow. When it's time for a new demon lord, representatives from various races within the Yokai Alliance compete in various ways, and if they possess not just physical strength but also some other kind of power that everyone can agree on, they can become the demon lord, as Kazuyu expressed doubt at Amira's words. He asked a question. R, yes, basically, it's a system of natural selection, the strong lead, and the weak follow. When it's time for a new demon lord, representatives from various races within the Yokai Alliance compete in various ways, and if they possess not just physical strength but also some other kind of power that everyone can agree on, they can become the demon lord. The conversation continued as Kazuya learned more about Fane and Rihanna's backgrounds and the intricacies of Yokai Alliance politics. Throughout it all, Kazuya couldn't shake off the feeling that his life was about to get a lot more complicated. So, how did Amira become the Demon Lord? Huh? You're asking me? Well, I simply subdued everything with power. So, are you going to accept it? In the end, it's all about power. Anyway, leaving aside such quips, what should I do? Whether I accept it or not doesn't really matter. Well, I guess I'll accept it. After a moment of contemplation, Kazuya, not finding any particular drawbacks, decided to accept Amira's proposal. Once Kazuya left the room, within Amira's quarters, Fine's voice of anger could be heard. Mother, why do I have to go to that man's, moreover, to a human-like place? What do you mean by human-like? Kazuya healed my injuries and helped us without asking for much in return. He's a benefactor who has repeatedly been told to learn various things from Kazuya. But, oh, for heaven's sake. This is a done deal. Ark. Mother, you're so stubborn. As if unable to bear Amira's words, Fine stormed out of the room. Both of you are so stubborn. Mom, is it okay? Big sister went somewhere. Sigh she did it again. Amira let out a deep sigh at Fine's words, who remained in the room. Fine, come here. Amira beckoned Fine over and gently stroked her head as she sat on her lap. Mom, it tickles. While listening to Fine's voice, a mixture of joy and embarrassment as she squirmed on her lap, Amira pondered deeply. Mother's, mother's stubbornness, why won't you understand? With a heart full of unbearable anger, Fine walked restlessly through the corridors of the Demon Lord's castle, 
I just want to be useful by mother's side. Bang. Fine pounded her fist against the wall in anguish. Is that fine over there? An elf man approached from the other end of the corridor. Nelson. Whoa, what's wrong? Fine. Fine's expression changed completely upon seeing Nelson, whom she had admired for a long time. She smiled as if a flower had bloomed and threw herself into Nelson's arms. That's the situation yes. Even though I don't want to go. I can't defy mother upon hearing that Finn would be by Kazuya's side. Nelson surreptitiously wore a smirk tinged with malicious intent. Careful not to let Finn notice, as he offered something along with gentle words. What's this? It's a bracelet to serve as an amulet. I want you to wear it at all times. If anything happens, it should protect you. Thank you. Nelson Fien accepted the bracelet without noticing Nelson's malice and wore it. After the lengthy discussion concluded and Kazuya agreed to take care of Fien, he returned to the Dale's base. But, Master, are you sure about taking in such a young girl? Well, it's fine, consider it a favor to the Demon Lord. So far, it seems like we're only accumulating favors anyway. Where is the Imperial Army? Casting aside long glance at Chitters. Kazuya casually addressed his subordinates as if he knew nothing. The Imperial Army within the Demon Alliance territory is gathering near a town protected by a demon army called Olga. They seem intent on attacking the town to seize the demon army's supplies, as they have run out of their own. Also, we have located the remaining enemies who have not gathered for the siege of Olga. Seeing Kazuya avert his gaze, Chitas sighed and pointed out several locations on the map in front of her. I'd like to wrap this up quickly, especially with winter approaching yes. First, the Air Force should focus its full strength on attacking the scattered Imperial Army units. Ground forces will head towards Olga's town, defeat the Imperial Army, and then deploy to various locations to eliminate any remaining enemies. Is the cooperative arrangement with the Demon Army in place? Yes. The Demon Army is assigned to support us. Here's the documentation. All right, understood. Major General Myra I handed Kazuya a report detailing the coordination with the Demon Army. Glancing over the report, Kazuya nodded. Commence full-scale operation. We will crush every Imperial Army presence within the Demon Alliance territory. Spare no one. Understood. In response to Kazuya's command, everyone saluted and began their duties causing the entire base to bustle with activity. Aircraft with bombs and missiles dangling from their wings took off from the Dales base runway and parking areas, while ground troops formed groups and set off towards Olga's town to begin the assault. Volume 03, Chapter 05, The Minotaur General, responsible for commanding the 50,000 Demon Army defending Olga, glared resentfully at the Imperial Army encamped on the mountain slightly away from the temporary command center in the heart of the city. What's the enemy's total strength? HMPH, according to reconnaissance reports, they have 80,000 infantry, 10,000 cavalry, 500 dragon riders, 5 warships, 2,000 magical weapons, and 20,000 automata. The infantry count has increased by about 10,000 since yesterday. They're about to make their move. Indeed, the enemy's aim was not to seize us or the city but the resources, despite the gathering of hundreds of thousands of Imperial soldiers, including non-combat personnel, the general accurately discerned the Imperial Army's intentions through the unusually sparse cooking smoke and pre-existing intelligence, as anticipated by the general. The actions of the special forces dispatched from Purabim had cut off their supple lines. Furthermore, due to negligence in logistics planning, the Imperial Army suffered from severe shortages, particularly of food, prompting them to concentrate their forces to seize Orga City from the Demon Army. There's movement in the enemy's main camp, it seems they've begun their advance. How long can we hold out against tens of thousands of hungry and restless enemy soldiers? Well, they won't take Orga City that easily. With a bitter expression upon hearing the report from his subordinates, the general spoke. Concentrate our forces to the east of the city. What about the cavalry unit? Report. Before the general could finish his sentence, a messenger rushed into the command post, interrupting him. Reinforcements. Reinforcements have arrived. What? Which unit? Eager for as many soldiers as possible. The general's expression brightened at the messenger's report, and he asked the messenger, panting heavily, for details. D. The reinforcements are not from our army, they're units from the Parabim forces and by the decree of the Demon King, 
our army is instructed to assist the Purubim forces. What? This battle is to defend our territory. To think. To think that we're supposed to support another country's army. Ugh. What's with this noise? As the general's expression shifted from brightness to anger upon hearing the orders from the messenger, an irritating and unfamiliar sound, like hierarchy Eru, clung to his ears, and as he leaned out of the window to ascertain the source of the noise, the general froze. W what is this? In the direction the general's gaze pointed, he saw square objects he had never seen before racing around, emitting the annoying noise, beside the command post street. Hurry, hurry. The enemy is already moving, get into formation quickly. Stretching out in a single line across the plain in front of the city of Olga, Michael Whitman, captain of the 1st Armored Battalion, transmitted instructions via radio to the 49 M182 Abrams tanks of the battalion. Originally there should have been 50, but one was delayed due to engine trouble and wasn't present at the moment. All the while listening to the sound of the fuel-guzzling gas turbine engines, consuming about 45 liters of fuel per hour even when idling. As he directed his tanks, the communication from headquarters, HQ, came through, Hammerhead 1, respond, over. This is Hammerhead 1 of the 1st Armored Battalion, go ahead. Artillery units are ready for bombardment. Report your situation. We will complete unit positioning in about 3 minutes. Understood. Stand by until unit positioning is complete. Then commence operation. Roger that. Having concluded communication with HQ, Captain Whitman opened the hatch of his turret and looked out over the city of Olga, where Hunt, heavy expanded mobility tactical truck, vehicles were stationed, awaiting orders. Now then, with plenty of fuel and ammunition, let's make some noise. Let's go, everyone. Sir. Yes, sir. With morale boosted among his subordinates, Captain Whitman returned to his turret, closed the hatch and silently awaited the moment. Captain, the enemy has begun their assault. Yes, I see. Ron, load high explosive anti-tank multi-purpose rounds. Heat MP, and after that, switch to shaped charge rounds. H-E-A-T. Until further notice. Watching the Imperial forces begin their assault from the base of the mountain where their main camp was situated, Captain Whitman observed through the monitor inside the M1A2 tank. Understood. High explosive anti-tank multi-purpose rounds loaded. Good. Volume. Make sure to aim true. Understood. Captain. Ladies, prepare for assault. Assault ready, sir. We're good to go anytime. Captain Whitman. The tank commander, gave instructions to his loader on, gunner volume, and driver ladies, then awaited the signal to commence the operation, enemy battleships and dragon knights approaching rapidly, don't panic, our allies will take them down, in an attempt to support the ground forces initiating their assault, imperial battleships and dragon knights flew towards the city of Olga to bombard it, but their actions backfired. The densely packed barrage of heavy weapons, including the Type 87 self-propelled anti-aircraft guns, Avenger systems mounted on M998 Humvees, and portable surface-to-air missiles like the FIM-92 Stinger and M2 heavy machine guns carried by infantry battalions stationed in Olga, swiftly brought down the battleships and Dragon Knights, preventing them from making any significant impact. Furthermore, due to unfortunate circumstances, some of the battleships and Dragon Knights were shot down directly above the ground forces, causing secondary casualties as they crashed down. Amidst the deafening gunfire of the Type 87's 35mm anti-aircraft guns and the sight of Stinger missiles flying past, Captain Whitman and his gunner volume were idly chatting inside the M1A2 Abrams. I wish we had air support too it can't be helped, sir. All aircraft are busy engaging Imperial forces elsewhere. Besides, we have more than enough artillery support to make up for it. Well, that's true ah. Uh, finally, here comes the enemy. As Captain Whitman wrapped up the conversation, confirming the enemy's position, the vanguard of the assault formation, slightly shaken by the descent of a battleship, saw automatons sprinting forward, followed by magical creatures such as golems, controlled by sorcerers, cavalry, and infantry bringing up the rear. Our countermeasure selecting golems, particularly resistant to bullets among the magical beings the enemy seems to be learning, too. Captain Whitman, having assessed the enemy's formation, pondered whether the Imperial Army had begun to implement strategies against the Parabem Army. 
However, even as Captain Whitman mulled over these thoughts, the Imperial Army was steadily closing the distance. When the Imperial Army closed within two kilometers, Captain Whitman's 1st Armored Battalion, composed of M1A2 Abrams tanks, and the 2nd Armored Battalion, led by Captain Haruchi Takaguchi and organized with Type 10 tanks on its flanks, received the order from HQ to all units, commence operation simultaneously with this command. From the city of Olga and points 10 kilometers behind it, artillery units unleashed a ferocious barrage upon the Imperial Army, to counter the numerically superior Imperial forces, TOS-1 Buratina multiple rocket launchers, equipped with 30-barrel launchers firing 220 mm thermobaric rockets fired off 30 rounds of ammunition with thermobaric warheads in just 15 seconds before withdrawing for resupply. Meanwhile, M110 203mm self-propelled howitzers, Type 99 self-propelled 155mm howitzers, and Archer self-propelled howitzers stationed 10 km behind Dolga continuously fired high explosive shells and specially prepared flechette rounds, supplemented by PIGM, dual-purpose improved conventional munition. Warheads equipped with 227mm rockets fired from the multiple launch rocket system, MLRS, and its smaller variant, the High Mobility Artillery Rocket System, TIMARS, developed by the U.S. Army. These weapons were designed to rapidly disperse submunitions over the intended targets at optimal distances and altitudes for long-range suppression. Thus, a multitude of thermobaric rockets and PICM equipped rockets rained down upon the advancing Imperial Army mercilessly decimating the automatons and nearly wiping out 20,000 of them, while the 203mm and 155mm shells blew away magical creatures like golems as if they were autumn leaves. Flechette rounds fired towards the rear of the formation exploded in midair, releasing over 5,000 arrow-shaped submunitions per round piercing through the armor of Imperial soldiers. After bombarding the advancing Imperial forces with a large quantity of artillery and rocket fire for several minutes, the self-propelled artillery units tasked with eliminating remaining enemies left the job to the armored battalions, shifting their focus to the Imperial Army's main encampment atop a nearby mountain. They resumed their attack, wiping out all the soldiers stationed there. From HQ to the 1st and 2nd Armored Battalions, final impact in 30 seconds. After the final impact, both armored battalions are to commence their assault. 1st Armored Battalion, Hammerhead 1, copy that. 2nd Armored Battalion, Ironfoot 1, copy that. Exactly 30 seconds later, as the final shell struck, the 99 vehicles of the two armored battalions, comprising M1A2 Abrams and Type 10 tanks, revved their engines and charged forward into the fray. Full speed ahead, huh? Right after initiating the assault, a communication from Captain Takaguchi, Ironfoot 1, came through to Captain Whitman. Ironfoot 1 to Hammerhead 1. We're spreading out left and right to support your attack. Hammerhead 1 here. Roger that. Appreciate the support. All units, listen up. Captain Takaguchi's Type 10 tanks are providing support. Don't let them down. Roger. Following Captain Takaguchi's instructions, the Type 10 tanks of the 2nd Armored Battalion, marked with the character on their turret sides, maximized their mobility, spreading out to the left and right to support the 1st Armored Battalion. With unparalleled precision, they engaged in slalom shooting, consistently hitting their targets with a 100% accuracy rate steadily decimating magical weapons and enemy soldiers. Push forward, crush the enemy. With the support of the 2nd Armored Battalion, the 1st Armored Battalion launched their assault from the front, pulverizing the remnants of automatons turned into scrap by artillery fire. The artillery units, deliberately left behind by the enemy, were bombarded vigorously. Magical weapon at 2 o'clock, distance 2000. Roger. 2 o'clock. Distance 2000. Aim set. Fire. Following Captain Whitman's instructions, Gunner Volk rotated the turret as per the fire control system's precise data, aimed accurately, and upon informing Captain Whitman, received the order to fire, pulling the trigger of the main gun. Upon firing, amidst a momentary flash and a shockwave reverberating through their bodies, the 44 caliber 120 mm smoothbore gun's multi purpose anti tank heat, high explosive anti tank, round struck the target magical weapon. The shape charge detonated, the super fast jet, metal jet, 
penetrated the magical barrier and armor of the magical weapon, reaching the cockpit, instantly melting the pilot along with the cockpit, while simultaneously releasing a blast and shrapnel, causing the magical weapon to swell from within and explode. Magical weapon destroyed, all right. Next one. As Captain Whitman and his crew cheered for destroying the magical weapon, reports of successes poured in from other tanks. Hammerhead 2 to 2 here, magical weapon 2 destroyed. From Hammerhead 4 to 5 to Hammerhead 1, magical weapon 3 destroyed. From Hammerhead 3 to 1 to Hammerhead 1, Golem 2 and magical weapon 1 destroyed. Engaging them fiercely, all right, let's devour them all. Roger that. While Captain Whitman and his subordinates exchanged radio communications in this manner, their distances were rapidly closing in. Ladies, full speed ahead, crush those magical weapons. Huh? Roger that. Let's go. Upon realizing that attacking with the main gun facing forward wouldn't be fast enough, Captain Whitman immediately ordered driver leaders to charge at full speed. Leaders, surprised by the sudden order, exclaimed but quickly understood Whitman's intention, grinned, and pushed the accelerator to the maximum. As a result, the gas turbine engine of the M1A2 Abrams revved up further, accelerating with the tracks spinning forcefully, throwing up dirt. Eat this, accelerating to 50 km per hour. The M1A2 Abrams, despite being hit by magical projectiles, charged relentlessly, the magical weapon attempting to flee by turning its back and escaping, was caught off guard as the M1A2 Abrams leapt into the air from a ramp-like terrain, utilizing its 62-ton mass as a weapon, crashing onto the magical weapon, experiencing a brief moment of suspension followed by the characteristic sensation of falling. Captain Whitman's M1A2 Abrams successfully collided with the magical weapon crushing it. As the crushed magical weapon fell silent, cheers erupted from the surrounding vehicles witnessing Captain Whitman's feet. All right, did you see that? Two down with this. Empowered by Captain Whitman's actions, the Parabim army, riding the momentum, completely annihilated the Imperial forces gathered to conquer Olga after approximately 10 minutes of combat. Volume 03 Chapter 06 While the Parabim forces were relentlessly pounding the Imperial army assaulting the city of Olga, an M1A2 Abrams tank was traversing a road 30 kilometers away from Olga. Joseph, can't we pick up more speed? We won't make it to the battle like this. Sergeant Ernst Barkman, who had been separated from the 1st Armored Battalion due to engine trouble since the previous day and was heading towards Olga alone, urged his driver Joseph impatiently. Sergeant, I've been saying for a while now that pushing it any further is impossible if we force it. We'll just break down again, you know? But if we continue like this, the battle will be over. Frowning at Joseph's response, Sergeant Barkman, a battle enthusiast, anxiously stared in the direction of Olga, fearing that the battle would end before they arrived. At that moment, perhaps the goddess of war smiled upon Barkman, as good news came flying to him. Hammerhead 2 to 5. Sergeant Barkman, respond, over. This is Hammerhead 2 to 5. Sergeant Barkman, go ahead. We've confirmed 15 magical weapons and numerous infantry about 7 kilometers west of your current position. Most likely, the Imperial Army is planning to flank the city of Olga. Understood. We will engage in combat immediately. Without waiting to hear the rest of the transmission from HQ, Sergeant Barkman unilaterally delivered his words and cut off the radio with glee. He changed course to intercept the prey that had come within his reach. Sergeant is that okay? Cutting off the radio like that. What are you talking about? The radio just broke down. Barkman's subordinates fell silent at his words. Is it really okay? This might be bad. We don't know. We're just, though uneasy. Barkman's subordinates reluctantly obeyed his orders, unable to go against them. Thus, Sergeant Barkman quietly lay in wait under a giant tree by the roadside about 10 meters from the intersection leading to the city of Olga, as magical weapons approached. They're here, it's the enemy. As 15 magical weapons and around 200 infantry appeared over the hill, Sergeant Barkman, with an excited expression like a child given a desire toy, gestured to his subordinates. Gorts, load stabilized fin ammunition, upfsts, same for the next round. Fernando, aim well. Understood. Contrary to Barkman's excitement, Loader Gortz and Gunner Finando responded calmly, not yet, keep drawing them closer fire, fire, 
and when the combat preparations were complete and the enemy was about two kilometers away, Sergeant Barkman issued the order, and simultaneously with Fernando repeating the command, he pulled the trigger, launching the stabilized fin ammunition from the main gun along with a burst of smoke. The stabilized fin ammunition, upon launch, separated from the shell casing due to air pressure, leaving behind a tungsten alloy penetrator shaped like an arrow, which flew towards the magical weapons and hit its target. The penetrator struck dead center on one of the magical weapons, piercing through the body and even destroying the magical weapon behind it. Hurry up and load the next round. Loading complete. Fire. Sergeant Bulkman, who had destroyed two magical weapons with a single shot by chance, was pleased. He immediately fired the next shell and successfully silenced another magical weapon. The Imperial Army, caught off guard by the enemy's presence in such a location, lost three magical weapons but quickly regrouped and launched a counterattack. One of the magical weapons, presumably carrying the unit leader, issued orders to the surrounding magical weapons. Among the remaining twelve magical weapons, four, including the command unit, provided covering fire from cover, while the remaining eight dispersed with infantry, attempting to approach the M1A2 Abrams. Huh? Are they planning to surround us and ambush us? Not gonna happen. Joseph, move. Intent on suppressing fire, Bulkman, paying no attention to the magical energy projectiles flying around the vehicle's perimeter noticed the enemy's intentions and immediately ordered a change of position. However, a problem arose just after he gave the order. Roger. Oh no what's wrong, Joseph, move quickly. Despite responding, Joseph showed no sign of moving the M1A2 Abrams, prompting Bulkman to urge him on. Sergeant what is it? The engine it seems to have malfunctioned again what? Seriously? However, Joseph's words were powerful enough to unsettle Bulkman. Can you fix it somehow? I'm working on it right now. With Joseph frantically trying to fix the engine, Bulkman, with a pale face, asked him about the main gun. Ah right, but can the main gun still operate? It's still powered by the auxiliary power unit, so it should hold for a while. Good. Then we'll manage somehow with the enemy here. Joseph, I'm counting on you for the engine. Roger that. Come on, you piece of junk. Move. Despite feeling somewhat worried about Joseph's rough handling of the equipment, Bulkman resumed the battle. Twelve left even with the Abrams, we won't come out unscathed if we're hit by a concentrated magical firepower at close range, can we take out the eight advancing ones before they reach us? No choice but to do it, it's getting interesting. While giving instructions to Goals and Fernando, Bulkman pondered such thoughts, we'll take out the one on the far right. Load the multi-purpose anti-tank shells. Fire, fire. Goals and Fernando, following Bulkman's escalating voice as if shaking off their hesitation, diligently and swiftly carried out their duties like robots. Thus, the shells fired from the 120mm smoothbore gun hit the magical weapons one after another. The first targeted magical weapon had its right leg blown off by the first shell rendering it immobile, then the second shell struck its cockpit, silencing it, the subsequent targets, up to the fifth, were similarly eliminated with one or two shots, however, in the meantime, the imperial army was not just taking hits without retaliation, despite gritting their teeth, as they watched their allies one by one diminish in number, the magical weapons managed to land dozens of hits on the M1A2 Abrams. However, their magical projectiles, with limited penetration capability, failed to pierce the composite armor and homogeneous rolled steel plates. The only accomplishment was slightly scorching the armor surface upon impact. Sergeant, infantry incoming. Distance, 300 meters. It was when Fernando destroyed five approaching magical weapons. Fernando realized that the infantry, who had been engrossed in dealing with the magical weapons and left unattended, had somehow come close. All right, those pests, load the canister rounds, target, infantry group approaching from the front. Understood, loading complete, fire. Sergeant Berkman, using canister rounds installed as part of the Imperial Army's strategy against overwhelming enemy forces, was incredibly effective. The infantry gathered relatively densely around the muscle of the 120mm smoothbore gun. Thus they bore the full brunt of the canister rounds that flew towards them, causing them to fall like dominoes. With just one shot of the canister round, the number of infantry was halved. Take this too. You bastards, 
The M240 machine gun, mounted coaxially with the main gun and firing in a brisk rhythm of tat -a -tat -tat, followed up on the heaps of dead infantry. Without hesitation in the face of magical projectiles flying towards them, Sergeant Berkman and Corporal Goles leaned out of the turret, utilizing the machine guns mounted on the turret and the M2 heavy machine gun for the commander, and the M240 machine gun for the loader to systematically shoot down the infantry before swiftly returning inside the turret to resume attacking the magical weapons. Now, we've dealt with the seven magical weapons that charged at us and the two supporting ones and wiped out the infantry but what about the remaining three magical weapons? After annihilating the infantry, Sergeant Berkman, who had also taken down most of the surviving magical weapons but had depleted his ammunition as a consequence, pondered his next move, at 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, and 3 o'clock, one each, remaining ammunition, stabilizing fin attached armor piercing shells, two rounds, multi-purpose anti-tank grenades, two rounds and a bit of machine gun ammo if only the engine would start joseph any chance it'll start not yet sir it might take a while sir damn it come on you piece of junk watching joseph continue to bash the equipment as usual sergeant berkman sighed and looked up at the sky sigh i guess we have no choice but to go with this i wanted to fight while running around a bit though the enemy is also in a situation where they can't retreat so they should be making a move soon. As Sergeant Berkman prepared himself and waited for that moment, it arrived soon enough, breaking the momentary silence that had enveloped the surroundings. Magical projectiles were launched high into the air from the shadowy figure lurking at 12 o'clock, signaling the simultaneous appearance of the three magical weapons. They began closing the distance at once, taking a gamble to either take down Sergeant Berkman's M1A2 Abrams or be taken down themselves. They're here. First, target the lead commander's vehicle. Fire. The stabilized armor-piercing shell shot out, homing towards the captain's aircraft as if drawn to it, hitting its mark. Upon impact, the captain's craft was blown back about five meters and exploded. First one down. Sergeant Bulkman exclaimed as he destroyed the captain's craft, then swiftly pivoted the turret 90 degrees to the right targeting the magical weapon approaching from the three o'clock direction. The first shot missed the magical weapon, merely gouging the ground, but the second shot expertly hit the torso of the magical weapon, destroying it. Second one. Then Sergeant Bulkman rotated the turret 180 degrees to the left, closing in on another magical weapon that had approached to a distance of 40 meters, and took it down with the final shot. This should do it. Last one. With that rallying cry, Sergeant Bulkman finished off the last surviving member of the Imperial Army, securing victory in the battle. However, he couldn't bask in the afterglow of victory. This was because just before the last magical weapon, the only survivor, was destroyed. It had managed to unleash a magical blast that tore through the tracks of the M1A2 Abrams. Looks like we're in for it now. It wasn't just the engine that was damaged. The left track was completely destroyed. The armor was riddled with damage, and several systems of the M1A2 Abrams were malfunctioning. Sergeant Bulkman, surveying the dire situation from outside, couldn't help but let out a sigh. We might get away with just a reprimand going off on your own and attacking the enemy without authorization. Ending up in a draw that's quite the outcome. Her sergeant headquarters has requested an M88 tank recovery vehicle. It's done. As Goals and Fernando chimed in with remarks that seemed to echo Sergeant Bulkman's self-reflection, Joseph, who had been in contact with headquarters, sighed and poked his head out from inside the vehicle. Did headquarters have anything to say? Be prepared sigh although they emerged victorious from the battle, the backs of Sergeant Bulkman and his team were still soiled with soot. Volume 03 Chapter 07 The Parabim Forces having not only successfully defended against the Imperial Army but also turned the tables on them, quickly delegated post-war management to the Demonic Army and immediately redirected their forces to various locations. They commenced a massive offensive against the weakened Imperial Army, which had been subjected to airstrikes from aircraft and helicopters. So it's the same here. While the Parabim forces easily wiped out the remaining Imperial troops scattered throughout various locations as if plucking flowers. A certain issue severely hindered their advance. From Reconnaissance Unit 17 to HQ arrived at the target village, 
It's also littered with corpses. Understood. HQ. Sending reinforcements. Confirm the presence of survivors as a precaution. Roger that. We'll proceed to confirm the presence of survivors. Over. The problem at hand was the disposal of the corpses of demon tribes left massacred and neglected by the Imperial Army within the Demonic Union. The Parabim forces, fearing the spread of disease and the noxious odor emanating from the decomposing bodies, couldn't simply leave them as they were. Thus, while collaborating with the demonic army to eradicate the imperial forces, they dispatched units to villages and towns across the region to handle the disposal of bodies. Let's go, everyone. Understood. Here we go again. This is so disheartening. Despite murmuring complaints, the members of Reconnaissance Unit 17 tightened their gas masks to prevent contagion armed themselves with M4 carbines, and descended from their lightly armored vehicles into the village, where flies swarmed like clouds around the piled corpses emitting a putrid stench. Don't let your guard down, we might be mistaken for imperial soldiers and attacked by demons or demonized demon tribes, or even gorillas among them, roger that. Responding to the captain's warning, the squad members dispersed into the village in small groups, beginning the futile search for survivors. How about over there, it's the same here, having witnessed the almost routine scene of searching houses, the captain, who had come out from the neighboring house, asked the subordinate who had lowered their shoulders in resignation. I see in that case, let's leave this to the female soldiers understood as two 74 type large trucks, one carrying soldiers from the demonic army and the other from the Parabim forces approached the village. The captain patted his subordinate on the shoulder, then set down his M4 carbine, picked up a shovel, and headed to the rear of the village to dig graves, in the areas reclaimed by the Parabem forces from the Imperial Army's onslaught. Such scenes were repeated almost daily. In the President's exclusive office at the Dales base headquarters, Kazuya silently sifted through a pile of documents diligently reviewing the reports from various departments. Underscore knock knock excuse me. Master, I've brought your refreshments, Chitters announced as she entered the room accompanied by maids Raina and Lena. At a boy, thanks. I was just thinking I could use a drink, Kazuya replied gratefully. He set aside the reports as Raina and Lena swiftly prepared the refreshments and offered them to Kazuya. As Kazuya took a sip, Chitters spoke up. Master, wouldn't it be prudent to take a short break? You haven't had a proper rest since the start of the conflict, almost a month ago. <laughs> ah, but it wouldn't sit right with me to rest comfortably while our soldiers are fighting on the front lines, Kazuya replied. However concerned for Kazuya, who had been tirelessly battling paperwork and shuttling between Purubim's mainland and Dale's base, Chitters suggested he take a break. Initially declining, Kazuya eventually relented after Chitters persisted with an unexpected day off and no particular plans in mind, Kazuya decided to visit the capital of the Demon Alliance, Beluge, for a change of scenery. Kazuya had invited Chitters along, but she opted to remain at Dale's base to handle tasks that he would otherwise take care of. Consequently, Kazuya traveled to Beluge with a small escort and maids Wilhelm and Kiyorot. So, what's Rosinkel doing here? Kazuya inquired of Fine, who had somehow managed to sneak into the adjacent seat during the ride to Beluge. It's my job to be with you, Fine replied, though suggested to serve as a maid by Amira, treating a princess of another country as such would be inappropriate. Therefore, Fine assumed the rather ambiguous role of an observer. She didn't seem inclined to hide her animosity, as evidenced by the pointed glares she directed at Kazuya. If you prefer to call me whatever you like, then you'll end up calling me you. It seems I'm rather disliked. However, Amira was wearing a similar outfit. Can't something be done about that dress? It's not easy on the eyes no. It's downright offensive. As Kazuya shrugged in response to Fine's provocative attire, which left little to the imagination, the Humvee continued its journey towards Beluge. After a few minutes, they entered Beluge, bypassing the makeshift slums that had sprung up around the city. Kazuya disembarked from the Humvee and casually strolled along the main thoroughfare. This tastes good would you like some, Rosingal? Kazuya asked, purchasing several skewers of appetizing grilled meat from a street vendor. N no, thank you. Really? Fine, I'll have some. Here, 
accustomed to a life of luxury as the daughter of the current demon lord, Fine seemed more preoccupied with scanning her surroundings than Kazuya, who awkwardly offered her a skewer. Eventually succumbing to the tempting aroma, Fine timidly accepted the skewer from Kazuya and took a small bite. It's delicious I'm glad you like it. Ark HHMPH. As Kazuya chuckled at Fine's unexpected reaction, she turned beet red and averted her gaze. As Kazuya watched her with a wry smile, a commotion suddenly broke out. Let go of me. Following the voice, Kazuya's gaze landed on a small child being restrained by an adult amidst a small crowd nearby. Curious, Kazuya approached the commotion. Upon inquiry through his guards, it was revealed that the child, a resident of the slums, had been caught attempting to steal food from a street vendor. Is there a shortage of food? I've heard that rations are being distributed to refugees, Kazuya mused aloud, turning to Fine for insight. Fine responded with a hint of embarrassment. Mother is doing her best to distribute rations to the refugees, but there are too many of them to adequately supply. Food is prioritized for the military. Is that so? As Kazuya and Fine conversed, the crowd dispersed, leaving only the child behind. Seizing an opportunity, Kazuya approached the child. Wait. President please wait, Kazuya, ignoring the escort's attempts to stop him, stood dumbfounded in place as a child, dirty but seemingly closer to a girl judging by her physique, questioned him with a puzzled expression. What's up, old man? Oh, old man? I'm still in my late teens, you know? He he, ha ha. Old man Rosangru, don't laugh, it kinda hurts, unable to contain herself. Fine burst into laughter at Kazuya being called an old man by the girl. Well, never mind. No, it's not okay, but so, what's the deal? If I wasn't hungry, I wouldn't resort to stealing. Fair enough then. Here, take this. Saying so, Kazuya offered the bag containing the leftovers of the yakitori he had bought earlier. Is it okay? The girl's eyes sparkled at Kazuya's words, and she eagerly took the bag of yakitori from him. If you want anything else to eat, I'll buy it for you, alright? But, there are a few conditions or rather, requests. What is it? As soon as Kazuya mentioned conditions, the girl looked at him with a mix of hostility and anxiety, but perhaps not wanting to miss the opportunity for more food, she cautiously asked Kazuya. Don't be so wary, there are three requests. First. Don't call me old man. Second, I want you to tell me your name. And third, let me hear a little bit about you. Is that all right? At first, the girl had thought she might be asked for something else, but upon hearing Kazuya's requests, she blinked rapidly as if taken aback. Underscore so, my mom got sick, and I still have a little sister. So if I don't somehow get food, we can't survive. Him having accepted Kazuya's request and obtained more food than she could hold in her small hands, the half-elf girl, Bell, sat on a bench in the square, answering Kazuya's many questions honestly. Having asked all he wanted to know from Bell, Kazuya closed his eyes, pondered for a moment, then borrowed a radio from one of the guards to contact someone. Hey, can we go home now? I want to feed my mom and sister this already. Huh? Yeah, sure. I've asked most of what I wanted to know, so it's fine now. Oh, by the way, should I take you home? It's dangerous to walk around the slums with a lot of food. Um, yeah, please. Belle readily accepted Kazuya's offer. Then let's go. This way. Worried about Belle returning to her home in the slums, which, to put it mildly, wasn't safe, Kazuya decided to escort her back home, following her slowly. At that moment, one of the guards opposed Kazuya going into the slums. But after Kazuya told them something, they relented. What's that? What? What on earth does that mean? Having returned to the slums where Belle's house was after a long and trivial conversation and detours with Kazuya's group, Belle opened her mouth in astonishment at the sight in front of her, simultaneously puzzled by the situation. Meanwhile, Finn, who knew nothing about the circumstances, confronted Kazuya in annoyance. Huh? Oh, that? That's outdoor cooking appliance number one and outdoor cooking appliance number two. Question mark I'm not asking about that. Why are your subordinates distributing food here? With multiple question marks floating over her head, Belle tilted her head in confusion, while Fien, frustrated by Kazuya's off-target answer, approached him, demanding an explanation. In the meantime, in the direction of Belle and Fien's gaze, 
the Purubam soldiers were distributing warm meals prepared using outdoor cooking appliance number one and outdoor cooking appliance number two under makeshift tents to the refugees and providing treatment to the sick and injured inside the hospital tent. While we appreciate such gestures, we we, unfortunately don't have the means to pay for this initially assertive, Fiend's tone weakened progressively as if wilting flowers, until she ended up muttering in a barely audible voice. Ha ha. Were you worried about that kind of thing? Don't worry. I'm not asking for anything. It's humanitarian. Hey, hey. As Kazuya replied with a wry smile to Fiend's demeanor, he was suddenly tugged on the sleeve from the side. Turning his face towards the direction he was pulled, Kazuya found Bell looking up at him with a flustered expression. Hey, um. Could it be that you called those people? Bell asked with a mixture of suspicion and curiosity. Yeah, so what? Kazuya responded. Big brother, just who are you exactly? Bell sent Kazuya a gaze mixed with doubt and curiosity. He's the president of Purubem, Kazuya answered. Um, I've heard of Purubem in rumors before. It's the country that came from another world and helped defeat the imperial army that attacked our country, right? But what does president mean? Bell inquired. R. Even if I say president, she might not understand. He's like a king, Kazuya clarified. Huh? Eh? What? Bell froze for a moment upon hearing Kazuya's revised answer, then immediately widened her eyes in shock and raised her voice. Seeing Bell's astonished face, Kazuya grinned as if his prank had succeeded. Ever since discovering Kazuya's true identity, Bell had become as quiet as a borrowed cat on the way back home. After seeing her safely to her house and assuring her that he would help if she encountered any trouble, Kazuya bid farewell to Bell and returned to the Dales base, where he praised the soldiers distributing food and providing medical treatment to the gathered refugees. During the journey back to the Dales base from Belle Rouge, Fine, who had been lost in thought, finally gathered the courage to ask Kazuya a serious question inside Hanvi's car. Um, I, I mean, I have something I want to ask you, Fine said hesitantly, adjusting her posture and looking at Kazuya with a serious expression. What is it? Kazuya asked. Why did you let the soldiers distribute food and treat the sick? You gain nothing from helping the refugees, Fine questioned. Well, strictly speaking, it's all loss if you think in terms of profit and loss, Kazuya replied with a troubled smile. Then why? Fine pressed on. Upon hearing Kazuya's response, Fine tilted her head in even greater confusion and repeated her question. Well, I'm not a saintly ruler or anything, so there's a bit of calculated thinking involved, Kazuya prefaced before locking eyes with Fine. If I have the means and there are people suffering in front of me, wouldn't I help them? He said. Hearing Kazuya's answer, which was far from what she had expected, Fine froze. Is that your reason? She asked. Yeah, so? Kazuya responded. Staring at Kazuya with an incredulous expression, Fine sighed and muttered under her breath. You're either too kind or too soft HMPH but... Fine's last muttered words disappeared into the air, unheard by anyone else. Volume 03 Chapter 08 Amidst the Purubim army's sweeping operations against the Imperial Army within the territory of the Demonic Alliance, a certain individual was scheming behind the scenes. Knock, knock. Come in, Creek. Pardon the interruption. I've brought the results of the investigation as requested. The soldier, carrying a report entered the room where only the sound of the scratching ballpoint pen echoed quietly. Without sparing a glance, the person in the room, who was deeply devoted to their master in every fiber of their being, briskly processed the stack of documents piled on the desk at an astonishing speed. And the results, with an indifferent tone, they dismissed the subordinate who had entered the room, focusing solely on the task at hand. Well, as Vice President suspected, it's as dark as ever. From the illegal trafficking of forbidden magical potions and drugs to illicit human trafficking and bribery, the more we dig, the more dirt we uncover within the kingdom. I see then continue the investigation in that direction. It will aid in realizing our plans. Understood. With a faint smile and a chilling voice, she, the mistress of this room, chitters, uttered, everything is for my master, for the supreme chancellor. The soldier echoed Chitas's words, standing at attention before leaving the room. Excuse me. With those words, another subordinate entered the room, passing by the previous one. What's the matter? Just like before, Chitas kept her eyes glued to the documents, not once diverting her attention. The subordinate, unperturbed by Chitas's demeanor, succinctly conveyed the matters that needed reporting. Well, 
as previously instructed by Vice President, we have located the whereabouts of the individuals captured by the Imperial Army within the Demonic Alliance territory, as well as the destination of the Demon Tribe where, it's a ruined castle in the Forbidden Forest within the Elza's Magic Empire's territory. Additionally, though it's unconfirmed, there's information suggesting that human experimentation and weapon development are being conducted in that castle. Has my master been informed of this? It was the first time Chitters stopped her hand, slowly lifting her gaze to meet the subordinates. No, it hasn't been relayed yet. But, in that case, do not inform my master of this matter. Be but. Seeing the subordinates confusion at the unexpected order, Chitters asserted firmly. If my master learns of this, they will eagerly rush to the scene themselves, I will handle it on my end. Understood. Here's the report containing the information we have gathered so far. After receiving an affirmative nod from Chitters, the subordinate left the report behind and exited the room. Chitters then retrieved her buried phone from among the documents and contacted her direct special forces unit. Upon receiving urgent communication from Chitters, the members of the Special Forces Unit Black Phantom assembled in a briefing room at the forward operating base. All right everyone, we're all here. I'll now explain the mission outline, said Captain Glenn, the leader of Black Phantom, as he flipped the switch on the projector. This is our target for this operation, an ancient castle located in the Forbidden Forest within the Elza's Magic Empire's territory. Although unconfirmed. It is believed that weapons development and experiments on humans and demon tribes captured within the allied demon nations are taking place here. Enemy forces are estimated to be around 2,000 to 3,000 personnel, judging from the size of the castle. Fortunately, it seems that magical weapons and automatons are not deployed on their end. With a classified report sent from Chitters at the Dales base in hand. Glenn pointed to satellite images being projected one after another from the projector as he continued, the main objectives of this operation are to determine what activities are occurring in this ancient castle and to destroy any new weapons under development. It's important to note that this operation is carried out on the sole discretion of Vice President Chitters and is highly classified. Keep that in mind. Any questions? Several soldiers raised their hands in response to Captain Glenn's inquiry. How are we going to infiltrate the ancient castle? We'll use aircraft and perform airborne insertions from above. Will we be taking prisoners? If any, only one or two individuals eliminate the rest. Any other questions? If not, we deploy in three hours, dismissed. Understood. With Captain Glenn's command, the subordinates stood up, saluted, and exited the room. At an altitude of 4,000 meters, under the sparkling stars of the night sky, Two MC-130H Combat Talon II aircraft, specialized variants of the C-130 tactical transport aircraft, flew silently, blending into the darkness with their collision avoidance lights turned off. Ten minutes to drop, in the cargo hold of the aircraft, where the sound of engines roared and the interior shook. Members of the Black Phantom, wearing uniforms unified in black and donning balaclavas adorned with white skulls, steadily prepared for the drop, each carrying their weapons and equipment. Five minutes to drop. As the team finished their final equipment checks and waited, the color of the red lights beside the rear hatch changed to blue, and with a heavy sound, the rear hatch opened, letting in a rush of wind and snow into the cargo hold. We've reached the drop point overhead. Begin the drop. Good luck. In response to the words of the MC-130H crew, yelling above the roar of the engines and howling winds. The members of the team nodded silently and rushed towards the rear hatch, leaping out one by one into the dark, dominating sky, and thus, the parachutes of the 60 Black Phantom operatives, deployed from the two MC-130H aircraft, blossomed safely in the air, ensuring the infiltration into the enemy territory without any casualties. Ah, uh, exclamation mark. Hi. Come on, just get used to it, it's the usual. Late at night on the watchtower of an old castle located in the forest of no return in the territory of the Elsa Magic Empire, illuminated by the light of torches and magic tools, I heard a sound coming from a laboratory deep underground in the old castle, a soldier named Rogers, who had recently been assigned here, was shaken and frightened by the horrifying screams, well, it can't be helped, 
You can't get used to something you can't get used to. Artilda. Even if you don't get used to it, you'll be too scared. Ares, who was assigned here at the same time as Rogers, turned his head away and let out a sigh as he watched his partner frightened next to him. Mostly high. R, 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 G, huh? Oh, hey. What happened? Are you okay? When Ares hears Rogers' strange voice, which sounds like a crushed frog, he turns to find Rogers lying unconscious on the ground, foaming and his crotch wet. Hey, what the hell happened? Ares rushed over to Rogers, shaking him and slapping him on the cheek to wake him up, when he suddenly felt something behind him. Dot 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 Mugo? Mutilda? The moment Ares was about to look back in fear, his mouth was covered and his arms were tied down. Immediately, Ares flapped his limbs and tried to struggle, but just as he did so, his throat was slit along with his vocal cords. Ares, lying silently on the watchtower with blood dripping from his wounds, was unable to even groan and just stared intently at the person who had attacked him. Ah! In Ares' rapidly fading field of vision, he saw something humanoid that had also put a knife to the throat of his partner Rogers, killing him. I am happy me. Ares then goes into an eternal sleep, calling the thing that stabbed him and Rogers with a knife a ghost. From Delta to Alpha eliminated two enemy soldiers stationed at the watchtower, no enemy presence in the vicinity, all clear. Alpha, Roger that. Advancing, let's go. Having successfully infiltrated the ancient castle, the members of Black Phantom silently dispatched the guards outside the castle one by one with swift, noiseless strikes, shattered the window glass with specialized equipment, and stealthily infiltrated the castle like flowing water. Thanks to the lax security measures, Black Phantom teams swiftly penetrated the castle and immediately dispersed to meticulously search each room within. This is odd, too quiet. However, Captain Arus, the overall commander of Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, and Delta teams of Black Phantom, each consisting of 15 members, frowned at the oppressive silence within the castle. Despite continuing their search of the castle without making a single sound, Captain Naruse couldn't shake off the suspicion of not encountering anyone since their infiltration. He contacted each team to confirm. Alpha to all teams, report the current situation. Bravo here, currently exploring the interior of the tower to the east of the castle no sign of enemies. Charlie here, conducting a search on the second floor of the castle, no enemy presence similar to Bravo. Delta reporting to Alpha discovered what appears to be a goods entrance leading to the underground in the central part of the first floor of the castle, no sight of enemy soldiers over what's going on, it's too deserted, there should be at least a thousand people in this castle, yet we've only encountered ten soldiers who were guarding the exterior of the castle could this be a trap? Alpha, roger that, bravo. Secure retreat route after completing exploration of the tower. Charlie and I will join Delta and head underground. Roger. After listening to the reports from each team, Captain Naruse's suspicions grew further. While considering the possibility that the castle itself might be a trap, he issued instructions to each team to proceed towards the goods entrance discovered by Delta to fulfill their mission. Is this it? TCH, a deployable magic barrier. Mary, lend a hand here. Having joined Delta Team, Captain Naruse noticed the deployable magic barrier erected at the goods entrance where a large wooden elevator was situated. He clicked his tongue lightly and instructed the magic users of Alpha Team to assist Delta Team's magic users who were already working on removing the magic barrier. Black Phantom includes five magic users, slaves proficient in magic bought from various places, assigned to each team. How much longer? Approximately three minutes. Too slow. Halve that time. Understood. Captain Naruse urged the magic user who had been working on removing the magic barrier before their arrival to hasten the process. Barrier successfully deactivated. And precisely a minute and a half later, the magic barrier at the goods entrance disappeared. Well done. Patting the shoulder of the team member who had been working on it, Captain Naruse praised him lightly, then selected about five members from Delta Team to remain and secure goods entrance while the remaining ten members of Delta Team, along with Alpha and Charlie teams, totaling forty people, descended into the underground. Alpha to HQ, proceeding to the castle's underground from this point. HQ, roger that. 
As they boarded the wooden elevator and descended, Captain Naruse and his team were unaware of what awaited them in the unforgiving depths below the castle. Volume 03 Chapter 09 Go Ahead Why is the light out? Captain Naruse rides an apparently unreliable wooden elevator and descends to the lowest floor of the research facility in the basement of an old castle. The light from the magic equipment like lighting equipment installed on the wall disappears and he is enveloped in darkness. Although he is worried about the underground situation, he uses hand signals to instruct his subordinates to proceed, and the AN-94, commonly known as Ibukin, is equipped with night vision goggles, a hollow sight, a suppressor, and a GP-30 underbarrel grenade launch under the barrel, it uses a unique mechanism in which the second bullet flies out of the muzzle before the muzzle shakes due to the recoil of the first 5.45mm X-39 bullet, which has a higher accuracy rate than normal full auto shooting. I readied my gun and began to slowly and carefully walk down the stone passageway, which was filled with the acrid smell of chemicals. At that time, Alpha Team and Delta Team went to the largest laboratory in the center of the laboratory to collect information, relying on the guide map of the whole underground that was next to the elevator, and Charlie Team went to the magic tool installed in the passageway. I headed to the room with the magic furnace, which is a device that supplies magical power to magic tools to light up the room, and to put it simply, it's a generator-like device. Then, as we split into groups and proceeded in formation through the eerily quiet hallway, the familiar scent of blood mixed with the smell of chemicals wafted into the air. When Captain Naruse and his friends noticed this, they became even more cautious and continued to move forward cautiously, when a strange object appeared in front of them. Stop. The team members who were leading the way raised their fists and used hand signals to urge the following members to stop. Captain, look at this. In a low voice, but with a sharp tone tinged with nervousness, the member who had found it called out to Captain Naruse, who was in the center of the formation. What is this guy? When Captain Naruse was called by his team, he came forward and found an enemy soldier lying on the floor of a pitch black hallway. Captain Naruse wouldn't have been so surprised if the soldier had simply fallen to the floor, but for some reason, a long sword had penetrated deeply into the head of the fallen soldier in front of him from the top of his head to the middle of his face. The head was split into two, and the bulging brain was peeking out. Is these a bite mark? While examining the corpse, a team member noticed that there were teeth marks all over the body that looked like human bites. It seems like that, but what the heck is going on here? Captain Naruse knitted his eyebrows together and mumbled a little, but no one knew the answer. Report from Alpha. The corpse of an enemy soldier has been found in an underground facility. Everyone. Be on guard, learn. Zaza, understood. Suba, it's... Is the radio wave condition bad? It's hard to connect by radio with the team on the ground. After alerting the other teams and moving the corpse aside, Captain Naruz and his team continued forward. This might not taste good, as they go deeper into the room. They see blood on the floor and walls and traces of battle, and the atmosphere surrounding Captain Naruz and his crew becomes even more tense. Captain. We have arrived. However, in the meantime, I arrived at my destination, the entrance to the largest underground laboratory. Let's quickly finish the mission and go home. Go. Captain Naruse arrived at the entrance to the laboratory and ordered his subordinates to rush in. Since the magic reactor was not working, the three members forced open the sturdy iron door with a handle similar to those found on ships, and the other members who were preparing to rush in quickly entered the research room. Snow falls, clear, clear. When a voice from inside the room was heard announcing the completion of control, Captain Naruse and the remaining members who had been waiting in the hallway entered the room. Bingo! Inside the pitch black room, there are a large amount of materials scattered around that prove that human experiments were being carried out, and in one corner of the room, there are specimens of humans and demons who were the subjects of human experiments in a large flask, as if soaked in formalin, it was placed with some kind of liquid and displayed, alpha more than Charlie. From now on, I will activate the magic furnace. Captain Naruse was looking at the materials and flasks he had picked up from the floor when he received a message from Team Charlie. Immediately after that, the light of the magic tool emitted a dazzling light. It's dazzling. Captain Naruse took off his old night vision goggles, blinked his eyes to adjust to the light, and gave orders to Team Charlie. 
Alpha to Charlie. Join us. I understand Charlie. I'm heading that way. All right, you guys. After giving orders to Team Charlie, Captain Naruz opened his mouth to give instructions to the members who were collecting information while taking videos and photos around him. Bang! In the corner of the room, a rectangular iron box large enough to hold one person made a loud banging noise from within. Instantly, the team members aimed their guns at the box in unison. Captain Naruz gestured to a nearby team member to open it, who nodded and cautiously lowered his gun, then approached the box. With a hand on the edge of the box, the team member kicked the lock, and with a swift motion, he opened it. Cough, cough, phew, I thought I was a goner. With those words, an elderly man dressed in a black robe tumbled out of the box. Absolutely ridiculous. You're too late to rescue me. Besides, you, perhaps suffering from oxygen deprivation, the elderly man, crawling on all fours, paused to catch his breath before continuing his tirade. However, Upon raising his head, he finally realized that the group dressed in black who had rescued him were not allies. Turning pale and falling silent, dash 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 dash, please, I'll tell you anything, just save me. With his hands firmly held by a kneeling team member, the old man pleaded for his life, adopting a pitiful posture reminiscent of a condemned prisoner awaiting execution. Even before Captain Naru spoke, anything, you say, then? First, your name, next, what was happening here, and finally, what's happening right now. Why yes my name is Elsie Barlight, I'm the head researcher in charge of this facility. As Barlight began speaking, his expression revealing his fear of the figures before him, Captain Naruz and his team's faces quickly turned grim as they listened. So, what's the situation? You were conducting research on immortality attempting to recreate the undead legion from the mythology of the Rauan religion using a drug that accidentally turns living beings into zombies. During today's experiment, the subjects injected with a zombie drug escaped, attacking researchers and soldiers, turning them into zombies one by one. As a result, this facility is now overrun with zombies. Why yes but when he came here, we didn't encounter any zombies. Though there were bodies that seemed dead that's probably because the surviving soldiers and researchers fled deeper into the facility, the zombies were drawn to them and congregated in the deeper areas. Additionally, just before I entered this box, the magical reactor emergency stopped, causing the defense mechanisms of the facility to seal off the corridors in each area, trapping those who fled. If the magical reactor were restarted, the supply of magic would resume, and the sealed passages would open likely allowing the zombies, who are chasing the escapees, to come this way, however, I've given up hope at this point, crap, this is the worst, having realized the dire situation they were in, Captain Naruz immediately contacted each team, alpha to all teams, respond, Charlie here, what's going on, but only Charlie team responded, due to being underground and the worsening radio conditions since they arrived underground, Communication between the teams on the surface and Captain Naruz's team underground had become impossible. Darn it, Charlie. Listen up, we have a problem. Get out of here immediately. Though Captain Naruz issued instructions to the reachable Charlie team, it was already too late. What? What's happening? Alpha. Explain, wait a moment what's wrong? There where are they? Charlie. What's going on? What happened? Fire. Fire. Keep firing. Damn it. This is bad. Retreat. Quickly. Hurry. Charlie. Charlie. Respond. Charlie here. We've encountered monsters and are engaged in combat. Where the hell did they come from? There are too many. We need reinforcements. Ah. Stop. No. With the deafening sounds of gunfire emanating from the radio and the final agonizing cry of the Charlie team leader, the communication abruptly ceased. As Captain Naruz listened to the ominous noises and voices, his expression twisted beneath his cap. Darn it, Jackson, Alexei, Blood, take this old man and head to the surface immediately, inform HQ of our situation, Delta, secure the corridor from here to the elevator at all costs, the rest, follow me, we're going to rescue Charlie, learn, 
The soldiers immediately responded to the orders that came out of Captain Naruse's mouth in quick succession and began to move. After giving instructions, Captain Naruse ran out of the room with his team members and ran down the hallway, relying on the sound of gunshots coming from a distance. This way, hurry! Captain Naruse ordered the following members to hurry up and called out to Team Charlie. This is Alpha. Charlie respond. Charlie. Hey, this is Charlie. Exclamation mark nine people killed in action. Exclamation mark the captain was also killed. Exclamation mark. The members of Charlie team finally responded to Captain Naruse's desperate call, but the content of the reply they received was the worst. We're heading that way. Try to hold on. Yo, I understand. Exclamation mark what? Question mark hey. Exclamation mark it's coming from the right. Exclamation mark shoot, shoot. Exclamation mark. Please be on time! Exclamation mark. The communication was cut off again, and as Captain Naruse and his friends were desperately running, an enemy soldier with blank, cloudy eyes and his right arm torn off in the middle was making a groaning sound as he staggered towards us with unsteady steps. It's here. You're in the way. Get out of the way. Captain Naruse, facing a soldier who had turned into a zombie yelled as he ran, waving his fist and slamming his fist into the zombie's face as hard as he could, the zombie received a blow strong enough to break its cheekbone, and was blown away about five meters and sank to the floor of the passageway, however, there was no way the zombie, which had already turned into a moving corpse, would die by itself, and the zombie slowly got back up with its deformed and pitiful face as if nothing had happened, fuck me. However, at the moment the zombie was about to get up, Captain Naruse and the others who were running passed over the zombie's body, and the last member stopped, stepped on the zombie's head, pulled out the 5-7 from its holster, and fired, finishing off the zombie. Did. I'm here. I'm here. After a few minutes of running, Captain Naruse and his team quickly cleared away the 5 or 6 zombies they encountered along the way, and found the survivors of Charlie's team at a T-junction. You saved me. As soon as he took his eyes off the zombies and saw Captain Naruse and his friends, the last surviving member of Team Charlie said, feeling relieved from the bottom of his heart, I guess he lost his guard when he saw Captain Naruse and the others running towards him. So he stopped shooting and tried to run towards us from the T-junction junction, but the neck of the team member was so strong that it didn't look like a zombie. With a nimble movement, it bit. Guckery. The sound of the flesh of the members' necks being torn echoed through the hallway and filled Captain Naruse's ears. And in front of Captain Naruse and his friends, who stopped in their tracks, they saw that something was the result of a human experiment, or perhaps the failure of a biological weapon. But a creature with an indescribable chimera-like appearance was the corpse of a member of the team. I was just devouring it. Fuck you. Captain Naruse and his friends were enraged by seeing their comrades being killed and devoured right in front of their eyes, so they raised their guns and fired all at once at the chimeras who were still engrossed in their meal, and at the group of chimeras and zombies that slowly appeared from inside. Shower. Captain Naruse's AN-94, the P-90 and N-240 machine guns carried by the soldiers, and the VSS produced an orchestra of gunfire. The P-90 does not use handgun bullets like existing submachine guns, but uses a newly developed 5.7 by 28 bullet with a bottleneck structure with a pointed tip, which is a miniature version of a rifle bullet. Because of this, it exhibits a penetrating power comparable to that of a rifle bullet, and when it hits the body of the chimera that was devouring the team member or the various zombies that are approaching from the depths of the passage weary growling sounds, the bullet rotates wildly inside the body and the bullet penetrates. The surrounding tissue is gouged out without any damage. The M240 machine gun continues to fire intermittently and shoots down the zombies with 7.62 by 51 NATO bullets, and the VSS, which is designed not for long-range precision shooting but for medium to short-range sniping or close-range gunfights, uses a 20-round magazine for full auto-shooting and single-shot shooting, sniper shooting. Use them wisely to take down each zombie one by one and the VSS, which is designed not for long-range precision shooting but for medium to short-range sniping or close-range gunfights, uses a 20-round magazine for full auto-shooting and single-shot shooting, sniper shooting. Use them wisely to take down each zombie one by one. By the way, 
Although the 9x39 bullet used by VSS is a rifle bullet, the initial velocity does not exceed the speed of sound, so it does not generate a shock wave. So if you combine this bullet with a VSS silencer, the bolt will not work unless you are next to the ejection port. All you can hear is the metallic sound of the ammunition being ejected. Huh? Concentrate your barrage on the Chimera. Don't let it get any closer. Understood. Hey, hurry and die. Captain Naruz and the others rain bullets on the Chimeras and zombies, crushing the heads of the slow-moving former humans and former monsters. But for some reason the Chimeras that have turned into zombies move quickly and have artificially made their bodies stronger. Because it had been made, it did not die easily. And it came right in front of Captain Naruz and his friends through the rain of bullets. Therefore, Captain Naruz and his friends had no choice but to abandon the slowly approaching zombies and concentrate their fire on the Chimera rays. Burn them down with fire magic. Understood. You guys just follow me. Look as I. By concentrating his fire, Captain Naruz defeated all of the approaching Chimeras. He gave orders to Rays and the others to use magic, and until the chant was finished. He fired so many shots that the barrels of his guns burned to the point of stopping the zombies. Dot. Gay I stelt. When Rays and the others finished chanting and waved their staffs, scorching flames were produced from the tips of their staffs and attacked the zombies. Ooh! Exclamation mark. TCH. No way. However, the fire magic used by Rays and his friends was unable to completely burn out the zombies. Rays. Can you make a wall or something with earth magic? The walls and floor here have an effect that nullifies magic. So it's impossible. Damn. If that's the case, there's nothing I can do. If this happens, I'll roll my ass and run. Go, go. Killing or killing, Captain Naruz, who gave up on recovering Team Charlie's bodies, saw the zombies coming out from the depths of the hallway like a cloud with a groan that sounded like they were crawling on the ground. He removed the MK3 grenade, picked it up, pulled out the safety pin, and threw it at the zombie. The thrown MK3 grenade disappears between waves of zombies in the blink of an eye, then explodes. The shock wave created by the TNT explosion calms down the zombie horde. This one is a bonus. Keep it. Captain Naruz shouted as he pulled the trigger of the GP-30 attached to the bottom of the AN-94's barrel and fired a 40mm grenade into the area that was still shrouded in smoke. With a shout, Captain Naruz pulled the trigger of the GP-30 attached beneath the barrel of his AN-94, firing a 40mm grenade toward the still smoked shrouded area. Immediately, a blast of shrapnel erupted within the corridor again finishing off the zombies whose arms and legs had been blown off by the explosion of MK3 grenades. After ensuring the outcome, Captain Naruz dashed towards the elevator, following his subordinates who had run ahead. As he sprinted, Captain Naruz tapped the shoulder of a team member who had been waiting for him to retreat, urging him to fall back. In response to the tap, the team member indiscriminately sprayed bullets from his magazine in full auto, then followed Captain Naruz's lead, tapping the shoulder of another team member who had been waiting in the rear. In this manner, alternating between retreat and engaging the zombies in delaying combat, the members of Alpha Team steadily retreated, merging with Delta Team to secure their escape route. Captain, you're safe, wait. What on earth are you bringing with you? The captain of Delta Team attempted to express relief at Captain Naruz's safety but exclaimed in despair upon seeing the large number of zombies behind him. Enough. Fall back. Retreat. Upon hearing Captain Naruz's command, the members of Delta Team immediately agreed without hesitation and ran towards the elevator. Captain, what about the members of Charlie Team? While running towards the elevator, the leader of Delta Team ran alongside Captain Naruz and inquired. They didn't make it. I see that's unfortunate. Upon hearing that Charlie team had been wiped out, the leader of Delta team muttered with a downcast expression before falling silent and concentrating on running. Is everyone aboard? We're all in. Then, let's go. Understood. Realizing they couldn't sustain delaying combat due to the overwhelming number of zombies, they abandoned the tactic and fled hastily towards the elevator. Upon reaching it safely, Captain Naruz and his team bid farewell to the approaching zombies with smiles and headed towards the surface. Captain, having barely escaped from underground and descended from the elevator, Jackson, who had already made it to the surface, rushed over to Captain Naruz. What is it? 
The escape helicopters will arrive in 10 minutes. I see. Then, let's move to the courtyard. We should be able to land the helicopters there. Understood. Captain Naruz decided to wait for the helicopter's arrival in the courtyard of the ancient castle, where they could have a clear view. Fifteen minutes later, Captain Naruz and his team were aboard two CH-47F helicopters. Having experienced a hellish ordeal in the airspace above the ancient castle. Captain, it was quite ordeal this time. Wasn't did a member of his team, looking exhausted as he sat in the seat of the CH-47F, spoke to Captain Naruz. Indeed, but knowing there might be more missions like this in the future weighs heavily on my mind this is incredible. Everyone, look down below. Overwhelmed by the thought of events they didn't even want to imagine, Captain Naruz sighed deeply as the pilot of the CH-47F made an announcement, instructing everyone to look at the ancient castle. Looking out the window as instructed, Captain Naruz and his team saw evidence of the castle being destroyed as the cover-up operation began. In the airspace above the ancient castle, two strategic bombers with variable wings, the American B-1 Lancer and the Russian to 160 formed formations, each packed with jam equipped weapons bays filled to the brim with grand slams and tall boys, dropping them one after another. Specially prepared jam equipped grand slams and tall boys, dropped from an altitude of 10,000 meters, gradually increased their falling speed, corrected the landing points error through inertial and GPS guidance, and finally pierced the ancient castle breaking through the bricks and stones that formed it and penetrating all the way to the underground laboratory, where they exploded. Pillars of fire erupted from the ground, dropping from the sky at supersonic speed and causing massive explosions underground. The grand slams and tall boys caused minor earthquakes on the surface and eventually led to the collapse of the entire underground area. The ancient castle collapsed, sinking into the ground with a tremendous rumble. Having completely destroyed the ancient castle along with the zombies with the grand slams and tall boys they carried, the B-1 and two 160 bombers returned calmly to their base. Wow Captain Naruz and his team, watching the spectacle of the ancient castle being pulverized by overwhelming firepower from inside the CH-47F, could only express their admiration in awe. Volume 03 Chapter 10 2 AC 130s and 3 F 15 E Strike Eagles flew arrogantly in formation over the forest near the border between the Demon Alliance and the Elza's Magic Empire. Gritney 01 to HQ, arriving at designated airspace, requesting instructions over. Tasked with the mission to crush the secret Imperial Army base hidden within the forest below, Probum's infantry unit, facing difficulties, urgently dispatched the two AC-130s, call signs, Gritney 01, 02, escorted by a squadron of three F-15s armed with air-to-air missiles AIM-9 Sidewinders and AIM-120 UMRAMs, call sign, Bygas Squadron, upon reaching the designated airspace, Gritney 01, the commanding aircraft, contacted HQ, HQ, understood, establishing radio contact with the 8th Infantry Battalion currently engaged in combat on the ground, Gritney 01 and 02, follow the instructions of the 8th Infantry Battalion until the support mission concludes, over, Gritney 01, understood, Gritney 02, understood, once communication with HQ ended, Gritney 01 received another transmission mixed with gunfire. This is Lieutenant Colonel Morrison of the 8th Infantry Battalion. We are facing intense enemy resistance with numerous casualties. Designate enemy positions with smoke for us to obliterate them. Gritney 01 understood, responding to the request from the 8th Infantry Battalion. Gritney 01 and 02 entered a support stance, attacking the Imperial Army entrenched within the forest. Awaiting coordinates from the 8th Infantry Battalion, colorful smoke began billowing from the forest below, reds, greens, purples, Gritney 01 here. Visual on target coordinates, commencing close air support, watch out for friendly fire. 8th Infantry Battalion here, evacuation completed. Go ahead and give it your all. After the response from the 8th Infantry Battalion, a barrage of shells descended from the two circling AC-130s targeting the designated areas marked by the smoke. 
the gunners aboard the AC-130s, viewing the ground through infrared sensors on monochrome screens, manipulated the joystick to adjust the cannon direction upon sighting enemy soldiers displayed in white or black, then pulled the trigger. With a thunderous roar, the deadly 105mm howitzer shells landed in the heart of the Imperial Army's stronghold, engulfing the soldiers in flames and smoke, followed by the boom. Boom. Of 40 mm cannons, the shells struck magical weaponry, causing explosions. The distinct sound of the motors resonated as the 25 mm Gatling gun rounds swept across the ground, clearing away Imperial soldiers who had valiantly fought moments before as if they were mere leaves in the wind. By the time the two AC 130s completed their third rotation, the Imperial Army's stronghold, which had troubled the 8th Infantry Battalion, was obliterated, leaving the forest, once filled with young trees, now resembling a scorched wasteland. After the forest turned into a wasteland and enemy troops disappeared from sight, close air support was temporarily halted for the 8th Infantry Battalion to confirm the enemy's presence. 8th Infantry Battalion here, confirmed elimination of enemy and enemy stronghold. Thank you for the support. Gritney 01 and 02. Gritney 01, understood. Terminating close air support. Returning to base. Upon receiving confirmation of the Imperial Army's stronghold destruction from the 8th Infantry Battalion, it was time for Gritney 01 and 02 to conclude their mission and head back to the Dales base. Whoa, what? The panicked voice of a soldier from the 8th Infantry Battalion still echoed through the radio, which hadn't been disconnected yet. What's going on? The pilot of Gritney 01, in response to the voice, questioned the 8th Infantry Battalion. But the response unexpectedly came from Bygas Squadron. From directly below, five battleships and numerous Dragon Knights are ascending. Break, break. Upon receiving the report, Gritney 01's pilot suddenly glanced down to see five battleships and their accompanying Dragon Knights, cleverly concealed, rising into the sky. This altitude is bad news. Full throttle on the engines. Let's get out of here. Full throttle. Ascending. Gritney 01 to HQ. We've encountered enemy battleships and Dragon Knights. Send reinforcements immediately. Repeat. As the radio operator requested reinforcements from HQ, the pilot and co-pilot of Gritney 01 pushed the throttle levers, relying on the increased propulsion of the engines to attempt a forced ascent. It seemed that the proximity of the 8th Infantry Battalion had alerted the enemy, prompting an attack on the AC-130s. The five battleships hidden near the base hastily fled towards Imperial territory, while their escorting Dragon Knights perhaps to aid their escape or to engage in close air support, aggressively attacked the AC-130s flying at low altitudes. Bygas Squadron, all weapons free. Forget about the battleships, prioritize taking out the Dragon Knights. Roger that. Bygas Squadron, engaging, however, not allowing this to happen. The three F-15S, escorts to the AC-130s, swiftly disposed of their external fuel tanks to lighten their load and launched an assault on the Dragon Knights. Yet, due to the unforeseen emergence of battleships and Dragon Knights from below, the Bygas Squadron found themselves unexpectedly engaged in close combat, struggling with differences in relative speed. Nevertheless, they successfully eliminated all the Dragon Knights without a single scratch on the AC-130 they were protecting. Combat concluded. Regroup. Understanding the Bigger's Squadron. Having achieved the extermination of the Dragon Knights, regrouped in a trail formation and assembled under the two AC-130s, observing the situation from above. Report remaining ammunition for each aircraft. The Bagas squadron leader inquired to the formation. Second aircraft here, zero rounds for the Gatling gun, zero air-to-air -air missiles, came a response. Same for the third aircraft, zero rounds for the Gatling gun, zero air-to-air -air missiles. Captain, do you still have any remaining? I'm out of ammo too. Though they had prioritized protecting the AC-130s and successfully destroyed all the Dragon Knights, they had exhausted their ammunition leaving the warship unscathed. They're fleeing, remarked the pilot of Glutton E01, watching the retreating warship alongside the co-pilot, as they listened to the conversation of the Bagas squadron over the open channel. What about the request for reinforcements? Yes, as soon as we informed them about the appearance of the warship, 
they promised immediate reinforcement, but it's unlikely they'll make it in time. By the time the reinforcements arrive here, the warship will likely be deep into the Empire's territory. Letting them escape like this doesn't sit well with me. Listening to the communications officer, the captain of Glutton EO1 stared at the warship with a discontented expression, a mysterious gleam shining in his eyes. Please stop that, don't say strange things. The co pilot, noticing the gleam in his captain's eyes, attempted to admonish him, but the captain interrupted with determination. All right, it's decided. From here on, Glutton EO1 and Glutton EO2 will engage the enemy warship in artillery combat. Prepare for battle, everyone. All right, from this point onward, our aircraft and Glutton EO2 will engage in a gunfire exchange with enemy battleships. All crew members, prepare for combat. Amidst the echoing engine noise, the crew members couldn't conceal their surprise at the captain's words transmitted through the radios attached to their helmets. Wait, are we really going to engage in aerial gunfire in this aircraft? Our captain sure does some crazy stuff, is he craving to devour more enemies, huh? I've never heard of such a thing as aerial gunfire before. Lucky you, it's a first time experience. I'm not thrilled at all. Not with such a first time experience. While murmurs of discontent floated around the interior of the AC-130, everyone still prepared for combat as per the captain's orders. Captain are you really going through with this? We're doing it. If we're doing it. Ignoring the vice captain's inquiry, the captain stubbornly affirmed his decision. All right, understood. Let's do this. Enemy battleships spotted ahead at 11 o'clock, distance 4000, fleeing in a single column formation. Realizing the captain's determination wasn't going to waver, the vice captain sighed and calmly relayed the positions of the enemy battleships. All right, let's hit them with a salvo in the same direction, then make a left turn for a head-on battle. Roger. Conveniently facing a neat single column formation of five fleeing battleships. The captain grinned mischievously as if he had a brilliant idea. Hey, launch the flares. What? Why, it's a scare tactic. R, indeed, perfect for intimidation. Tell Glutton EO2 to do the same. Understood. Initially puzzled by the captain's intentions, the vice captain received a straightforward answer when he asked about the reason for launching flares. As Glutton EO1 and O2 synchronized their flare releases, the enemy battleship formation seemed to falter giving a somewhat majestic sight. Looks like they got scared after all. Chuckling to himself, the captain remarked. Distance to the enemy, 500 meters, a line. All right, all hands, prepare for combat. From now on, our aircraft will engage in gunfire. Get ready to bring the heat. Roger that. Reacting to the vice captain's report, the captain spurred the crew into action, and thus, the unprecedented aerial gunfire by the AC-130 began. Prepare for left side gunfire. Fire. Following the captain's command, shells were fired one after another from the two AC-130s towards the battleships. Damn. Can't hit a thing. Despite two 105mm shells being fired at the rearmost battleship from a distance of 300 meters, they missed due to the wind. With that many shots missing this should be enough right? Oi, 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 go down already. However, a barrage of 40mm and 25mm Gatling gun rounds scattered randomly, hitting the side decks and mast of the battleships. Unfortunately, a 40mm round hit the base of the mast directly, causing it to snap, rendering the battleship propulsion less and adrift. Additionally, incendiary rounds from the 25mm Gatling guns caused fires throughout the ship. Similar relentless attacks befell the battleship sailing in front, leaving the Imperial fleet in shambles after the two AC-130s passed by. The rearmost battleship, 5th ship, lost its mast and caught fire, wandering aimlessly in the air. Ships 2 and 4 in front, while escaping, were hit by 105mm shells exploding into fireballs and disappearing. The third ship, bombarded by the 40mm Gatling guns, suffered numerous breaches and fractures all over its hull, eventually breaking apart and crashing. The lead ship, first ship, was unlucky as a 25mm Gatling round hit its powder magazine, causing repeated explosions as it descended towards the ground, engulfed in flames. No need to turn back now. Yes. The historic aerial gunfire by the AC-130 ended as a one-sided victory, 
prompting Glutton E01 and O2, along with the F-15E, to return to base triumphantly. And with this battle, the Imperial forces, units capable of organized action, within the Demonic Alliance were completely wiped out. Volume 03 Chapter 11 Weapon Recall Weapons developed and manufactured until 2013 can now be recalled. Recallable quantity and unit composition the current level is 65 infantry, 120,000 personnel, artillery, 15,000 vehicles, 15,000 aircraft, 8,500 ships, 6,500 personnel required to operate artillery, vehicles, aircraft, ships, etc., will be recalled together with these weapons. Personnel for rear support, engineers, maintenance personnel, communication personnel, supply personnel, medical personnel, etc., are not included in the infantry and can be recalled separately. Currently, the number of rear support personnel that can be recalled is up to the scale of the general army. There are no restrictions on the recall of heavy weapons and firearms within the range that infantry can operate. Help. Attention to abilities. Recalling is possible without using the menu screen, using only voice or thought. Once recalled military supplies, resources, and facilities can be removed, but people, soldiers, cannot be removed. It is impossible to remove the corpses of deceased soldiers. Also, it is not possible to recall the same person who has died again. During combat, recall abilities cannot be used. Rear support personnel are now capable of actively engaging in self-defense combat. Discussion on the recall ability and complete healing ability of soldiers. Regarding the recall ability of soldiers. It has been observed that the recalled soldiers are copies of individuals who have existed or existed on Earth, and therefore possess the same skills, knowledge, and memories as the originals. When conducting a random recall without setting the parameters, gender, age, personality, weapons and equipment carried, of the recalled soldiers in advance, there may occasionally be mix-ups with past heroes. As an exception, there are also heroes who appear as operational personnel when specific weapons such as artillery, vehicles, aircraft, and ships are recalled. For example, Lieutenant Rudel with the A-10. Furthermore, it seems that all recalled soldiers are imbued with a sense of loyalty to the Supreme Leader, Nagato Kazuya. Next, regarding the complete healing ability. What is understood about the complete healing ability is that those who have been treated for injuries or illnesses by the complete healing ability, depending on the severity of the injury or illness, tend to develop favorable feelings towards the user of the ability, Nagato Kazuya. In particular, those who have lost parts of their bodies or who have been in critical condition and received treatment tend to develop a significantly fanatical affection. For example, concerning Amira Rozang who lost her right hand from the elbow down and her left eye and was critically injured but recovered through the complete healing ability. At present, there are many signs of favorable feelings, but no signs of fanatic affection. Therefore, it is deemed necessary to monitor her progress in the future. The reason why receiving treatment through the complete healing ability makes one more likely to develop affection is purely speculative, but it is thought to be the result of some influence exerted by Nagato Kazuya's magical power on the target during treatment. Since there are still many unclear points about the abilities, continuous investigation seems necessary in the future. Tilda from the fourth ability investigation report. Phew, it's like this for now. Rarely, in a quiet office where no one else was present, Kazuya let go of the fourth ability assessment report he had finished writing, took a sip of the tea that had cooled down a little, and patted his stiff shoulders. Oh, I'm doing it, I'm doing it. After stretching himself, Kazuya stood up and looked out the window of his office at the lively scene of Dale's base and muttered that, the Parabim army, which had almost wiped out the Imperial army from within the Demon Alliance. Once the Demon army's defense system was in place, they gradually called back the troops that had been deployed in various places to Dale's base, and the soldiers who had been on duty until now were given air deuce. A party was held to celebrate the occasion, and it became a revelry of drinking and singing. Knock knock. Come in, excuse me. While Kazuya was looking at the excited and noisy soldiers with a warm gaze, Captain Wong, a member of the SS, entered the office. What's wrong? Is something wrong? No, it's not really a problem, but I need your Excellency's signature on this document. I'm sorry, 
but I would appreciate your signature. I understand look, after quickly looking over the document and signing it, Kazuya handed it back to Captain Wong. Thank you. Yes, that's true by the way. Your Excellency will not be attending the party, Captain Wong who was about to change his heel after checking Kazuya's sign, suddenly said that as if he had a doubt. Huh? R. There will be some people who will be strangely hesitant if I go, so I'll leave it to you. Really? I think everyone would be happy if His Excellency came. Captain Wong has a disappointed look on his face when he hears Kazuya's words. Your Excellency if you are not going to participate in the party, may I show you to a good store? Captain Wong says this perhaps out of concern for Kazuya who is not participating in the party, is it a good store? Yes, it's a good store. Captain Wong, who had a fearless smile on his face after Kazuya's words, spoke up, what kind of store is this? That's something you can enjoy after you go. Captain Wong evades Kazuya's question and answers, I guess I'll have some fun after I go then I'll go and check it out, ha. Huh. Then I'll arrange a car. Kazuya, who was probably curious and felt bad about refusing the invitation, left the Dales base with Captain Wong, who had a fearless smile on his face, but Kazuya thought about it later. At this point, he should have turned down Captain Wong's invitation. A good shop is a brothel. Kazuya, accompanied by Captain Wong, who was the one who suggested it, and their male members of the SS Guard, came to Ayocho in Beluge the capital of the demon allied powers and there was a brothel called in Manoya Carter located in a corner of the colored town. Strangely enough, I thought he was sneaking around the base without being noticed. As the name suggests, this is a brothel where many succubus are employed, and it is one of the best among the brothels in Beluge. The service is excellent, and the price is a little high, but considering the service, it's a very reasonable setting, I'm sure your excellency will like it. Captain Wong looking away from Kazuya who was stunned, said something like this with some pride. If Chittas, who has a strong desire to possess, finds out about this she will be killed. That's why I'm going home. Hey, your excellency, it's okay. Vice President Chittas is currently in his home country, and he came out from Dale's base without being seen by anyone, so there's no way anyone will know that your excellency came here. Kazuya tries to turn on his heel, but Captain One stops him in a panic. Dot. Is that okay with you? Even if you go home without experiencing the ultimate pleasure that humans can never experience, if I miss this opportunity, I might never be able to come again. By the way, everyone here, including myself, has experienced the demon mansion and is already addicted to it. Your Excellency, make your decision. Seeing Kazuya's hesitation, Captain Wong and his escort members approached him in unison as one last push. He's come. Kazuya who was pushed away by Captain Wong and the others and was unable to resist men's sex, is led into the room by a brothel boy. In the room, there is a large bed that is set up neatly and it is obvious what it is used for. A variety of adult toys are lined up in the corner of the room, and there is even a large shower room with a bathtub. In such a room, Kazuya sat on the bed with his back to the door and muttered, feeling a mixture of anticipation and guilt, but well, now that we've come this far, it's time to open up and enjoy it, yeah, let's do that. In order not to waste Captain Wong's goodwill, Kazuya changed his mind and decided to enjoy his first brothel experience. In order not to waste Captain Wong's goodwill, Kazuya changed his mind and decided to enjoy his first brothel experience. Knock knock. That was the time, there was a knock on the door of the room at the perfect time, as if Kazuya was waiting for her to change her mind. Ha, hi, Kazuya who was strangely nervous, couldn't help but reply in a surprised voice. Please excuse me. With a dignified, comfortable and familiar voice, the door behind Kazuya quietly opened and several succubi entered the room. Yeah? Sounds familiar? Kazuya felt something strange about the voice of the succubus, who was supposed to be meeting him for the first time. Then, with a question mark on his face, Kazuya turned around and looked at the succubi who should have come in. Thank you for coming to Inmano Mansion today. We look forward to providing you with the ultimate pleasure. Dot. Now then, dot. Question mark what's wrong, customer? Chitters, rather than the succubus with a somewhat dark smile on her face, asked a question to Kazuya, who was dripping with cold sweat in a strange manner. R, 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 um, um, yes, what is it, customer? 
www why are you here? Although Kazuya was stuttering loudly like a broken tape recorder or radio, he decided to ask Chitas who was smiling darkly in front of him. Yes, I finished work early and returned to Dale's base to find that my master was not there, I checked with my subordinates to find out his whereabouts, and they told me that he was heading to this suspicious place, so I hurried. I flew over. Oh, by the way, I've already purged the unscrupulous people who brought my master to a place like this, so there's no need to worry. Jaya. I could hear Captain Wong's final screams coming from somewhere along with Chitazi's words, it's not good, this situation is too bad. So, it wasn't the succubi that entered Kazuya's room, but Chitas, Kazuya's exclusive maids, Reina and Reina, and for some reason, all of them were playing cosplays that hit Kazuya's tastes. He was dressed. Chitas wears a pure Japanese style kimono with plenty of adult sex appeal. Vampire sisters Reina and Reina wear white and navy blue school swimsuits and knee socks. By the way, the name tag on her swimsuit has the words Reina and Reina written in hiragana. L, the ogre, wears black gothic Lolita clothes that suit her short height, which is inappropriate for her age. Lamia's she wears a white nurse uniform. Dark elf Luminous wears a sheer baby doll that makes her dark skin stand out, and a garter belt that is also sheer. The fox races Kulotsa shrine maiden clothes with a beautiful contrast of white and red. Wilhelm, a werewolf, wears red glasses, a grey suit, and black tights, making him look like a female teacher. Dot finished. Kazuya prepares to die in front of Chitas and the others, who are wearing such a cosplay and smiling to the point of being frightening. I am sorry, Chitas. I don't want to. Master, please don't apologize. Huh? Kazuya was about to make an excuse, just like a husband who has been caught cheating, but Chitas cuts him off. My husband is a man and he is also a man with a high sexual desire, therefore, it can't be helped that he becomes interested in places like this. And it is also our fault. Will you forgive me? said Kazuya, holding in his heart a ray of hope for her, that's why. However, Chitas's next words stop Kazuya, we have changed our service attitude so far, and from now on, we will continue to do our best every day, morning, noon and night, regardless of when Master feels like it. We will serve you accordingly. A. Eh? Kazuya's face turns pale at Chitas's declaration. Chitas, are you really angry? Giglies. Chitas had a smile on her face that was so beautiful that she added A at the end of her words, but her eyes were black and simmering. Dot. Kazuya finally realizes this and makes up his mind. If I don't please Chitas and get her forgiveness, I'll die later! Exclamation mark. However, Chitas says this as if to mock Kazuya's determination. Now, I would like to begin today's service. Oh, by the way, Shl, Kulot, and Wilhelm have entered their Astra season, so please be prepared for twice as much as usual. Really? Exclamation mark comma dot 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 Chikusho. Exclamation mark if this happens, I'll do it. Exclamation mark. Kazuya who had become desperate, gathered his strength and challenged Chitas and his friends, but Kazuya doesn't remember much of what happened after that. Chitas, with her long black hair in disarray, wearing a kimono that was secured with a belt so that she couldn't take it off, was riding a horse and was shaking her hips relentlessly while exclaiming Master, Master with a hot breath, as if she were in a fever. Dot by the way, five times. Lying on her back on the bed, with her red cheeks and moist eyes, she looked at me invitingly, and with her legs spread in an M shape, I shifted the cloth that covered her private parts of her school swimsuit and begged her to see Reina, and the image of me thrusting into her. Dot by the way, eight times in total. She asked to force L into submission, but she turned her face down and covered her small body, which was still wearing black gothic Lolita clothes, with a wicked smile on her face and made her stop moving over and over again. Elle was letting out a muffled moan, and I was having fun with her until she passed out. By the way, three times. Shale wraps the snake's body tightly so that it cannot move while inside the snake, presses their lips together, and tramples the inside of the mouth with a long tongue making a naughty sound, slurping up the saliva deliciously. By the way, six times. I can't help but push Luminous down and lay her down on the floor, revealing her important parts as if to emphasize her shorts. By the way, three times. I purposely put her half-naked, 
crawl on all fours, and enjoy the culottes, which gently stroke her fluffy tail without moving and send shivers down my spine in frustration. By the way, six times. With my hands on the bed, my black tights were torn off and he was forced to penetrate me from behind without my asking. However, I was already completely ready and was greeted with tears of gratitude as I cried out for more and more. Something like Wilhelm who wants a child just so he can get pregnant. By the way, seven times. Kazuya doesn't remember much about cheaters and the others showing off their disheveled appearance. Volume 03 Chapter 12 Itatami Lower Back They rented a room in the Inma's mansion, during the event. An accident occurred in which Succubi, whose interest was aroused, came to take a look, and Chitters chased them away with a Japanese sword in hand. The frenzied party that lasted for two days was over, and the night dawned. Today, Kazuya was sitting in a chair in his office at Dale's base, looking visibly haggard and rubbing his lower back, which was giving off a dull pain. Master, are you okay? Would you like me to bring you a compress? While Kazuya was rubbing his back, Reina and Reina who were standing next to him, asked Kazuya with worried faces. Ah, I'm sorry, but please. Understood. I'll bring it to you right away. Does it hurt? Master. My sister Reina trotted over to get the compress, and while she waited for the compress to come, she was gently stroking Kazuya's lower back with her small hands as if to give him some relief. They're good kids. The two of them behaved so gracefully and neatly that it was hard to believe that they were the same people who were drowning in lust and greedily seeking Kazuya's offspring just yesterday. Kazuya relaxed as his heart was healed by his own cute maid, who was a lady by day and a prostitute by night. Phew, that's a lot easier. Thank you, Reina. Reina. Eh. After applying a compress to my lower back, I thanked them and patted them on the head and they were happy with gentle smiles befitting their age. Kazuya was even more comforted by the sight of them and decided to give them a reward. Here, here's your reward. Kazuya said as he made a small cut on his index finger with a paper knife that was on his desk, drew blood, and held it out in front of the two of them. Huh? The moment Reina and Reina saw bright red blood flowing out of the wound on Kazuya's index finger, their calm expressions from before completely changed. Their expressions are reminiscent of that frenzied party, with flushed cheeks and eyes stained with lust. The two of them knelt in front of Kazuya at the same time as they exhaled a feverish sigh. She ran her small tongue around her index finger, which was dripping with blood, and began to carefully lick the overflowing blood. Nchuumph, Nyachupuro, Nnn, Npero, Chunfaparoshu. Kazuya was sitting on a chair holding out his index finger, and in front of his gaze, two beautiful girls in maid costumes were kneeling down, and the wings that looked like bat wings sprouting from their backs were flapping like the tails of a puppy. With a cocky look on his face, he was licking his fingers obsessively while making lewd sounds as if they were engaged in foreplay, and was fidgeting and rubbing his crotches together. That's when Kazuya's son, who was struck by the lewd behavior of the two, got up and was about to prepare for battle. Knock knock. Master, the helicopter is ready. Today, Chitters came to Kazuya's office to inform him that the preparations for the VH-60N President Hawk, which he had arranged for the scheduled oil field inspection, were completed. Oh, R, R, okay, I'll go now. Kazuya was immersed in a gentle and pleasant sensation as he was giving blood, being sucked, by two vampires. But when he heard Chitters's voice coming from the other side of the door, he suddenly came to his senses and panicked. After replying, I called out to Reina and Reina. Is it already that time Reina, Reina? Let's go, huh? Hum yes. Chup, chew, nku ha I understand. Immediately after Kazuya called out to them, the two of them were sucking the blood from Kazuya's index finger with joyful expressions, and they were still looking at Kazuya's index finger wistfully. But they heard the voice of their master and Chitters's voice that cannot be replaced by anything. Thanks to the gift of education, he quickly suppressed the vampire's instinct for blood with reason and answered Kazuya's call. Come on, let's hurry. I shouldn't have given her that much to drink, but maybe I gave her too much. Kazuya hurriedly opened the door to the office as the two of them looked red and slightly unsteady, probably because they had drunk the blood of the master, something so exquisite that it surpassed any wine. On the other side of the open door were chitters, the maid's L, Sh, Kulot and members of the SS, but among them was Fine, standing next to Chitters. Ah, Rosengel, 
Have you come back? Cause Yu Yu, who had thought that only Chitters, the maid, and the SS members were in front of the door, looked a little surprised when he saw Fine who was standing next to Chitters. Will there be any problems if I'm here? Is there a problem if I'm around? For a moment, Fine, who had been studying abroad in Purubam's homeland for a while, separated from Kazuya's side, and had just returned here, seemed hurt by Kazuya's words, or rather, annoyed. N no, there's no problem. HMPH, since the incident before, the day they saved the half-elf bell, Fine had started to show a slightly gentler attitude towards Kazuya, but now, like a sulking child who didn't receive attention from their parent, she turned her face away from Kazuya with a pout. Question mark W What am I doing? Acting like this makes it seem like I'm sulking. Ahem, well, never mind. I heard we're going to inspect the facility that processes burning water. Could I come along too? For a moment, Fine pouted and turned her face away from Kazuya, but when she realized she was acting like a child, she blushed and hastily spoke to cover it up. Oh. Um, it's fine. In fact, I'd be very happy if a beauty like fine came along. HHMPH. I won't be deceived by such transparent flattery. In an attempt to improve fine's mood, cause Yuya made a flattering remark. And although fine verbally denied it, she couldn't hide her happiness, as her lips twisted into a smile and her face flushed. However, what fine, who had become pleased with being called a beauty, didn't notice was what happened the moment cause Yuya praised her. Oh, that's fine. In fact, I'd be very happy if a beauty like fine? Crack. Oh no. This is bad. 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 I'm such an idiot. Came along, it would be most welcome cause Yuya's praise of fine instantly triggered jealousy in Chitters, causing her face to contort like a demon, emitting a dark aura akin to miasma. This is bad this is really bad. Chitters is tolerant when it comes to me being close to our comrades female soldiers or maids of Brubham, but she won't tolerate me being involved with anyone else. Iris, Karen, or Fine. Why did I compliment Fine in front of Chitters? This might lead to another one of those frenzied feasts. Shivering, while Kazuya maintained a calm facade outwardly, inwardly. He was panicking and thrashing about. Just then, his gaze met Chitters's demonic expression. Huh? What's this? When we return from the inspection, we'll all serve you together right? That's not serving, is it? That's punishment under the guise of serving Ahaha stunned by the words silently conveyed by Chitters's lips as their eyes met, cause Yuya felt his world crumble. Unaware of such a scene, the guards and maids, who awkwardly distanced themselves from the chaotic trio consisting of the cheerful fine, the distraught cause Yuya and the intimidating Chitters, proceeded in a line towards the heliport, where President Hawk awaited. Well then, Master, please take care on your journey. As Kazuya boarded the helicopter waiting at the heliport with two President Hawks, Chitters, who remained at the base due to a scheduled meeting with Amira later, bid him farewell with a warm smile. Ah, I'll be going although overwhelmed by Chitters's smile, Kazuya managed to respond before pondering the impending chaos. If he were to proceed with the oil field inspection without taking any action, he would once again plunge into a heaven like hell, or a hell like heaven? A frenzied revelry. To break the current situation, Kazuya glanced back discreetly to ensure that Fine, Shale, and Kyurot, his companions on this trip, were not paying attention to him. Then, he leaned out of the helicopter and abruptly grabbed Chitters's arm, pulling her close and stealing a kiss. A MMM Chew, MMM. MMM slurp MMM, MMM, more MMM slurp, MMM taking advantage of the helicopter's noise, cause Yuya made obscene sounds as he intertwined his saliva covered tongue with Chitters's inside her mouth. Mkyu, ha, ha master, more MMM after the passionate and intense kiss that resembled a love affair, Chitters, whose strength had left her hips, leaned against cause Yuya, her voice filled with longing, asking for more. No. We can't continue. We'll finish this when I return and we're alone together. Understood? Rejecting Chitters's request outright, cause Yuya shared one last light kiss. MMM. Ha. Ha. Understood Master with a face softened to a degree unimaginable from her usual dignified expression. Chitters nodded, regained her strength in her hips, and distanced herself from cause Yuya. Then, as Chitters confirmed that she had moved far enough away, the helicopter took off from the heliport. All right. Now it's just me dealing with Chitters. 
The frenzy has been avoided. Few as the helicopter gradually ascended into the sky, Kazuya breathed a sigh of relief, believing that he had managed to avoid the frenzy. However, Kazuya remained oblivious to the fact that Shale and Kyurot were smiling silently at him, exchanging glances beside him. A strong wind roared, blowing ominously under the overcast sky, threatening imminent rainfall. Ten aircraft, consisting of two VH-60N Presidential Hawks and their escort of four AH-64D Apache Longbows, along with four Mi-24-35 MK-3 Super Hinds carrying fully armed Palace Guard members formed a formation as they hurried back towards the Dales base, Nagato, you seem pale rather worn out, actually are you alright? On their return journey from inspecting the oil field ceded from the Demon Alliance to Parabem in exchange for sending reinforcements, Fine spoke to Kazuya, observing his fatigued expression amidst the rattling and swaying of the presidential hawk buffeted by the strong winds, I'm fine. Don't worry about it. Still, Kazuya's words faltered as he couldn't bring himself to confess the reason behind his worn-out appearance. Having been drained by the lascivious demands of his maids, Layla, Lena, El, Shale, and Kuroto, whom he couldn't refuse during their separate excursion from the oil field inspection. Observing Kazuya's state, Fine wondered if something had happened to Nagato. More importantly, the weather seems bad ignoring Fine's concern. Kazuya glanced out of the presidential hawk's window, attempting to deflect attention, yeah, seems like it, noticing Kazuya's blatant attempt to change the subject, Fine decided to play along, this time of year, just before winter, this area tends to be quite turbulent, is that so, then the demon tribe living around here must have it tough, no, there are no demon tribes living around here, huh, why not, it looks like just a natural, lush hilly area it's because of the monsters I see, I understand now. Fine's explanation prompted Kazuya to nod in comprehension. This area is under the jurisdiction of the elves, but there are too many vicious monsters here. Even the elves who manage it rarely venture into these parts, it's like the forbidden forest. <laughs> That's a shame. Well, untouched nature has its own beauty, I guess. As Kazuya casually glanced down following Fine's explanation, he suddenly froze. Huh? Something's moving. Spotting movement in the forest below, Kazuya gasped, his breath catching. Emergency evasion. Hard right turn. What? Ah, despite Kazuya's sudden cry, the pilot of the presidential hawk swiftly responded, twisting the control stick to the right and pushing the engine pedal hard. As a result, the presidential hawk leapt up like a startled horse, its body shaking violently. Immediately after, a barrage of magical projectiles passed through the airspace where Kazuya and the others had been moments ago. Enemy sighted. Damn it. Amidst the tumultuous motion within the cabin caused by the sudden right turn, Kazuya glared at the enemy, shouting, Why are there magical weapons here? The assailants that targeted Kazuya and his companions were numerous magical weapons equipped with wings attached to their backs, improved and capable of flight. These magical weapons launched a coordinated ambush, firing magical projectiles from the forest where they had been lurking as soon as Kazuya's presidential hawk, their prey, came into view. They disregarded the escort aircraft and even the other identical presidential hawk, with Rena, Lena, and El on board, focusing their relentless assault solely on the presidential hawk carrying Kazuya. Army 1 to HQ. We've been ambushed by the enemy. HQ. Respond. No response. Damn it. Not now. The pilots of Army 1 and other aircraft were eager to contact HQ. But due to radio interference, they couldn't establish a connection. Abandoning the request for reinforcements, the AH 64D and Mi 24 35 MK3 Super Heinz, acting as escorts, unleashed machine gun fire and anti-aircraft missiles against the magical weapons emerging from the ground to defend President Hawk, who was under concentrated attack. While they managed to destroy several magical weapons, it was insufficient to halt the enemy's momentum. In the midst of this, President Hawk, despite evading the initial attacks with Kazuya's quick thinking, was eventually hit. A magical energy blast struck the tail rotor of the aircraft causing it to disintegrate. Army 1 has been hit. No way. Damn it. The President is on that aircraft. Following President Hawk's aircraft being hit, cries akin to the screams of the escort pilots echoed. Damn it all. Mayday, mayday, mayday. 
This is Army 1. Hit on the tail rotor by enemy ambush. Going down. Repeat. Army 1 hit. Going down. Amidst the black smoke billowing from the damaged tail rotor, President Hawke's aircraft spun uncontrollably towards the ground. While the pilots struggled to stabilize it, their efforts accompanied by the blaring alarms signaling the aircraft's malfunction, brace for impact. Amidst the intense lateral G-forces assaulting the cabin, Kazuya, gripping onto a handrail, shouted to Fine and others, observing the rapidly approaching ground. All right, if we keep going like this, we'll crash into the forest. As Kazuya calmly assessed the descent point while clinging to the handrail, the aircraft suddenly veered off course as if pushed by an unseen force, heading towards a gaping crevice in the ground, a dark abyss that seemed to lead to the depths of hell. Why is this happening? As Kazuya wondered about the sudden change in the aircraft's trajectory, it seemed as if the aircraft was being manipulated, plummeting towards the chasm, ultimately being swallowed into its depths. Damn it, not here repeatedly colliding with the sheer cliffs of the narrow, deep ravine, the aircraft tumbled uncontrollably, while Kazuya, observing the imminent impact with the ravine floor, lost consciousness. Army 1 down, it's gone down, as the magical weapons, now targeting the escort aircraft after downing Army 1, continued their assault. The pilot of Army 0 shouted while evading their attacks, No, it can't be. Damn it, no no way. The voices of fury and despair from the pilots resonated through the radio as they witnessed the aircraft carrying someone they should protect at all costs being brought down before their eyes. Damn it! All aircraft from Army Zero, immediately evacuate the current airspace. The pilot of Army Zero, holding the highest rank among those present, issued instructions to the surviving helicopter pilots with a grim expression, indicating a bitter decision. Are you going to abandon the president? Don't be ridiculous. Are you telling us to abandon His Excellency and flee? In response to the pilot of Army Zero's instructions, voices of dissent erupted from the other pilots. Silence. The pilots fell silent at the captain's rebuke. Think about the situation. Staying here accomplishes nothing. We'll just be overwhelmed by the enemy's numbers and brought down. Our only option is to evacuate and call for reinforcements at Dale's base as soon as possible. Understood? As indicated by the captain, since targeting Army 1, the magical weapons had switched their focus to the escort aircraft, resulting in the loss of one AH-64D and two Mi-24-35 Mk-3. Furthermore, as the pilots conversed, they could do nothing but desperately evade the relentless attacks from the magical weapons, akin to swatting flies. If that's the case, at least let us parachute down before evacuating. Suddenly, a member of the Guard Regiment aboard the Mi-24-35 Mk-3 interrupted on the radio, it's no use. Why not? I told you to think about the situation. The altitude is too low for you to parachute down directly. Are you kidding me? you fools. Hover the aircraft at low altitude to drop you off, the aircraft will undoubtedly be shot down. Our only option now is to return to Dale's base as soon as possible to call for reinforcements. Understand? Damn it. Understood. Understood in response to the captain's inquiry, the pilots complied, albeit harboring various emotions. All right, all aircraft, evacuate immediately, as the captain declared this intending to shake off the pursuit of the magical weapons and head towards Dale's base, a sudden sound of the aircraft's door opening from behind caught their attention. Startled, the captain turned around, only to witness Rena, Lena, and Dell, who had been aboard, leaping out from the aircraft, directly from President Hawke's aircraft. What the damn it, is it true? Someone jumped from Army Zero. What did you say? This is Army Zero. The President's maids who were on board have jumped out. What? What do we do? There's nothing we can do. Recovery is impossible now. Before the captain could stop them, Rena, Lena, and Del had already flown out into the sky, with El unable to fly on her own, supported by Rena and Lena, descending towards the ground. Damn it! Despite the sense of powerlessness and frustration at the fact that they could only flee, the captain, along with the other pilots, continued flying desperately towards Dale's base to call for reinforcements. Volume 03 Chapter 13 In one of the rooms at the command headquarters in the Dale's base, Chitters and Amira were exchanging words regarding the future cooperation between Parabim and the Yokai allied nations. <laughs> What's this inexplicable sense of unease? Is something the matter? 
Amira noticed Chitazi's sudden shift and gaze out the window amidst their discussion and asked her, No, it's nothing, let's continue our discussion. So, as for your request, you desire further reinforcement of our forces within the Yokai Allied Nations, am I correct? Chitas felt an intense discomfort grip her chest out of nowhere, without any warning. Though she sensed something indescribable with those words, Chitas redirected the conversation. Yes, that's correct. Chitas should be aware of the current state of the Yokai Army. Yes, thanks to Chitas and the others, the Yokai Army, which was nearly decimated, has been reorganized. However, the majority of it consists of new recruits with low training and morale, barely fit to fend off remnants of the Imperial Army. If we were to face another offensive from the Imperial Army in this state, we would undoubtedly face annihilation. Hence, we request an increase in the stationed forces as a deterrent against the Imperial Army. It is possible to reinforce the military presence at the Dales base, but, really? Amira breathed a sigh of relief at Chittas's response. Yes, it's possible to increase the infantry by 10,000, combat vehicles by 1,000, and aircraft by around 500, though it would require base expansion. However, Chittas paused with a meaningful separation of her words. But it's not in our best interest. Amira and her attendants fell silent at Chittas's words, filling the room with a heavy silence. Our Lord is generous and compassionate, hence, after eliminating the Imperial Army, we have provided aid for the reconstruction of allied nations like yours and distributed food to refugees free of charge. However, as much as we are allies, we cannot afford to provide further assistance free of charge. Some damn countries have the audacity to demand even more assistance without offering anything in return. With flames of hatred towards a certain nation burning within her, Chitters contemplated such matters inwardly. Of course, we are willing to provide compensation, but we don't have anything that Chitters and the others would desire. The lands and mines proposed as compensation previously, and additional combustible water. Was it oil fields? You wouldn't need oil fields, correct? Amira scratched her head in frustration as she spoke. That's right, the lands are too far from our homeland, and we've already purchased mines in the Kingdom of Canaria. As for the oil fields, the ones already transferred are sufficient. <clears throat> Other forms of compensation 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 women? Yes, women. Cause you yeah would like women, I don't need that. Crossing her arms, Chitters cut off Amira's proposal, born from a troubled mind, before she could finish. You could have at least heard me out to the end. HMPH Bringing unknown women near our lord. No, that's absolutely out of the question. Besides, offering women as compensation for military reinforcement wouldn't be balanced. That's true. Now, what should we do? <laughs> it seems it's crucial to advance that plan sooner rather than later. While Chitters fumed, Amira secretly believed that the early realization of their plan was necessary. Thus, as Amira and her associates racked their brains over the compensation for the reinforcement of stationed forces, something unexpected occurred. X excuse me, Colonel Bangus of the Parabem Guard burst into the room where the meeting was taking place, his face pale with urgency. What's the matter? Calm down and report. Chitters noticed Bangus's unusual agitation and instructed him to calm down. Why yes, approximately 30 minutes ago, President Kajino's helicopter came under attack by a flying type magical weapon equipped with something akin to wings, and it was shot down. This report came from Army Zero. Huh? What's this? As Chitters listened dumbfoundedly to Colonel Bangus's report, her attention was drawn to the part where he mentioned, President's helicopter and escort aircraft, totaling four aircraft, crashed in the Karun Hills. Karun Hills? That's bad. That's where the monsters nest, isn't it? But more importantly, is Kazuya safe? We've lost contact with HQ, and the escort unit, overwhelmed, withdrew from the area. The fate of the President is unknown. Additionally, the pilots of the aircraft carrying the president and two others, Fine Rose and Gru and the president's maid, Shell and Culot, cannot be confirmed. As for the pilot of the downed escort aircraft, it's presumed he perished, as there's no confirmation of ejection from the aircraft. Fine fine too? How could this? This can't be happening. It was thought to be safer for Kazuya to be on that side, but it backfired. Please, fine, please. Kazuya, hearing that her daughter was on the helicopter that crashed, Amira collapsed weakly into her seat, 
praying earnestly for the survival of the two people she couldn't do without. Furthermore, when Army Zero and the escort unit withdrew from the area, three of the president's maids, Layla, Lena, and Del, jumped out of the helicopter without authorization to rescue the president. Their whereabouts are currently unknown. As Colonel Bangus finished his report, the room fell into despair, with no one speaking, as if the sound had disappeared from the world. Army Zero was the other president's hawk unscathed. Chitters was the first to break the silence. A. Eh? Why yes, the president's hawk is undamaged. As Chitters approached, swaying gently from side to side with her head bowed, Colonel Bangus responded, tilting his head in confusion. Why is that? Huh? W.Y., you say gah? Why was the aircraft with our lord on board detected by the enemy? Not understanding the meaning behind Chitters's question, Colonel Bangers attempted to ask again, but Chitters grabbed him by the collar and lifted him into the air. Gwah, what's happening? Vice President Chitters, please stop. Chitters's sudden action of hoisting Colonel Bangers up caused panic among the Parabim soldiers nearby, who rushed to restrain Chitters. Cough, cough. I thought I thought I was going to die. Colonel Bangers, freed from Chitters's grip, stumbled to the ground, tears welling in his eyes as he coughed. Release me, this is the same model machine, isn't it? Army 1 and Army 0 are identical in both interior and exterior. The fact that Army 0 escaped unharmed means the enemy had confirmation that your master was on Army 1. Why is there a leak of information to the enemy? W. Well certainly I understand. I understand, Vice President Chitters, please calm down. Right now, rescuing the President is our top priority. Upon hearing that Army Zero was safe, Chitters realized that crucial information, such as Kazuya's whereabouts and the identification of the aircraft he was on, had been compromised, filling him with rage. That's it, mobilize all available units from Dale's base immediately. Head straight for the President's rescue. Understood. N no. Vice President. Gulp. What is it? Colonel Bangers interrupted Chitters as he tried to mobilize for Kazuya's rescue. Huff. Th the area where the President's helicopter crashed is currently in the midst of a severe storm, and due to poor visibility, aircraft cannot approach until the storm clears. Despite trembling under Chitters's sharp gaze, Colonel Bangers managed to finish his explanation. Are you aware of this? W well, yes but even if we launch now, we won't be able to reach the crash site due to poor visibility. We might just end up losing forces in vain. I don't care, whether we lose forces, it's raining, or even if spears are falling, we must rescue the president at all costs. Prepare for immediate deployment. You understood. Ignoring Colonel Bangers's attempts to persuade him, disregarding the possibility that Kazuya might already be dead, Chitters stubbornly insisted on launching the rescue operation. I'm going to. Upon hearing Chitters's decision, Amira, who had remained silent until now, spoke up. Fine do as you please, and thus, the rescue operation for Kazuya and his companions, involving all the forces at Dale's base and, consequently, the entire problem, was about to commence. W was that enough? Lying on a rough, rocky surface, Kazuya was awakened by the rain hitting his cheeks. What's going on? Initially blurred as if shrouded in mist, Kazuya's vision gradually cleared as his consciousness sharpened. Ha 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 ha, seriously damn it, trial of the gods, second, survive and return from the valley where demons dwell. Summoning abilities are unusable until the trial concludes. As things came into focus, Kazuya read the text on the window screen that had appeared before him. Understanding why the helicopter suddenly changed course midair. Damn gods, always messing with us, and thus, he realized being dropped into the valley by divine intervention. Furthermore, his summoning abilities being sealed. Kazuya cursed under his breath. Ah uh, well, for now pant pant I can move my legs are grit. Damn it, my left arm's broken and Syrup's got a few and my side pierced by something damn it. It hurts closing the window screen, cause you examined his body, sheltering his broken left arm and the ribs while a long, slender metal piece, likely from President Hawke's aircraft, stuck out from his right side. How long was I out? No. More importantly what about everyone else? Grimacing through the pain, cause you surveyed his surroundings, huh? Damn it. Spotting the battered President Hawke lying about 20 meters away from where he had been. Kazuya, unsteady on his feet, approached the helicopter. Chilkulots.
As Kazuyu Yu approached the helicopter while enduring the pain emanating from his body, he found Shlen Kulot lying on the ground, who had probably been thrown out of the plane just like him. Gosu Jin Sama, I'm fine and fine by the way. Shale answered Kazuya's call in a hoarse, hoarse voice, it's okay it's not. Is it okay for both of you? Kazuya was about to ask, but Shale was bleeding a huge amount of blood from her entire body, especially her lower body, the snake's body, and Kulot was lying there with her head turned in the wrong direction, like a puppet with its strings cut. I couldn't form any words until the end. This, Kino. It hurts so much. It doesn't. It hurts but, Kyurot. Ah. Uh, already? Don't say it I know. Biting his lower lip with a sad expression on his face, Kazuya first went to Kulot's side and gently closed Kulot's wide open eyes with his hand. He gently patted his head and said goodbye, as if he was reluctant to leave. I went to Shale's side, which was about two meters away from Kulot, and put my hand over Shale's body. Wait, I'll heal your wounds now. Shale's face turned pale as she shed a large amount of blood. Kazuya decides that the only way to help Shale is to use his full healing ability, so he tries to heal Shale's wound with his perfect healing ability, which he can't use as expected, perhaps because of the wound. Oh wait, please Master Samaiites Finazo, fine. Kazuya was about to use his full healing ability, but he stopped him and pointed towards President Hawk where Shale was lying. Ah that's a lie shit. When Kazuya looked in the direction Shale was pointing, he couldn't help but say those words and lowered his head. What should I do? Damn it! Exclamation mark. I couldn't see it until recently because it was in the shadow of a rock, but Fine was pinned under the body of the President Hawk, which was lying on its side. Fine, whose legs were completely crushed from the thighs down, was sinking in a sea of blood flowing from both of her crushed legs. When Kazuya saw that, he realized that he had to give up either Shale or Fine's life. After closing his eyes and thinking about it for a few moments, Kazuya made a difficult decision. Shaley guess it's because I can't use my full healing ability right now and doing my best to save one person. So he can't save you. That's righty I don't care I don't it please prioritize fine. I'm sorry. With a heartbroken face, Kazuya apologized to Shlu for letting him die. I don't care me lord people are, ha. From the beginning, my life was saved and given to me by me master, and now I'm going to waste it here. I don't care if I'm deaf or not. I see thank you for everything, just by giving me those words, I can. She'll seem to be moved by Kazuya's words, tears dripping from her eyes, and with a happy smile on her face, she took her last breath. Damn. That's it. Dot. Kazuya is kneeling down in front of Shale, who is sleeping peacefully clenching his fists and gritting his teeth as the rain hits Kazuya's cheeks, mixing with the rainwater dripping down one after another. An uninterrupted stream of water flows down his cheeks. There were, dash 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 dash. After letting out a speechless roar, Kazuya rubbed his eyes and left Shale's side, rushing towards Fine so that Shale's death would not be in vain. It's so warm. I feel like I'll melt. Fine regained consciousness and realized that she was surrounded by a warm, warm feeling, as if she were a fetus inside her mother's womb. Ah! Did you notice? When Fine opened her eyes, she saw Kazuya's face in front of her. When Fine opened her eyes, she saw Kazuya's face in front of her. Kazuya? I ugh. The moment Finn tried to get up from Kazuya's lap, her body swayed and her eyes went pitch black. Don't move yet, you're losing too much blood. What? What on earth does that mean? Fine looked down while questioning the meaning of Kazuya's words, and noticed something. Why? I. Fine used to wear clothes that were long and bold with a wide open chest, but now the length of the Chinese dress was abnormally short, as if it had been torn off just below the crotch. It was gone. White underwear was visible and hidden. Why are there so many clothes missing? While her thoughts weren't working properly, Fine wondered why she was lying there like that. Fine who was slowly looking around, noticed something, there were two lines of red blood that ran from the place where the helicopter crashed to the shadow of the rock where I was now, formed by piled up large rocks, ka, kazuya, what, oh, what's that blood stain, it's better not to know, kazuya answered with a gloomy face in response to fine's question in a weak voice, okay I'm just saying this, but since I have a vague understanding of it, please, 
This is the blood stain that was left when I cut off Ros Angle's leg and dragged him here to save him from being trapped under the helicopter. That's also why the length of his clothes is so short. Who I guess so but the fact that I have legs now means that cause you yield me are. That's right, yeah? Miss her are you okay? I wait. Cause you yeah, who was answering Fine's questions, noticed the figure of the pilot, Captain Brunif Miss her, who had crawled out of the cockpit window of the President Hawk, leaving Fine where he was and went to pick up Miss her. I'm gone eat sits it's cold a warmth you need it cause you ya yeah, isn't there and me my feet to cause you ya yeah, have to thank cause you ya yeah, to cause you ya yeah, 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 yeah, my life savior an important person I love you people I'm you me only beloved person doing I'm why I'm here, Fen directly affected by the side effects of Kazuya's complete healing ability, had a dim, murky light of possessiveness flickering in her transparent A's. Whoa, are you okay, Miss her? Kazuya hastily caught Miss her, who seemed about to collapse upon seeing him, but the impact of the embrace echoed in his wounded side, causing Kazuya to grimace in pain. I'm relieved truly relieved that nothing happened to you, Kazuya-sama unaware of Kazuya's pained expression, Miss her clung to him shedding tears of relief. Pull yourself together, Miss her. Save the tears for later. Are you injured? What about Lieutenant Kotri? S. Sorry my right leg seems to be broken. Lieutenant Kotri didn't make it. I see let's administer first aid for now. No, I'm fine. My condition doesn't matter. What about you? Cause you yes armor. Me? I've got a broken left arm and ribs. Upon Miss Her's inquiry, Kazuya concealed his side injury, not wanting to worry her. What? I am so sorry. Upon hearing about Kazuya's broken arm and ribs, Miss Her, who had been leaning on him, hastily backed away. Forget it. Just be quiet and lend me your shoulder. You can't walk alone. Why yes, understood. However, Kazuya forcefully pulled Miss Her back and, somewhat delightedly, lent his shoulder to the blushing Miss Her as they walked together towards where Fen was. Nestled in the rocky shadows. Bonus scene. In the dimly lit room, preparing for the mission with weapons and gear, Chitters made a call to a certain location. It's me. You understand the current situation, right? R. Good. If you understand, then it's fine. Immediately prepare for the launch of ICBMs and SLBMs. Warheads are nuclear. Target is the entire Elsa's magic empire. Launch code 0995258. Await launch orders. Slamming the receiver back into place, Chitters spat out in anger, her expression resembling that of a demon. If anything were to happen to my master I'll burn everything to the ground. Volume 03 Chapter 14 Amidst the pouring rain, Kazuya supported Miss Her's shoulder as they slowly made their way together, leaning on each other for support. Easy does it just a bit more sigh. I am terribly sorry despite the fact that you, Kazuya-sama, are also injured. I'm causing you trouble. Ah, no need to worry about that. Now then, let's see what we can salvage from the helicopter. Supporting Miss Her, who was dragging her right foot with difficulty, cause Yuya guided her to a sheltered spot among the rocks and gently helped her sit down on the ground. He then turned on his heels immediately, intending to retrieve supplies from President Hawk. A. W. Wait, should I go? Ah. Startled by Kazuya's words, Miss Hu attempted to rise, but the intense pain shooting through her right leg prevented her from standing, causing her to slump back down. Miss Hu just stay put quietly, understood? Yes I'm sorry. With Kazuya's voice carrying both reassurance and authority, Miss Hu's shoulders drooped, and she resettled herself on the hard ground. Well then, I'll be off. Wait Kazuya I'm cold hurry, come over here. Interrupting Kazuya's departure, Fine called out to him. R, right. I got it. I'll be back soon, so please bear with it for a bit longer. Fine. Her expression distant and pleading, extended her hand towards them, as if appealing for something, while shivering in the rain. Thinking that Fine must be shivering due to being soaked in the rain, Kazuya hastened his steps towards President Hawk to retrieve supplies despite his aching body, and left the shelter to return to Fine. He left again hurry hurry, Kazuya yo, it wasn't the rain that made Fine shiver with cold, she simply longed for Kazuya's warmth, watching Kazuya's retreating figure, she felt a deep sense of despair, out damn it, navigating through the intensified downpour, Kazuya finally reached President Hawk, which lay on its side, 
he clambered up to it and entered the cabin through the side door, which had been blown open and sent flying somewhere. I believe there should be emergency survival kits or something under the seats are, ah, there we go. Despite the cabin being severely damaged by the impact of the crash, Kazuya systematically retrieved the survival kits stored under each seat. Hmm. What's this? As Kazuya opened one of the seat coverings to extract the survival kit, he found a small bottle filled with green liquid hidden beneath it, as if intentionally concealed. Who put this here? No. What is this? Shaking the bottle, he examined the green liquid inside with curiosity and confusion only for his questions to be answered by a small piece of paper attached to the bottle. Huh? What's this? Let's see this is a magical potion, exclusive for Kazuya-sama, that works wonders for any injury. Please use it in case of emergency. From your faithful female slave, Serizia user instructions, this magical potion is exclusive for Kazuya-sama, its effects will not work if used by anyone else. How did she manage to sneak this in here? Well, regardless. It's helpful. Despite pondering over the magical potion that had mysteriously found its way into the cabin, courtesy of Serizia's hands, Kazuya decided it was convenient and opted to use it. Phew here goes Gar. Ouch. Damn it, that hurts. After confirming the instructions, Kazuya tightly gripped a long, thin piece of metal embedded in his side and swiftly pulled it out with both hands in one go. With a squelching sound. He discarded the extracted piece of metal, then poured half of the magical potion directly onto the wound. Uck huff huff gulp gulp pant jeez, that's bitter I need to run, and then, he gulped down the remaining potion, grimacing at its overwhelming bitterness. Ah, damn, that hurt, after roughly treating his wound, Kazuya took a moment to catch his breath before examining it again. Works like a charm as long as I don't move too vigorously, I should be fine. The effects of the magical potion seemed to manifest quickly, although the wound on his side hadn't completely closed, it had already begun to heal. All right, I need to hurry back. Having finished the makeshift first aid, Kazuya gathered weapons and other useful items from the survival kits before hurrying back to the rock shelter where Fine and the Miss Ho were waiting. The storm worsened with incessant thunder and torrents of rain pounding down, accompanied by fierce winds, Kazuya and his companions huddled together under the rocky overhang, seeking warmth around a small fire. As they dried their soaked clothes by the fire, Kazuya, Mei I, and Fin waited patiently under the silvery insulation sheet from the survival kit Kazuya had retrieved from President Hawk. This storm the enemy won't likely come anytime soon but we need to move on soon. There are also those monsters to consider, Kazuya said, contemplating their next move. Lost in thought, Kazuya glanced down to find Fin, her face peaceful as she slept soundly on his lap, murmuring softly in her dreams. She looked so defenseless, almost like a kitten it was a stark contrast to the fiend he once knew, now completely vulnerable as she slept, entrusting her body to Kazuya. Running his fingers through fiend's silky, red hair, Kazuya couldn't help but wonder if her sudden change in demeanor was indeed a side effect of her complete healing ability. She even insisted on being called Fien instead of Rose and Cruel as Kazuya pondered whether to impose restrictions on Fien's use of her healing powers. He was interrupted. Kazuya Sama, what should we do next? Miss her, pressing close to him under the insulation sheet, rested her head on his shoulder, her expression somber. For now, we wait for the rain to stop, then we move. We'll find a safe place and wait for rescue. Luckily, we've secured water, food, and plenty of weapons, so we should be somewhat prepared even if the Imperial Army or monsters show up. Kazuya replied, casting a glance at the weapons he had gathered from President Hawk's arsenal, a single military sword, Fiend's katana, a long sword with a single edge, five survival knives, two combat knives, and an M320 grenade launcher with a total of 21 rounds, high explosive, multi-purpose, airburst, shotgun, illumination, tear gas, and smoke for deploying smoke screens, two MP7s with four spare magazines, two 5.7s with four spare magazines each, and one Browning High Power with three spare magazines. It's not much compared to what President Hawk had stocked or what we originally possessed, but it's better than nothing, Kazuya thought, breathing a sigh of relief at the collection of weapons they had managed to retrieve. Will our allies arrive before the enemies? Miss asked with a hint of worry. 
We can only hope our allies arrive first you should get some rest soon too, Miska, Kazuya said, no, I'll stay awake for you, Kazuya-sama, Miska replied, leaning against him. Just go to sleep already, Kazuya insisted. Fine understood, Miska relented reluctantly, following Kazuya's order. She settled her head on his shoulder and soon fell into a peaceful slumber, her rhythmic breathing filling the air. Damn I can't move Kazuya realized, trapped between Fiend and Miss Her after the latter had fallen asleep. He sat there, feeling helpless, as the realization dawned on him. The sky, though still overcast, spread out much more calmly compared to yesterday's storm. Her morning? Morning? The sound of dripping water woke Miss Her from her slumber. I am terribly sorry. Kazuya-sama? Huh? Kazuya-sama? To Miss Her's dismay. She had completely forgotten to take over the night watch from Kazuya and had slept soundly until morning. Her face turned pale at the realization that Kazuya, who had been beside her before she fell asleep, was now nowhere to be seen. This can't be happening. Fearful that Kazuya might have gone somewhere, Miss Her hastily discarded her heat retaining sheet and scrambled to her feet. Ouch! I forgot. But, forgetting about her broken right leg. Miss Her attempted to stand up but collapsed to the ground halfway due to the sharp pain that shot through her. The Kazuya Sama. However, Miss Her quickly got up, leaned against a rock for support, and began to hobble forward, dragging her right leg, determined to search for Kazuya. Did you call? Huh? Mocking Miss Her's desperate thoughts, Kazuya, covered in dust, appeared before her. Phew. I'm relieved I thought Kazuya Sama had gone somewhere. Where were you headed? just around without mentioning that he had single-handedly buried the three who perished in the crash, cause you you evaded the subject. Anyway Miss Her, put something on um it's disturbing to the eyes. Seeing cause you you're safe and sound, Miss Her heaved a sigh of relief and blushed as she covered her chest and private parts with her hands. Having forgotten that she had discarded her heat-retaining sheet and was now completely nude. However, in her haste to cover her ample bosom, her breasts, now restrained by her hands, seemed to shift suggestively. Feeling embarrassed by this, Miss Her blushed even more. Ugh what a commotion, Fen, awakened by Miss Her's scream, rubbed her eyes and got up. Oh and Fen, put something on too, huh? Whether due to still being half asleep or not, Fen, forgetting that she was wearing nothing, came before Kazuya with her pert, provocative breasts and bare private parts exposed. I wish I could just forget this ever happened. Realizing at Kazuya's reminder that she was indeed naked, Fen's face turned as red as a boiling kettle. She clenched her fists, trembled all over, then lunged at Kazuya. Ouch what if my injuries worsen? Strapped with as many weapons and equipment as he could carry for mobility, Kazuya, with cheeks as red as autumn leaves, protested to Fen, who was still red-faced. HMPH. I let you off easy just by showing you my naked body. Without even looking at Kazuya, Fen spoke in a strong tone to mask her embarrassment. So, I apologize for seeing that. HMPH. Ignoring Kazuya's apology, Fen remained turned away. Well, it seems her mood won't be improving anytime soon. She's back to her old self. As if yesterday's dependency never happened. Maybe the side effects of her complete healing ability have worn off? I can't figure it out. Kazuya-sama. Shall we? Sayer, yeah, let's get going. Having given up on improving Fen's mood at the moment, Kazuya started walking. I'll definitely come back. Walking beside Fen, who was carrying the unable to walk Miss Han on her back, Kazuya made a vow to the three buried beside the crashed President Hawk and left the scene. Volume 03 Chapter 15 Having left the crash site behind them, Kazuya and his companions walked while searching for a way to escape from the bottom of the valley they were currently in, hoping to find a way to the surface. It's too quiet. Fifteen minutes had passed since they started walking. Kazuya, navigating through the treacherous valley filled with muddy soil and rugged rocks, couldn't help but feel uneasy, keeping an eye out on their surroundings. Fine, are there really many monsters around here? Yes. That's what I've heard. Despite walking for some time, not a single monster had shown itself. It was precisely when Kazuya and the others started feeling uneasy about the absence of monsters that things took a turn. Fine, stop. I know, even without you telling me. Damn it. They're coming. 
as Kazuyu and his group advanced halfway into what seemed like a circular clearing in the valley, the atmosphere suddenly changed. Bugs, resembling grotesque pests such as roaches and centipedes, emerged from crevices resembling caves, clinging to rocks and walls in the clearing, waiting for Kazuyu and his companions to approach, ready to devour them. Moreover, from the muck emerged worms, with numerous sharp teeth lining their mouth parts, slowly inching closer towards Kazuyu and his group. Surrounded by a horde of monsters, Kazuyu and his companions found themselves in a dire predicament. There's a lot of creepy crawlies coming out. Ark Ah, Kazuya sama this is bad. As they laid eyes upon the repulsive monsters, Kazuyu and his companions each reacted differently. This is bad. There are too many. Realizing they had no way out, Kazuya positioned himself back to back with Fine, who was carrying Misson on her back, ensuring they covered each other's blind spots. Exclamation mark Fine. What's wrong? Keeping his gaze fixed on the monsters, Kazuya called out to Fine, who had fallen silent since earlier. What's the matter? Wait, Fine, don't tell me. Doubting the lack of response, Kazuya turned around only to find Fine, with a pale face, on the verge of collapsing. I'm not good with bugs. Fine muttered in a trembling voice. I see. Kazuya sama I am the same, as Fine expressed her disgust towards bugs. Miska, seizing the moment, spoke up as if to say there was no better time than now. I see. There's no other choice. Facing the two who were visibly frightened by the monsters for various reasons, Kazuya made up his mind. We can't go back to the crash site, so we'll have to push through. Fine, keep running ahead while I cover you. Miska, use the MP7 to take care of any stragglers. Got it. Understood. After receiving acknowledgement from both, Kazuya loaded high explosive rounds into the M320 grenade launcher and fired at the monsters blocking their path. With a loud bang, the high explosive round hit its target causing an explosion as Kazuya shouted, Go! At Kazuya's signal, the three of them started running. However, as if determined not to let their prey escape, the monsters swarmed towards them. Fine. No matter what happens, don't stop. I know. Following Kazuya's instructions, Fine focused solely on the path ahead and kept running. Don't you dare come near us. As Miss Ha fired her MP7 at the approaching monsters with urgency, carried on Fine's back. Take this. Just die already. What's going on? Are the monsters targeting the two of them? As Kazuya continued to provide covering fire while following behind the two, he loaded his M320 grenade launcher with single shot high performance explosive rounds, multi purpose grenades, airburst grenades, and buckshot, relentlessly targeting only the two creatures that were persistently aiming for them while running. Thus, Kazuya and the others continued running towards the exit, eliminating the assaulting monsters. Hey, hey just a bit more. Just a bit more. With Kazuya providing cover, Fine attempted to break through the encirclement of monsters and reached the exit. But just as she was about to, a particularly large creature resembling an armadillo suddenly jumped out in front of her. Huh? Ah. Faced with the eerie creature brandishing its sharp teeth menacingly, Fine involuntarily froze in fear causing her to halt her steps. Meanwhile, Miska, carried on Fine's back, was delayed in her response as she reached into her pocket for a spare magazine for the 5-7. Having exhausted the ammunition in her MP7, exclamation mark as the armadillo-like creature, intent on preying on the immobilized bear, extended its massive scythe like appendages menacingly to both sides. I told you not to stop, Zash. However, Kazuya, who had been firing illumination, tear gas, and smoke rounds from his M320 grenade launcher at the monsters approaching from behind as a form of harassment, sensed the danger facing the two. Putting away his M320 grenade launcher, he drew his military blade and approached the creatures from behind the immobilized bear. Kazuya used a rock as a foothold, leaping up and taking advantage of the momentum of his fall to aim at the gaps in the creatures' tough exoskeletons, thrusting his blade. Kishua? Now's the chance, go. As Kazuya, riding atop the thrashing creature, relied on the sword he had plunged into it, he shouted with a desperate expression. Sorry. Prompted by Kazuya, Fine regained her composure and swiftly bypassed the thrashing creature, making her way towards the exit. We made it through, Kazuya. Roger that. Upon hearing Fine's voice, Kazuya let off the thrashing creature's body, rushed towards the two, 
and loaded high-performance explosive rounds he had reserved into the M320 grenade launcher. He then fired at the rocky wall forming the exit of the square. The explosion caused the rocky wall to collapse, crushing the monsters attempting to cling to them and simultaneously completely blocking the exit of the square. With this, we should buy some time. Let's hurry on ahead. Yes, let's do that. Having escaped the crisis and successfully stalled the monsters, Kazuya and the others wasted no time and resumed their movement, spurred on by their tired bodies. Few let's take a short break. Yes, that sounds good. After escaping from the square that had become a nest of monsters, Kazuya and his group were repeatedly attacked by monsters. Becoming aware of his own dwindling strength along with a depletion of weapons, Kazuya suggested this to Fien. I'm sorry, you've been carrying me for so long, miss her who had been carried on Fien's back, expressed her apologies to Fien. Don't worry about it. You're light anyway. Fien replied with a smile to miss her's apology, showing no signs of tiredness, perhaps due to her race. As expected of an ogre, they're a race known for their stamina and strength, so it's no wonder Fien doesn't seem too tired. With Fien, who was robust, in his peripheral vision, Kazuya quietly placed his hand on his own side. Damn. It's opened again. A wet sensation transferred to Kazuya's hand as he touched his side. Thanks to Serisha's magical medicine, the wound that had been closed reopened due to the series of actions taken to rescue Fien and miss her from the monsters. This isn't good. Watching the blood slowly seeping into his clothes, Kazuya thought so. With weapons dwindling we only have one straight sword and one survival knife belonging to Fien, along with two combat knives. In terms of firearms, Miss Her has three bullets for her 5-7, and I only have ten bullets for my browning high power. Hopefully, Chitters finds us soon. While lamenting the shortage of weapons and the gradually increasing pain from his side wound, Kazuya was troubled alone. Huh? Something's coming. Ignoring Kazuya's concerns, Fien, who had been sitting next to Miss Her, suddenly stood up and exclaimed, What? What's happening? Startled by Fien's words, Kazuya also stood up hastily and followed Fien's gaze. What? Kazuya, help. Help has arrived. Fien shouted with joy, and following her gaze, Kazuya saw several elves with bows emerging from the fork in the valley. Really? Thank goodness upon hearing Fien's words about help arriving, Miss Her also breathed a sigh of relief. However, unlike the joyful expressions of Fien and Miss Her, Kazuya's expression clouded. Strange. Even if it were Chitters and the others coming, how could they easily find us in an area they rarely venture into? Especially since it's only been about half a day since we crashed. What's wrong, Kazuya? Why the long face when help has arrived, Fien? who was waving enthusiastically towards the elves, turned back to Kazuya, who was silently contemplating, it's as if they knew our whereabouts shit, swoosh, 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 realizing the figures of elves aiming arrows at Fien, who had turned her back, Kazuya interrupted his thoughts and rushed towards her, in an instant, several arrows were released in an arc trajectory towards Fien, we have to make it in time, square daughter, what are you doing? Kazuya. Fine was pushed away by Kazuya who suddenly ran towards her, causing her to fall on her butt and hit her butt against a rock. Fine, who was about to scream out a protest while rubbing her butt after being hit by Kazuya's violent behavior, gasped. Ark, I guess that's it, Chikusho. Two arrows were deeply pierced into Kazuya's left arm after he pushed Fine away, and Kazuya's blood was dripping from the tips of the arrows. Kazuya Sama. No way. I'm going to kill all these bastards, Miss Ho was furious that Kazuya was injured by the arrows shot by the elves, and with her face turning red from anger, she stood up using a rock for support and pulled the trigger of the 5-7 that she was holding and attacked the elves. Shoots three bullets, it's fucking painful. While Miss Ho was attacking the elf, Kazuya slipped into the shadow of a large rock and desperately endured the severe pain that shot through his left arm. Why? Why us? Kazuya Sama. Oh. That's it. Fine, who was confused after being attacked by an elf who was supposed to be her ally, and miss her, who had shot off all the remaining bullets from 5-7, gathered around Kazuya, who was enduring the pain of his left arm being pierced by an arrow and even broken. Dot why? Why are you attacking us? It seems like you've betrayed me, Ark. Miss her, please pull me out a little more gently. I am sorry, Kazuya-sama. Kazuya, who was being treated by miss her asked Fine who was repeating the same words over and over again like a broken recorder. R, R, that's the worst, 
take a look at find two, Kazuya, who had missed her pull out the stuck arrow and finished first aid, peeked out from the shadow of the rock and called out to fine. What? What? What's that? Why are the elves and the imperial army together? Fine staggered to her feet after being told by Kazuya, and when she looked in the direction of the elves, she couldn't believe it. An imperial army unit led by the elves had come out of a corner and were heading towards us all together. Ta. There were about two hundred formations, about half made up of magicians and musketeers. In addition, there were ten wingless land battle type magic weapons and hundreds of automatons. They are advancing, filling the bottom of a long, narrow valley. Are you saying that the elves and the empire have joined forces? I won't know unless I ask the enemy. Huh? It's stopped. Cause you yeah, who was listening to the enemy's movements while answering Finn who made a lamenting sound, said this. Nagato Kaze Yu Yu. I know you're there, come out. Wearing silver armor and carrying a simple long sword, a young man with androgynous features stepped forward from among the army that had stopped walking and shouted Kaze Yu Yu's name. I was called by an enemy. I was nominated by the enemy. I'll be there in a bit. Kaze Yu Yu said, a little shaken by being called by name by the enemy. No, Kaze Yu Yu Sama. Miss her grabs Kaze Yu Yu's arm and holds him back as he tries to leave. If you keep hiding like this, you'll just get attacked all at once. Look, as if to confirm Kazuya's words, if they don't come out within five minutes, we will launch a simultaneous attack, exclamation mark the man was shouting. But, I'm calling them out on purpose, they probably won't attack you the moment they appear. But, ah, Kazuya-sama please wait. Kazuya caught Miss her off guard, waved her off, and tried to get out of the rock shadow. Wait. I'll go to Fine then calls out to Kazuya and tells Kazuya of her intention to accompany him. Why? I'm the one being called, right? There's something I'd like to ask them. Then do you want to go with me? Ah. Miss her, please wait there quietly. Ah. If something happens, please use this to support me. Kazuya said as he handed the browning high power to Miss her. Oh, ah, Kazuya sama, please wait. Ignoring Miss her's call, Kazuya and Fine who panicked but firmly accepted the gun, advanced right in front of the enemy. Volume 03 Chapter 16 Greetings. The man, standing with his arms crossed in a defiant stance, awaited Kazuya's appearance. Upon seeing Kazuya, he smirked, a belligerent grin on his face, and spoke. Well, I've come out here as you wished, but who are you? Approaching about five meters closer to the man. Kazuya stood alert, ready to move at any moment, and replied cautiously. Well, no need to rush. I'll tell you my name. I am Adele Zaxxon, a hero who has come to this world to defeat the wicked demon king. With a proud expression, Adele declared to Kazuya, a hero who has come to this world. Ah, you're the one who beat up Amira, aren't you? I thought you had retreated to the Empire since you weren't anywhere in the Demon Federation, but you were here all along. But still, could it be? What? My mother is wicked? Don't be ridiculous. Beside Kazuya, fine, her shoulders trembling with anger, shouted, contemplating various thoughts provoked by Adele's words. Who are you? You're dressed so indecently. Huh? Mother? Does that mean? You're the Demon King's daughter? Though Fine had been beside Kazuya since his appearance, Adele finally noticed Fine's presence. He frowned at Fine's tattered appearance, with parts of her Chong Sam missing, revealing glimpses of her undergarments, emanating a somewhat lewd atmosphere, and then gestured to the figure behind her to confirm Fine's identity. Yes, that's right, Adele Sama. This woman is Fine Rosing Gruel, daughter of the Demon King. A. Fine, confronted by the familiar figure that emerged from behind Adele, forgot her anger at her mother's insult and was left speechless. Nelson, why? Are you there? The figure that appeared behind Adele was Nelson, whom Fine had admired for some time. Nelson, who boasted equally feminine features as Adele and was even more handsome due to his racial advantages, smiled enigmatically in response to Fine's inquiry. Acquainted? Ha! Huh. Things are getting complicated. Observing the atmosphere between Fine and Nelson, Kazuya sighed inwardly, realizing that the situation had become more complicated. Hey, Nelson. Why? Why did you betray us? With a desperate plea, Fine questioned Nelson again, hoping to deny the unbelievable truth. Oh, well, that's easy. It's because I, who embody beauty itself, would be a great loss to this world if I were to die. So, I switched from the Demon Federation, 
which is on the verge of destruction, to the Empire to avoid imminent demise. A. Unexpectedly, Nelson's betrayal reason, a narcissistic statement, froze the atmosphere. It just so happens that our appearances as elves are almost indistinguishable from humans except for our pointed ears. So, it wasn't much of a hindrance to switch sides. Unable to comprehend Nelson's betrayal reason, Fine stood frozen like a statue. Moreover, if I were to switch sides, it was said that I needed to demonstrate some achievements as proof of loyalty to the Empire, and Fine, you helped me with that, what do you mean, that bracelet of yours? You told me that it would be useful if I gave it to that man, Nagato, didn't you? I had a revelation then thinking that giving you that bracelet would be useful. Nelson gleefully informed Fine of the cruel truth. In fact, that bracelet is a magic spell that can locate the wearer. By giving it to you, who was supposed to be by Nagato's side, his whereabouts would be known. So, the ambush this time was a success, and we were able to come to you like this. Oh, by the way, that bracelet also has a special scent that attracts demons. What? This thing. Upon hearing Nelson's words, Fine immediately removed the bracelet, which she had cherished, and threw it on the ground. I, I, was I being used because of me, by someone like him. Realizing the truth, Fine bowed her head in frustration, clenching her hands tightly in despair, perhaps gripping her hands with such force, Fine's nails dug into her flesh causing blood to flow from her hands. Seeing this, Nelson murmured softly as if adding insult to injury. Oh, impressive strength. I suppose I wanted to weaken you with that earlier attack. Well, capturing you as a prisoner for some fun is out of the question now, isn't it? Whether Fine heard Nelson's murmurs as he saw her as an enemy. Her body trembled noticeably, and drops fell onto the ground shortly after. So that's how it is. I understand now, the reason for the ambush. The reason why demons were targeting Fine, and everything else, with a sense of self-awareness that he was doing something out of character, Kazuya gently embraced Fine, who was shedding tears, to comfort her, understanding the truth behind the mysterious events so far. Meanwhile, within Fine's heart, as she sobbed in Kazuya's arms, a change was occurring. Betrayed severely by the man she trusted and admired, her heart was deeply wounded and frozen. However, Kazuya's kindness and warmth seeped into her heart like sweet poison. Furthermore, due to the side effects of Kazuya's complete healing ability, namely Kazuya's magic residue remaining in Fine's body, her feelings resonated with Kazuya's, invading Fine's heart and so even deeper and broader, reaching a level of obsessive love that could be called madness. Ah, warmth. I. As long as Kazuya is by my side. From now on, Fine's heart and soul would be forever captivated by Kazuya. However, it would take some time for her to realize this fact herself. Anyway, that's terrible. Throwing away a gift from this beautiful me. Shut up, narcissist. We've had enough of your talk. Interrupting Nelson's words abruptly, Kazuya spoke. Narcissist? Hearing a word that didn't exist in this world, Nelson tilted his head in confusion. What I want to know are two things your goals, and Adele. Have you ever heard of Earth? Ignoring Nelson's question, Kazuya asked Adele. Kazuya asks Adele, ignoring Nelson's question. Our purpose? Don't go out of your way to ask things that are obvious. Our purpose is your life, right? Or was it Earth? I don't know, but I've heard of it. Reno Anato, I think Shuichi said he came from Earth too. Adele, who was secretly disgusted by Nelson's words, frowned and answered honestly. Perhaps to move the conversation forward, it turns out that at least three migrants belong to the Empire. But, my worst prediction turned out to be true. This guy isn't a Chiyunabi or something. He's a real hero. After Adele accidentally let her mouth slip, Kazuya was able to confirm that there were at least three travelers, Rinya, Adele, and Shoichi, attached to the Empire. But the Adele in front of her was not from Earth but something different. A bead of sweat dripped from his forehead as he realized that he was a genuine hero from another world. Well, it's time to talk, now let me fulfill my purpose, Adele said to Kazuya, looking a little irritated, perhaps because of the unexpectedly long introduction, my purpose? Ah, that's right. Why do you think I came all the way here? No, you guys came to kill me, right? You said so. Well, 
It seems that the elves there are aiming for my life because they want to be welcomed into the Empire. Kazuya was listening to Adele's words with the deepest thoughts in mind. It was at that time. Shock! Exclamation mark. A chill suddenly runs down Kazuya's back. What? Question mark. As Kazuya tried to ascertain the cause of the chills, what caught his eye was Adele. Her beautiful features distorted with hatred, glaring at her as if she were going to shoot her. Our purpose is to kill you, but my purpose is to kill you with my own hands and avenge Celestia. Dot 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 yeah, Celestia, Kazuya, who had heard the name of the person Adele mentioned, was confused for a moment. Leaving Kazuya confused, Adele pulls out the long sword, the holy sword from its sheath. With Adele drawing her sword, the atmosphere suddenly became more tense. So, fight me. Nagato Kazuya, Adele let out a loud voice that sounded like the roar of the wild beast while releasing a tremendous fighting spirit. Hey, wait a minute. Celestia T quickly answer me. Do you want to fight with me or not? Kazuya notices that Kazuya is there and calls out to Adele to stay still, but Adele, who is obsessed with revenge and his blood rushing to her head, does not listen to Kazuya's voice. So, let's talk noisy. If you don't want to fight me. I'll make it so you have to fight. Nelson. Bring those three people. I've got it. Adele, who harbors a desire for revenge like boiling oil in her heart and insists on killing Kazuya with her own hands, decides to use her hidden tricks to force Kazuya to feel that way and defeat the serious Kazuya. Listen to me, you bastard! Exclamation mark. Kazuya was half pissed at Adele, who proceeded with things unilaterally without listening to him. Listen, Celestia. That was when Kazuya tried to convey a certain fact to Adele, even though he had a blue streak on his forehead. Oh, question mark you're kidding. Why? Why are you here? Exclamation mark. Kazuya froze when he saw Nelson, who had disappeared into the army he was leading at Adele's request, reappear and drag the three people with him. Raina. Raina. L. Kazuya let out a cry of pain as he saw the three of them tied up with ropes and not moving at all. Looking at their appearance, it seems like they were your subordinates after all. Well, I don't think there are any adventurers wandering around here wearing maid outfits. It was the right decision to capture him after all. Adele let out a small voice. You guys. What did you do to the three of us? Kazuya shouted, expressing anger in a different direction than the anger he had towards Adele who wouldn't listen. What did you do? This is the one who did it. These guys suddenly attacked and killed half of my men. Nelson answered Kazuya, who raised an angry voice. Dot dot a. When Kazuya heard that his maid had dealt a huge blow to the enemy without his knowledge, he momentarily forgot his anger and turned into a shocked expression. And even though it was Adele Summer's life, I think it took a lot of effort to capture her alive, exclamation mark when I heard Nelson say this in a desperate manner, I looked again at the three people who were tied up with ropes and didn't move, it looked like they were just being put to sleep by magic or something, Adele spoke to Kazuya, who felt a little relieved when she saw the three of them, so what are we going to do with that, up until now, I haven't done anything because I thought I could use them in negotiations to fight with you. But if you refuse to fight me single-handedly, then these three will become your soldiers' toys, right? The words that Adele said to make Kazuya feel that way touched Kazuya's anger. Butchy butchy butchy! Exclamation mark. You want to use the three of them? My maid as a toy? I'll kill you! Exclamation mark. Everyone present heard the sound of a thick rope being torn. Fine. Go to miss her. Eh? Fine. Who had been crying until now? heard Kazuya's horrifying voice as if all her emotions had been drained away, and she couldn't help but look at Kazuya's face. Things have changed? I was going to buy some time, but I'll kill them and save the three of you. Oh, I, I understand. Fine was surprised to see Kazuya's demonic appearance, something she had never seen since they met, but she nodded deeply. This expression is nice too. If Fine had been before, she would have felt nothing but fear when she saw Kazuya's expression now, but Fine who was captivated by Kazuya to her heart and soul, and began to harbor an unusual feeling of mad love, looked at Kazuya's face. I naturally thought about these things while looking at it. Now, shall I kill you? As he was about to leave, Fine handed Kazuya a single-edged sword, and instead of using his left arm, which he could barely use, he held the sheath in his mouth and drew the sword. Looks like you're fired up Nelson, stay back. Ha! Huh? 
Seeing Kazuya readying his sword, Adele smiled and told Nelson to stand back. Let me avenge Celicia. I'll get you three back, you bastards. At the same time as the two shouted, a one-on-one -on -one fight broke out. Ha ha ha, what's wrong, huh? Seems like you're slowing down, huh? Damn it. Kazuya and Adele's one-on-one -on -one battle had been one-sided since the beginning. Damn it. I said that in anger but, this guy is still strong. Plus, I can't use my left arm, and the wound on my side is getting serious. This is beyond disadvantageous. Kazuya, struggling to move his shaky body due to injuries, desperately dodged Adele's relentless slashes. But as time passed, Kazuya's movements lost their vigor, and his body accumulated more wounds. This guy is unexpectedly tough. And, seeing that the effects of the Holy Sword aren't activating, he's not even using body enhancement magic. Is he a monster? On the other hand, Adele was surprised by Kazuya's unexpected tenacity in dodging his attacks, although he was holding back a bit to toy with him. I wanted to face him in perfect condition. Adele knew Kazuya couldn't use his left arm, but unaware of the severity of his injuries, Adele carved more wounds into Kazuya's body while pondering that, simultaneously enduring one-sided attacks and refusing to give up on retrieving the three people at all costs. The, whoa, arc, damn it, dodging a sharp blow, Kazuya finally distanced himself from Adele and kneeled, what's wrong, weren't you supposed to get the three back, ha, ha, damn it, at this rate, it's really, bad. Concealing his swirling inner emotions, Kazuya provoked Adele with a fierce grin resembling a carnivore. With Adele at ease, Kazuya, in a state of complete disarray, could only glare at him, lacking the energy to retort. At that moment, suddenly, gunshots rang out behind Kazuya, followed by frantic voices that had previously been cheering. Kakazuya Sama, Kazuya, it's bad, TCH, interference, as Adele said so and lowered his sword. Kazuya turned around, there, following Fine, who was running towards them while carrying Misson on her back. Numerous monsters were closing in. This is the worst. HMPH, seems like the game has gone too far. Well, whatever, I'm tired of toying with you anyway. Nelson, return the three of them. Ha, understood. Having tormented Kazuya enough, Adele, feeling something towards Kazuya's desperate attempts to protect others again, stopped himself from killing Kazuya and left the cleanup to the monsters. Furthermore, facing the approaching monsters, Adele, feeling a sense of dismay, ordered Nelson to release the three captives and sheathed his holy sword, then turned on his heel and strode back to his allies. Now then, let's watch. With his allies protecting him, Adele observed Kazuya and his group with a gaze mixed with uncertainty. Are you all right? Raina, Lena, L. Embracing the three who were carried floating by magic, Kazuya immediately called out their names after cutting the ropes that bound them. Ah, master. Ah, master. Master. Thank goodness. Without any serious injuries or rough marks, Kazuya tightly embraced the three who woke up immediately, ignoring the intense pain in his battered body. Kazuya-sama. Not now. Kazuya. The monsters are almost here. Despite the crisis of the Imperial Army at the front gate and the monsters at the back gate, Fine and Miska urged Kazuya who was casually embracing the three, they're here, but it's fine now, Kazuya-sama, what's wrong with Kazuya, as fine and miss her, puzzled by Kazuya's words, watched, an anomaly occurred among the monsters advancing from behind, huh, wah, the monsters, stopped, huh, why, why did they stop, even fine, miss her, Adele, and the soldiers of the Imperial Army, as well as the elves under Nelson, couldn't hide their confusion at the inexplicable behavior of the monsters. By the way, the inexplicable behavior of the monsters was simply due to their sensitivity to the gradually approaching presence, as creatures accustomed to the law of the jungle in the Cologne Hill region. And a few seconds later, as the meaning of Kazuya's words and the reason why the monsters suddenly stopped were not understood, a low, deep sound, resembling a hum, was faintly heard. As the low, deep sound intensified, the monsters began to retreat hesitantly, and finally, they fled like an avalanche. Huh? The monsters are running away. Everyone watched in astonishment as the monsters, who had been predators just moments ago, fled like frightened rabbits. Ha ha ha, the monsters ran away. Ah ha ha ha, what incredible luck. But this must be a sign from the gods to settle the score with you. Although it was unclear why the monsters fled, to Adele. 
it seemed like a sign from the gods to settle the score with Kazuya. No, it's impossible to kill me here anymore. While staring at Adele, who had come forward again, Kazuya spoke. What? Rather than that, you should worry about your own safety. Hey, are you trying to threaten me? There's nothing to be afraid of. Midway through Adele's words, a huge shadow, a C-17 Globe Master III, passed over the crevice above them, and what seemed like multiple objects fell, or rather, descended between Kazuya and Adele with a sound that shook the ground and caused the mud water accumulated at the bottom of the valley to splash vertically, debris fell from the point of impact. The tables have turned. We win, as Kazuya grinned proudly, at the same time, the mud water that had been floating in the air fell to the ground, and from where something had fallen, they, she, revealed themselves. Volume 03 Chapter 17, The Reason for the Monster's Trembling Fear and Flight the figures descending from the sky were Chitters and Amira, now transformed into demons. Every person present seemed to have their breath caught in their throat, enveloped in a heavy, oppressive silence so thick it felt as though time itself had halted. Chitters, clad in an aura as dark as the deepest abyss, adorned with various armaments and gripping a drawn Japanese sword in each hand. Amira, shrouded in battle attire carrying a massive sword that appeared to be nothing short of an iron slab to the casual observer, emitting a dense, ominous magical aura visible to the naked eye. As the two slowly rose from their landing stances, Kazuya's maids, Luminous and Wilhelm, as well as members of a squad-sized escort unit, descended in parachutes, following behind Chitters and Amira. Furthermore, upon closer inspection, members of the escort unit had also deployed at the mouth of the valley aiming firearms at Adele and his group. What? We're surrounded. What are the other units doing? Adele, unaware that their allies had already been decimated, was taken aback by their sudden encirclement. Damn. But more importantly. What? What is this? On par with the demon lord? No, even more so. This is bad. Really bad. Facing off against this woman. Absolutely disastrous. Adele was momentarily distracted by their predicament but soon realized the folly of focusing on it, swiftly discerning Chitters's formidable strength and realizing that she was not someone they should antagonize. What kind of murderous intent is this? Chitters and Amira, especially the ominous aura emanating from Chitters, caused Adele to feel an immediate urge to flee. However, such an option was out of the question. Drawing upon the pride of having fought as a hero thus far, Adele managed to stand firm against Chitters and Amira. Is Fien all right, Master? just a little. Just wait a moment, I will handle it soon. Adele, holding the holy sword with a pallid, strained expression, and Chitters and Amira, glaring at their enemies with fierce determination, observed the enemies frozen as if petrified behind them. Mother, I am unharmed, but Kazuya, Ark, understood. R, Adele, detain the trespasser in front of you alive, please. I beg you. Chitters, responding as soon as she landed in the valley. Kazuya, grimacing in pain as he received healing magic and first aid from Luminous and Wilhelm rushing to his side, issued his instructions. Ha, understood, I'll do it. Strictly ordered, no firing, until further notice. Repeat, no firing, until further notice. Witnessing Kazuya, bloodied and mud-stained, contorting his face in agony. Adele felt as if his heart were being torn apart and his anger flared even more. After giving orders to his subordinates, Chitters turned back and addressed Amira with a commanding tone. They are all my prey. Don't. Interfere. It's hopeless. Isn't it? I'd like to say I understand and won't interfere. But it's not that simple. I have my trash to deal with, and, I'm boiling with rage, too. Let me have some fun. Having received a brief explanation of the situation from Fiend during their earlier conversation, Amira, upon spotting Nelson, the traitor who had manipulated her daughter, and the elves under his command, surged with the same rage as Chitters, raising her massive sword. Do as you please, but don't take too long cleaning up the trash, got it, then let's go. Roger. Concluding their conversation with Amira, Chitters pointed the sharp gleam of her Japanese sword at the enemy. Meanwhile, while Chitters and the others were still talking, Nelson and his group, finally able to move thanks to the distraction of their gazes, trembled in fear. Why? Why is the Demon Lord here? And, who's that woman beside the Demon Lord? She's no ordinary person. To think we have to face such, 
Such monstrous beings. There's no way we can win, we have to run. We'll be killed if we don't, as Nelson, his elven subordinates, and the Imperial soldiers unconsciously began to retreat when faced with those from a different dimension. A voice surging Adele's attention echoed from the valley, and then, Hell's Gates opened. It's... It's here. Hi. S. Stop them. Stop them. Prepare to fire. Fire. With a thunderous sound crushing the ground beneath them, magic, bullets, and arrows were simultaneously launched towards Chitters and Amira, who were advancing at a terrifying speed. However, Chitters and Amira effortlessly dodged all the attacks pouring down upon them. They, they're not hitting, take better aim. Deploy magical weapons and automatons. Overwhelm them with strength and numbers. Magical weapons and automatons were deployed in an attempt to stop the advancing duo. But, you ugh, you pests, how annoying. Three magical weapons, shaped like lances, approached Amira with short swords ready for close combat but they were crushed under Amira's great sword with a single blow. As for the automatons that attacked Chitters from multiple directions, she swiftly beheaded all of them, rendering them useless. Ha! Ha! Automatons, focus on impeding their movements. Magical weapons, aim for where the enemy's mobility is hindered. Adele, who had been casting spells like the others moments ago, now shouted out instructions loudly. They keep coming, like a swarm of pests. How irritating! Yeah, tell me about it. As they crushed and slashed through the remaining automatons, Chitters and Amira exchanged smiles while also attacking the nearby magical weapons. TCH, they just keep coming. It's a bit tough even for me to handle five at once. What should we do? Upon seeing the magical weapons blocking their path after breaking through the swarm of automatons, Amira asked Chitters for advice. Don't stop. Keep moving forward, huh? Seems like you have a plan. All right, got it. Seeing Chitters focused solely on Adele with eyes burning with hatred, Amira thought there must be a plan and followed Chitters's lead, continuing to advance. Lieutenant, take them out. Understood. Just as they were about to enter the range of the short swords wielded by the magical weapons, Chitters spoke into the radio. Then, a series of distant explosions were heard, and soon after, large holes appeared in the five magical weapons. W what was that? Startled by the sudden turn of events, Amira turned her head towards the direction of the sound and saw Lieutenant Hay holding a Simon OPTRS-1941, smoke rising from its barrel. Targets silenced. To achieve such precision with consecutive shots in this strong wind. Impressive. Quiet. Be prepared for the next instructions. Understood. As you command. Ignoring the banter from Lieutenant Clements, who was giving him a respectful look, Lieutenant Hay, who successfully sniped from the opening in the valley, put away the empty Simon OPTRS-1941 and pulled out a new one loaded with bullets, readying himself for the next instructions. All that's left are the small fries and that one. That seems to be the case. Well then, I'll clean up the trash. Having broken through all the automatons and magical weapons, Chitters stopped running and walked slowly, deliberately, towards Adele, while Amira, separating from Chitters, headed towards Nelson. If that's the case, then there's no holding back. Walking step by step with determination, Adele, upon seeing Chitters approaching, muttered quietly, I have a favor to ask of everyone. Speaking softly so that only Chitters couldn't hear, Adele addressed her subordinates. What is it? To defeat him, I need to use my trump card, but to use it, I need to gather and store magic power. So, can you buy me some time? Understood. We'll protect you, Adele Sama. Don't let him get near Adele Sama. Affirmative. With unwavering faith in Adele's leadership, the soldiers, suppressing their own fears, united for victory, agreeing to buy time to achieve victory. Meanwhile, while Chitters and the others were still talking, Nelson and his group, finally able to move thanks to the distraction of their gazes, trembled in fear. Why? Why is the Demon Lord here? And, who's that woman beside the Demon Lord? She's no ordinary person. To think we have to face such, such monstrous beings. There's no way we can win, we have to run. We'll be killed if we don't, as Nelson his elven subordinates, and the imperial soldiers unconsciously began to retreat when faced with those from a different dimension. A voice surging Adele's attention echoed from the valley, and then, Hell's Gates opened. It's, 
It's here. Hi. S. Stop them. Stop them. Prepare to fire. Fire. With a thunderous sound crushing the ground beneath them, magic, bullets, and arrows were simultaneously launched towards Chitters and Amira, who were advancing at a terrifying speed. However, Chitters and Amira effortlessly dodged all the attacks pouring down upon them. They, they're not hitting, take better aim. Deploy magical weapons and automatons. Overwhelm them with strength and numbers. Magical weapons and automatons were deployed in an attempt to stop the advancing duo. But, you ugh, you pests, how annoying. Three magical weapons, shaped like lances, approached Amira with short swords ready for close combat but they were crushed under Amira's great sword with a single blow. As for the automatons that attacked Chitters from multiple directions, she swiftly beheaded all of them, rendering them useless. Ha! Ha! Automatons, focus on impeding their movements. Magical weapons, aim for where the enemy's mobility is hindered. Adele, who had been casting spells like the others moments ago, now shouted out instructions loudly. They keep coming, like a swarm of pests. How irritating! Yeah, tell me about it. As they crushed and slashed through the remaining automatons, Chitters and Amira exchanged smiles while also attacking the nearby magical weapons. TCH, they just keep coming. It's a bit tough even for me to handle five at once. What should we do? Upon seeing the magical weapons blocking their path after breaking through the swarm of automatons, Amira asked Chitters for advice. Don't stop. Keep moving forward. Huh? Seems like you have a plan. All right. Got it. Seeing Chitters focused solely on Adele with eyes burning with hatred, Amira thought there must be a plan and followed Chitters's lead, continuing to advance. Lieutenant, take them out. Understood. Just as they were about to enter the range of the short swords wielded by the magical weapons, Chitters spoke into the radio. Then, a series of distant explosions were heard, and soon after, large holes appeared in the five magical weapons. W what was that? Startled by the sudden turn of events, Amira turned her head towards the direction of the sound and saw Lieutenant Hay holding a Simon OPTRS-1941, smoke rising from its barrel. Targets silenced. To achieve such precision with consecutive shots in this strong wind. Impressive. Quiet. Be prepared for the next instructions. Understood. As you command. Ignoring the banter from Lieutenant Clements, who was giving him a respectful look. Lieutenant Hay, who successfully sniped from the opening in the valley, put away the empty Simon OPTRS-1941 and pulled out a new one loaded with bullets, readying himself for the next instructions. All that's left are the small fries and that one. That seems to be the case. Well then, I'll clean up the trash. Having broken through all the automatons and magical weapons, Chitters stopped running and walked slowly, deliberately, towards Adele. While Amira, separating from Chitters, headed towards Nelson. If that's the case, then there's no holding back. Walking step by step with determination, Adele, upon seeing Chitters approaching, muttered quietly. I have a favor to ask of everyone. Speaking softly so that only Chitters couldn't hear, Adele addressed her subordinates. What is it? To defeat him, I need to use my trump card. But to use it, I need to gather and store magic power. So... Can you buy me some time? Understood. We'll protect you, Adele Sama. Don't let him get near Adele Sama. Affirmative. With unwavering faith in Adele's leadership, the soldiers, suppressing their own fears, united for victory, agreeing to buy time to achieve victory. While Adele was gathering up the necessary magical power to use her trump card, the magicians surrounded her and created a magical barrier to protect her while the musketeers pulled out the long swords they wore on their waists. Heading towards Chitters. Dot. We are the opponent! Exclamation mark Chitters continues to advance towards Adele, looking coldly at the enemy soldiers who are coming toward her with an enthusiastic roar. I won't let you go to Adele's Sama. Take my blow. Die here. Screaming in unison, the soldiers brandished their long swords and slashed at Chitters. I killed it. Exclamation mark. The soldiers were convinced of victory just as the blade was about to dig into Chitters's body, who continued to walk naturally without raising the Japanese sword in his hand. Get out of the way. However, with just one word from Chitters, the soldiers become unable to move like frogs being glared at by a snake or my body. Question mark. It doesn't move. Question mark. 
Why is it so? Question mark. The soldiers were shocked to see that his body did not move even against his will, dead people. What do you think of the words Chitters said the moment they passed each other with the soldiers who were unable to move? Before I could think of that, the soldiers' bodies shifted sideways. Ah, I see, I see. We're already dead. The moment the soldiers finally realized what had happened to them, their bodies fell to the ground in two, spattered with blood. HMPH, small fry. Chitters swung her Japanese sword at a speed that the soldiers couldn't even perceive, and instantly built up a mountain of corpses. She continued to move forward as if nothing had happened, and just like before, she eliminated the attacking soldiers one after another. Go, say, in the way. Goa? Boom! Exclamation mark Chitters dodges the long sword that is swung down with great force and skewers the soldier from his chin to the top of his head with a dull Japanese sword. The impaled soldier opened his eyes, twitched, and fell to his knees. Chitters throws away the Japanese sword that was still stuck in the soldier she killed, and puts the other Japanese sword, which still has its sharpness, into the sheath she wears on her waist. Dot with her bare hands, Chitters attacks the soldiers who come towards her without hesitation. What? Ah, uh, oh, ooh, 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 ooh. I don't know why, but seeing Chitters put away her weapon and left with her bare hands, two soldiers. Perhaps thinking it was a good opportunity, head towards Chitters, now, load the bullet while Grunge and Bakura are fighting, and attack him at zero distance, learn, behind the two soldiers heading toward Chitters, gunners were preparing to fire, oh, yeah, uh, uh. in the way, Chitters easily dodged the attacks of the two who were slashing at her with a fierce spirit, then swung her longsword and instantly became close to the two who lost their balance. Then reached out her hand to their necks and gripped them firmly. Uh, ah, ah, ga. Their necks were tightened like a vice, and they dropped their long swords in agony. They tried to do something about Chitters's hand that was digging into their necks, but Chitters's hand did not loosen. Dot. Chitters looked at the enemy soldier, who was struggling to breathe, as if he were looking at an insect, as he held it up and put even more strength into his hand. Missimishimishi. Dot. Barky. Exclamation mark. Ha. Huh. Squeak. Finally, the two soldiers' necks were crushed by chitters and they let out a sound like a bird being strangled and died. Her limbs, which had been thrashing about a moment ago, drooped as if they had become weak, and yellow liquid began to flow down from her crotch. He, he, Grunge and Bagura were killed. Be it a monster. The soldiers winced in fear as they watched chitters pick up a large adult one by one with one hand and crush their necks ready to fire. Chitters had just finished preparing to fire when he threw down the two people he was hanging. All right, don't let Grunge and Bagura's deaths be in vain. You got Just as he was about to give the command to fire all at once after confirming that he was ready to fire, the commander's head burst open like a pomegranate and brain plasma splattered everywhere. T Captain? Since a while ago, I've said it over and over again. That it's a nuisance. Before I knew it, Chitters had pulled out two 10.5-inch Model S and WM500S, super-large rotary pistols, from their holsters. The 10.5-inch Model S and WM500 is called the Hunter model and uses a 50 caliber Magnum bullet called 500S and W Magnum. The power of this bullet is approximately three times that of a 44 Magnum bullet, and if an ordinary person fires it ten times in a row, the recoil from the shots may numb their hands and make it difficult for them to even write. The 10.5-inch Model S and WM500 is called the Hunter model and uses a 50 caliber Magnum bullet called 500S and W Magnum. The power of this bullet is approximately three times that of a 44 Magnum bullet, and if an ordinary person fires it ten times in a row, the recoil from the shots may numb their hands and make it difficult for them to even write. R. R. Uh, no way. Although Chitters did not know that the muscle of such a brutal gun was being pointed at them, the soldiers were thrown into a state of panic just by the fact that the muzzle was pointing at them. Fires a .50 caliber Magnum bullet. Ah, uh, my arm? I, I don't want to die, someone, help, goff, ha, huh, mum. Most of the soldiers blocking Chitters' path were blown away by a .50 caliber magnum bullet, leaving them writhing on the ground with their guts exposed. Well, 
It's no good anymore. Ah, God. The magicians who were surrounding Adele while deploying a magical barrier saw their friends dying in front of their eyes, and they realized that no matter how hard they tried, they would not be able to defeat Chitters, and they were filled with grief. Everyone, I've kept you waiting. Stay away. Saying that, Adele stepped forward, wrapped in wind swirling wildly like a muddy stream. Ah, Adele Sama. With this, our victory is decided. The soldiers screamed with joy as they succeeded in buying time and distanced themselves from Adele, who was facing Chitters. Dot. You've done as you please, however, your fate ends here, I am invincible, layered with magic that strengthens my body and wears wind armor that repels all kinds of attacks. What? Mika? Question mark. A Adele Sama? Adele was able to talk comfortably because she was wearing the wind armor, but the distance was closed in an instant and when she realized that she was unable to offer any resistance, Chitters cut her off with a Japanese sword that had been drawn out like a sword. Was, the wind, cut, the armor, and tore it apart? Question mark it is a such a fool? Question mark, and. It was, too fast, I couldn't see. The movement, exclamation mark. Dogen is blown away, exclamation mark Adele, who had fallen into the rock was surprised in the consciousness she was able to maintain thanks to the pain. Invincible. At your level, don't make me laugh. The wind armor, which Adele said would repel all attacks with just one blow, was cut to pieces by Chitters, and when Adele received damage, she lost consciousness and was unable to supply magical power, so the wind armor had disappeared. Damn dot this is so. Adele, who has lost her wind armor and is now almost completely defenseless, heads towards Chitters in order to turn the flow towards her. Ra Gun! Exclamation mark. Chitters lightly blocked the holy sword that was swung down with all the strength she had with her Japanese sword. Is it this much? This, you stupid power. But this, Adele, who brought it into a close fight, grinned. Let me tell you something good. This holy sword that I have has the ability to steal the magic power of the person it is slicing. What about it? HMPH, now is the time to be able to afford it like that. Thinking that Chitters was using body strengthening magic to display frightening physical abilities, Adele thought that if she used the holy sword's ability to take away Chitters's magical power, she would be able to win just like she defeated Amira, activated the ability. But... What, are you, you, not using magic? Adele, who was unable to take away the magical power from Chitters even after activating the Holy Sword's ability, finally realizes a certain fact, I can't believe that you're in your true state, no, there's no way that's possible, that's, at the moment when Adele was shaken and panicked by the shocking truth, Chitters slashed Adele away just like before, gaha, dot 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 that, that's what happened, Ga dot, how could? How could this happen? Adele, with her silver armor now rent asunder, was left with nothing but the thin undergarments beneath her armor. Is it over already? As Chitters approached Adele, discarding the Japanese sword that abdulled when it sliced through Adele's armor. Get up, Uck. Come on. Get up, Uck. Forced to stand by Chitters despite her loss of will to fight due to the overwhelming difference in power. Adele groaned as she was struck with all of Chitters's might. Ark ag ar ark. With each blow from Chitters's fist, Adele let out voiceless cries of pain. What's wrong? Aren't you invincible? Huh? Gah? After delivering a headbutt, Chitters grabbed Adele by the collar and threw her as if executing a back throw in wrestling. Gah. Dot. Ju. Dot. Damn it. With her undergarments torn, Adele, exposing her silk-like white skin and ample bosom to the open air, groaned in pain. So, you're a woman? Standing before the now half-naked Adele, Chitters, slightly surprised by this revelation, narrowed his eyes and spoke. G-H. Dot 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 it doesn't. Matter. I see, I see, a woman. Convenient. It broadens the scope of torture I can employ once we return to base. Upon learning Adele's gender, Chitters smirked like a demon and muttered to himself, Tua. I. I'm not. Defeated yet. Gah. Sensing something chilling in Chitters's smile, Adele attempted to muster her resolve and stand, but she was completely knocked unconscious when Chitters struck her cheek. A mere passing traveler, yet this is all you are meant to. Pitiful. Having accomplished his mission of capturing Adele alive, Chitters dismissed her strength with contempt, shelving his own inhuman prowess. They're finished over there too, it seems, 
Turning his gaze away from Adele, Chitters looked towards Amira, who was nearing the end of her own battle. I don't want to die, I don't want to die, I don't want to die. Surrounded by the corpses of his elven guards, Nelson trembled uncontrollably. Now, just one left. Amira, having crushed the last resilient elf, approached Nelson. P please. S save me. M my life, at least. I I. I don't deserve this. I've done nothing. Alrighty then. Ignoring Nelson's pleas for mercy, Amira swung her great sword down. Splat. A sound reminiscent of a squashed tomato echoed through the area. With that, all the treacherous elves met their end at Amira's hands. It's over here too. Yeah. Amira, drenched in returning blood, approached Chitters, dragging Adele by the ankle. Adele Sama has been taken down. No way. Run for it. Huh? Are we letting them go? Is that all right? Amira questioned Chitters as she watched the remaining Imperial soldiers, who had lost their fighting spirit after Adele, the magical weapons, and Automata, their last hope, were all defeated, fleeing without hesitation. We won't let them escape, devour them. Rudel. After succinctly responding to Amira's question, Chitters spoke into the radio. Roger. Soon after, amidst the sound of high-pitched engines, the A-10 Thunderbolt II, equipped with Su-23 gun pods modified with Gore-4, a gas-driven variant of the M61A-1 Vulcan cannon, appeared, slicing through the grey clouds covering the sky and targeting eleven hardpoints, the enemies defying His Excellency the President of Filth. Filth must be disinfected. Executing his favored attack method, a steep dive, while aiming precisely, Lieutenant Colonel Rudel pulled the trigger. 11 20mm Gatling guns and one 30mm Gatling gun simultaneously unleashed a storm of bullets, mercilessly mowing down the enemies like a tropical squall. Wow, relentless, aren't you? Startled by the ensuing explosion behind her, Amira turned around to find herself grinning. Because Rudel's attack, despite its brevity, had annihilated the soldiers attempting to flee, with countless bullets, both 20mm and 30mm, exploding them like firecrackers as they tried to escape through the narrow opening of the valley, only about 20 meters wide. Despite its brief duration, the attack turned all the fleeing soldiers into mincemeat, painting the valley floor crimson. Let's withdraw. Responding to Chitters's call, the unit began preparations for retreat after capturing Adele and eliminating the enemy. You guys, take care of recovering the bodies and destroying the crashed aircraft. Understood. With a portion of the soldiers dispatched to recover the bodies from the downed President Hawk, Chitters, along with Kazuya, was lifted by winch onto a cargo on the hovering MV-22 Osprey. As they were hoisted up, they hurried back to the Dales base, underscore somehow survived. Speaking of which, how powerful is Chitters now? While receiving first aid for his injuries by medics and military doctors and having restorative magic cast by Luminous and Wilhelm, Kazuya, recalling Chitters' overwhelming strength in defeating Adele, activated his ability. God's Trial, Part 2. Survive the valley inhabited by monsters, task completed. This isn't it. Help, notice no rewards or abilities are obtained for capturing Adele Saxon. Is that so? No, that's not what I wanted to know. This, after several failed attempts, Kazuya finally managed to open the desired location. Name, Chitters Katyama Level. Title, Judicator Fanatic Personality, Fanaticism, Frenzy, Dedication, Fanatic Dependency Level Question Mark. What does that mean? Huh? Is she the strongest? Huh? What's a title? Judicator fanatic. What does that mean? As Chitters tightly grasped Kazuya's right hand with both of hers, looking at him with a worried expression, Kazuya's mind was spinning with question marks. Setting aside Kazuya's inquiries, the rescue mission came to a close. Underscore His Excellency to the first operating room, others to the treatment room. Hurry. Upon returning to Dale's base, Kazuya, Miska, Fine, Lena, Raina, and El were rushed to the hospital. Kazuya in critical condition, was immediately taken to the operating room, while Miska, Fine, Lena, Raina, and Del, who were relatively lightly injured, were sent to the treatment room. Master, as Chitters paced anxiously in front of the operating room where Kazuya was undergoing surgery, a soldier rushed over, clearly flustered. Vice President Chitters, we have an emergency. An alarm blared through the base, and a soldier, 
appearing flustered, ran up to Chittas with unbelievable news. At a time like this, simultaneous enemy invasions from two directions? While rushing to the command center of Dale's base, Chitters interrogated the soldier about the report. Yes, sir. Enemy incursions confirmed at points 2 to 3 and 4 to 5. The enemy's strength and current situation? Yes, sir. At point 2 to 3, a large force, including one supersized magical weapon, suddenly appeared, destroying and breaking through the border fortresses and advancing toward the capital. Thirty minutes from now. The 1st and 2nd Armoured Brigades are expected to encounter them on the Jarl Plain. From point 4 to 5, a medium-sized force consisting of land and air magical weapons is passing through the territory of the Album Kingdom, gathering near the Ill River before the border between the Demonic Alliance and the Album Kingdom. Currently, the Combat Engineer Platoon and Patrol Squad, along with a volunteer foreign unit equipped with German military gear, coincidentally present in the town of Binderug on the side of the Ill River, are preparing for interception. What? Events were unfolding faster than Chitters had anticipated. Volume 03 Chapter 18 In the desolate expanse of the Jarl Plains, where the horizon stretches endlessly, thousands of land-based magical combat units, akin to swarms of mice, covered the ground. They were accompanied by flying magical combat units starting through the sky like flies, and a colossal western-style armor, towering at 50 meters in length, deploying powerful magical barriers, giant magical combat units resembling full-plate armor, engaging in fierce combat to halt the advance. Target sighted, giant magical combat unit, fire. Under the impassioned command of Captain Whitman, high explosive anti-tank rounds were launched from the 44 caliber 120 mm smoothbore gun of the M1A2 Abrams, accompanied by thunderous roars. Simultaneously, other M1A2 tanks from the 1st Armored Battalion also fired high explosive anti tank rounds toward the giant magical combat unit. Despite dozens of rounds of high explosive anti tank shells being fired towards the giant magical combat unit like a pack of hounds chasing prey, just before impact, they were all simultaneously detonated by the magic barrier deployed by the giant magical combat unit. Although the giant magical combat unit disappeared into the smoke for a moment, it soon reappeared unscathed, continuing its advance, target intact, no effect, TCH, it's hopeless after all. Upon receiving Gunner Volk's report, Captain Whitman furrowed his brow, glaring at the giant magical combat unit that couldn't be taken down no matter how many times they fired upon it. What? Hammerhead 1 to HQ. The aerial units are returning. What's going on? While continuing to fire shells to maintain distance from the approaching magical combat units, Captain Whitman noticed that the F-22 Raptors and F-2 fighters, engaged in combat against flying magical combat units, were flying away. He raised his voice towards the radio. HQ, all aircraft in the area are out of ammo. Well, send in others then. Unfortunately, that's not possible. What? What do you mean it's not possible? There should be nearly a hundred reserve aircraft, including at the base. The aircraft you've been fighting with until now were reserves from the Dales base, including interceptors. Most of Dales base's air force was engaged in the Supreme Leader's rescue operation and cannot currently sortie. Preparations for redeployment are underway, but it will take some time. Damn it, then there's no choice. Understood but do it as soon as possible. Over. Does that mean we've lost air superiority? This is bad. Captain Whitman wiped a bead of sweat from his forehead as they found themselves stripped bare of their cover. At that moment, Loader Ron, who was on perimeter watch, exclaimed in a panicked voice, Captain, enemy aircraft incoming from the three o'clock direction. Amidst overwhelming odds, with the departure of the air squadron who had been holding their ground with their pilot skills and aircraft performance, the flying magical combat units were now able to harass the tank battalion, which could only crawl on the ground. All vehicles, load multi-purpose shells, target, flying magical combat units in the three o'clock direction. Taking advantage of the situation, about 30 flying magical combat units, still in formation, descended close to the ground, attempting to attack in passing, towards the 50 M1A2 tanks of the 1st Armored Battalion. The tanks revved their engines, rotating their turrets simultaneously. Fire, as the flying magical combat units, still limited by technical issues, could only fly at speeds ranging from 100 to 200 kilometers per hour. 
They were within range when Captain Whitman gave the command. The tanks fired simultaneously towards the flying magical combat units. With a deafening roar, 50 multi-purpose shells raced through the air towards the flying magical combat units. As soon as they approached, the proximity fuses of the multi-purpose shells activated, exploding and creating a net of anti-aircraft gunfire in the sky. As a result, six flying magical combat units were caught in the net of anti-aircraft gunfire, exploding or crashing into the ground, spewing flames. All units, retreat. Roger. The Imperial Army Commander, surprised by the unexpected counterattack from the prey that could only crawl on the ground, ordered his subordinates to retreat via the magical communication devices installed in the flying magical combat units. However, as the remaining 24 flying magical combat units attempted to retreat, eight more were shot down by the simultaneous fire from the 2nd Armored Battalion, following the volley from the 1st Armored Battalion. Damn it, how could they? Then, I'll take them out from directly above. Determined to avenge his comrades, a pilot from the Empire observed the M1A2 tanks closely. Once he realized that tanks couldn't effectively attack from directly above, he initiated a rapid descent from directly above the tank he targeted. Hammerhead 2 to 5. Oh no, this is bad. Coincidentally targeted, Sergeant Bulkman from Hammerhead 2 to 5 froze in shock his eyes wide open as he leaned out of the commander's hatch atop the turret. As I thought, take this, the pilot smirked triumphantly as his aircraft approached from directly above, believing he would avoid retaliation. However, just as he was about to fire magical energy blasts at the relatively thinly armored turret of the M1A2 tank, his aircraft suddenly exploded. Ow, what? Struck by debris from the exploding flying magical combat unit, though he was wearing a helmet, Sergeant Bulkman blinked back tears, trying to understand what had just happened as he looked around. Hey, tank over there, are you alright? The soldier from the anti-aircraft squad, who had been looking around, spoke to Sergeant Bulkman via radio, that explosion just now. Was that your doing? Glancing at the 87mm self-propelled anti-aircraft guns and the M998 Humvees equipped with Avenger systems that had joined the 1st and 2nd Armored Battalions to drive away the flying magical combat units, Sergeant Bulkman inquired. No, it wasn't us. Look up at the sky. Huh? What in the world? Surprised, Sergeant Bulkman looked up at the sky with a sense of wonder. Upon receiving reports of approaching enemy forces, Dale's base erupted into a frenzy akin to stirring a hornet's nest. Battle stations, level 1 combat readiness. I repeat, battle stations, level 1 combat readiness, accompanied by blaring alarms. Orders for level 1 combat readiness were repeatedly issued, sending most soldiers within the base into a flurry of activity. 3rd Infantry Squad, defend the southern perimeter of the base. Take all available weapons with you. All right, position anti-tank weapons here and here. All air squadrons, expeditory launch procedures. Hey, we're short on sidewinders, get them out of the ammo depot pronto, in preparation for the approaching enemy forces. All stationed units at the base were on high alert, with aircraft returning from Kazuya's rescue mission landing one after another on the runway. Refueling and rearming operations were underway everywhere for their imminent redeployment. Conventional weaponry ineffective against supersized magical weaponry. All aircraft engaged in combat over the JAR planes are out of ammunition. Disengage from the area immediately. Air cover lost for 1st and 2nd armored battalions. They're sitting ducks. Transmission from Binder G. Imperial forces have commenced crossing the Eel River, preparing to engage in combat. Refueling and rearming for Dale's Base Air Squadron will be completed in 15 minutes. In the Operations Command Room at Dale's Base Headquarters, incoming reports were being read aloud by the Information Control Officer. Additionally, through cameras mounted on various vehicles of each unit, the battlefield scenes over the JAR planes were being displayed on the massive monitors in the command room. To think they dared to harm our my, master, and furthermore, this time, do those imperial scum truly desire death so badly, I see, I see, in that case, let's incinerate them with nuclear fire as they wish, starting with that bothersome puppet boy, upon witnessing the failure of the surprise attack operation by Adele and Nelson, who dared to attempt harming Kazuya, 
and seeing the Imperial forces immediately deploy large units to capture Kazuya at all costs, Chitters exploded in anger. N no, this won't do, Vice President muttering curses like kill, kill, kill them all, regardless of women and children, emitting a dark aura, Chitters frightened Miley, who despite trembling, raised her voice in an attempt to intervene, did you say something, Major Miley? Stare. Ah, N no, I I mean, um, that isn't the use of nuclear weapons within allied territory questionable. A also, please look at this, if we use nukes now, it will cause significant damage to the 1st and 2nd armored battalions and other units engaged in combat, Major Miley involuntarily screamed as Chitters, with her eyes devoid of light, turned them towards her, however, quickly regaining composure, Miley operated the large 3D tabletop monitor displaying the entire territory of the Demon Alliance, indicating the enemy forces with red dots and allied forces with blue dots, along with the potential damage radius of a nuclear blast. She attempted to dissuade Chitters from using nuclear weapons by clearly demonstrating that it would cause significant harm to allied forces as well. Evacuation orders will be issued. However, disregarding Major Miley's concerns and intentions, Chitters remained adamant about using nuclear weapons to annihilate the enemy. B but, in the face of Chitters's piercing gaze, Major Miley found herself unable to say anything further and fell silent. Just when it seemed inevitable that Chitters would proceed with using nuclear weapons, the door behind Chitters and Major Miley suddenly opened with a swoosh, and someone entered the room. Chitters, Miley and the other officers in the room turned around, their eyes widening in surprise. M Master, why are you here? Are you alright? K Kazuya Sama P Presidential Excellency, entering the room were Kazuya, accompanied by maids and guards, as well as Cecilia, who was clad in a pitch black robe and carried a staff much larger than herself, and Ibuki, who was supposed to be on the mainland of Probem. I'm fine, more importantly, what's the situation? Despite having undergone surgery just moments ago, Kazuya casually inquired about the current status from Chitters and the others, I'm not fine. But, Master, your health, I've been healed by Cecilia and the maid's recovery magic. Interrupting Chitters, who was concerned about his well-being, Kazuya stated the facts in a detached manner. Cecilia? What? Why are you here? Finally noticing Celestia's presence thanks to Kazuya's words, Chitters directed a hostile gaze towards Celestia and spoke, I brought her here. Just in case. What did you say? Ibuki, do you understand? No matter how much she shows submission to us, she was a prisoner. To think of using such a woman, I understand, but considering Celestia's abilities, we have no choice but to use her. After all, Master's condition has already improved. But, I can't trust her, and there's no guarantee she won't harm Master. I won't ignore that, it's nonsense to suggest that I would harm Kazuya-sama. Besides, I haven't submitted to you, I've simply become Kazuya-sama's female slave. Interrupting the conversation between Chitas and Ibuki, Celestia sneered at Chitas. What did you say? To me? What about it? Thank you, Mayurai, both of you, that's enough. We can't afford to fight right now. As Chitters, with visible irritation, attempted to grab Celestia in response to her provocative attitude, Kazuya, who had been receiving updates from Major Marawe, silenced them both. R, um, sorry, Master. I, I apologize, Kazuya Sama. Realizing the annoyance in Kazuya's words, both Chitters and Ibuki flinched before quickly quieting down and bowing their heads. All right. Let's first take care of that behemoth. Declaring with determination, Kazuya addressed the group. Understood. But, Master, that thing has a powerful magical barrier deployed, so ordinary attacks won't work. It seems so, nodding as he watched the monitor showing the colossal magical weapon advancing toward the capital, seemingly unconcerned about the artillery barrage from the 1st and 2nd armored divisions, Kazuya continued. So, we'll use the nuke to finish it in one go. No, there's no need to use the nuke. Why? Perplexed by Kazuya's words, Chitters tilted her head. It's almost time. Just as Chitters voiced her question, Ibuki interjected, and immediately afterward, a report came into the command room. Multiple unidentified aircraft approaching from the southeast. IFF. Received. Friendly forces. Number. Over 200. Well, this is. Quite something like an air show. Sergeant Bulkman muttered, impressed, 
as he watched the swarm of friendly aircraft flying overhead, sent from Purubim's mainland, via forward bases, to participate in Kazuya's rescue operation. Combat aircraft from Purubim's Army and Air Force, F-15 Eagle, F-15E Strike Eagle, F-16 Fighting Falcon, F-22 Raptor, Su-33, Su-35, Rafal, Typhoon. Saab 39 Gripen, F-2 Combat Aircraft from Purubim's Navy and Marines, F-14 Tomcat, F-A-18E F Super Hornet, Harrier 2 and even the latest state-of-the-art aircraft developed by Purubim's engineers, F-35 Lightning II, Pak F-A, T-50, and even the Su-47, a conceptual demonstrator summoned for research purposes, danced in the sky. It's overwhelming. Our military as Captain Whitman spoke, deeply moved by the sight of nearly 200 combat aircraft with Brabham's national flag, a crimson circle on a white background, engaging in aerial combat, bombarding flying magical weapons with various air-to-air -air missiles and gunfire. Lieutenant Whitman couldn't help but marvel. But despite securing air superiority, how do we defeat it? Bullets and missiles seem ineffective. Should we wait for the heavy bombers? Wait a minute, is this for real? Lieutenant Vidman, who had been pondering how to defeat the colossal magical weapon, which remained unscathed despite being bombarded by hundreds of AGM-65 Mavericks and KH-29 air-to-ground missiles from F-16S, Su-33S, Su-35S, Raffles, Typhoons, Gripens, F-A-18E-Fs, and Harrier is that were not deployed at Dale's base noticed something. That something was dozens of C-5 galaxies flying just above ground level, heading towards them. Reinforcements flying in formation at ultra-low altitude. The C-5 galaxy began dropping cargo from its rear hatch about five kilometers behind where Captain Whitman and his team were located. Are they holding an exhibition on land this time? Captain Whitman muttered as he watched tanks being dropped one after another from the transport aircraft. In front of Captain Whitman's gaze was a method called LAPES, Low Altitude Parachute Extraction System, which involved dropping supplies from transport planes flying close to the ground. This method allowed for the rapid deployment of heavy equipment like tanks by pulling them out with parachutes from the rear hatch of the aircraft and dropping them directly to the ground, making it a convenient means of tactical transport on the front line. However, even with such low altitude drops, there was a need to protect the tanks from the impact during descent and the friction with the ground upon landing, hence the use of specialized pallets. The tanks dropped onto the battlefield using this method were the main battle tanks of the 3rd to 3th.5th th generations, such as the Challenger 2, Makava Mk4, Leopard 2A6, Leclerc, and T-90A, operated by the SS on the Purubim mainland. Captain Whitman, seems like they're in a tough spot. Want some help? As soon as the dedicated pallets, having completed their task, sensed that they had come to a complete stop after being dropped, their securing bolts automatically blew off. Upon confirming the release of restraint, Captain Whitman received a radio transmission from the Leopard 2A6, which had started its engine and began moving after being released. That voice could it be Lieutenant Colonel Kurt? Speaking to Captain Whitman via radio was Lieutenant Colonel Kurt Nispel a hero who served as a tank commander in the German army during World War II, recording the highest number of enemy tanks destroyed in the war at 168. Yes, it's me. Lieutenant Colonel Kurt's reinforcement is reassuring. All right then. Let's go for the counterattack. Bad news. Scatter all units. Realizing that the reinforcements led by Lieutenant Colonel Kurt were skilled tank units, Captain Whitman raised his voice in delight and then shifted his gaze forward. In an instant, a voice warning of Sergeant Bulkman's danger echoed, and Captain Whitman, seeing the enormous magical weapon holding a huge magic cannon in its right hand and a shield in its left, froze involuntarily as his consciousness was enveloped in light. Underscore reinforcement troops arrived on the battlefield, intending to launch a counterattack, but they unexpectedly suffered a devastating attack from the massive magical weapon, leaving the operations command room in silence. Finally, the MQ-9 Reaper, which had just arrived at the battlefield, 
transmitted footage showing the devastating effects of the magical weapon's magic cannon strike, with the 1st Armored Battalion being engulfed in flashes and nearly annihilated, and a gigantic mushroom cloud rising over the Jal Plain, reminiscent of the aftermath of a nuclear weapon detonation. T. The 1st Armored Battalion suffered heavy casualties. Everyone was speechless at the power of the magical weapon's magic cannon. I retract my previous statement. Use the nuclear option. Reassessing the threat level of the massive magical weapon, Kazuya muttered with a stern expression, P please wait, Lord Kazuya. As I explained to the Vice President earlier, using nuclear weapons now will cause immense damage. I'm aware of that. Then please reconsider. At least give the units time to retreat. Units to retreat. What are you talking about, Myra I? Ha. Huh. Kazuya and Myra I exchanged puzzled glances at each other's incomprehensible conversation. Master, Rear Admiral Myra I is not attending the meeting to decide on the operation method for the nuclear. Ah. Uh that explains it. Question mark Myra I, unable to keep up with the conversation, looked perplexed as she repeatedly checked Kazuya and Chitaz's faces, Myra I, we're using the nuclear, but not directly. Does that mean, explanations can wait? Realizing something, Myra I covered her mouth in astonishment, Nagato. The launch code 0995215 Wa M Master Kazuya picked up the phone in the operations room and was about to relay the launch code to the only unit managing and operating the nuclear, the 666th unit, also known as Dustbusters, when Chitas remembered something and awkwardly interrupted Kazuya's words. What is it, Chitas? With the receiver still against his ear, Kazuya questioned Chitas. Um, T the launch code. It can't be used anymore. Why is that? Because, I used it. By the way, what was the target when you used the launch code for the nuclear missile? With his temples twitching, Kazuya spoke in a cold voice. The entire empire. Particularly densely populated areas. Chitas. We'll talk later. Why yes, understood. Chitas weakly nodded, looking far different from the person who had effortlessly dominated against Adil in the Imperial Army just a few hours ago. Hey, you're quite something. Gah. Chitas almost let out a voice upon hearing Cecilia's softly muttered words, barely averting it by tightly clenching her fist. So, was the launch code 0000000 acceptable? Yes, once the launch code is used. It resets to oh 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 oh. My apologies for the delay. Launch code oh 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 oh. Targeting the supersized magical weapon. Upon hearing the current launch code from the angered chitters aimed only at Cecilia, Kazuya relayed it once again to Dust Busters. We've accepted the order. Missile launch preparation complete. Please proceed with the launch order. Launch. And thus, following Kazuya's command. An LGM 30 minute man 3 intercontinental ballistic missile, ICBM, carrying a W 87 nuclear warhead, was launched from the underground missile silo in Paradigm Mainland. Volume 03, Chapter 19. Going back a bit in time, news arrived that President Hawk, aboard which Kazuya was traveling, had crashed. A state of emergency was declared on Parabem mainland, under Ibuki's command. Under his leadership, numerous units were gearing up for Kazuya's rescue mission. Amidst the commotion spreading throughout the mainland, a call came through to Unit 666, commonly known as the Dust Busters. Understood. Immediately initiate launch preparations for ICBMs and SLBMs. Warheads are nuclear, target is the entire Elza's magic empire. Launch code 09952158, await launch orders, roger that, with Chitters's terrifying voice barely concealing her fury and the authorization for nuclear weapon use granted, a certain emotion gripped her, her hands trembling as she tightly grasped the receiver, Colonel Hildolub, commander of Unit 666, responded to Chitters. Colonel, what was that call just now? That was from Vice President Chitters. But more importantly, everyone, rejoice, we've been granted permission to use nuclear arms, and our target is the entire Elza's magic empire. In response to his subordinate's inquiry, Colonel Hildolub, trembling with joy, said as if relishing the moment, the entire empire, you say? Yes, indeed, our beloved Vice President Chitters might have been killed, after all, it's only natural, isn't it? Well, now, Vice President Chitters. No, she's the acting president now. Well, anyway, 
we're awaiting launch orders. Come on, let's get in touch with all units, and don't forget to load nuclear warheads onto the intercontinental ballistic missiles and strategic bombers as well. It's going to get busy from here on out, so move quickly. Yes, sir. Colonel Hildolub noticed his frozen subordinates and urged them on. His subordinates then hurriedly began their actions following the procedures outlined in the prepared manual. Watching his subordinates in action, Colonel Hildolub muttered quietly to himself, To think I'd witness Armageddon with my own eyes. I'm fortunate. Chuckling to himself, Colonel Hildolub wore an expression of delight as he whispered. However, the following day brought news of Kazuya's rescue, averting Armageddon. Upon hearing this, Colonel Hildolub seemed to slump slightly, a hint of disappointment evident in his demeanor. Returning to the present moment, orders from Kazuya, who had decided to use the nuclear option, were issued to the 666th Battalion. Sorry to keep you waiting, launch code 000000. Target is the supersized magical weapon. Upon receiving the launch code and target from Kazuya, the 666th Battalion prepared for the nuclear launch. We've accepted the order. Missile launch preparations complete. Please issue the launch command. Launch. We're launching. With Kazuya's command given, two operators inserted keys into the equipment simultaneously, and finally, Colonel Hildrub, sporting a twisted grin, brought down his fist with full force, shattering the safety cover over the launch button and pressing it down. Thus, from the missile silo underground at Parabim's mainland, the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, LGM-30 Minute Man 3, was launched, trailing white smoke as it ascended into the sky. First and second boosters detached successfully, the LGM-30 Minute Man 3, now in the atmosphere after safely shedding its first and second stage rocket boosters, continued its flight with only the third stage containing the W87 nuclear warhead housed within the MK21 re-entry vehicle, guided by inertia, reached target airspace, and then, instead of descending towards the ground as intended, the MK21 re-entry vehicle remained airborne. Detonating operatives triggered the detonation high above the JAL planes, at an altitude of 100 kilometers within the upper atmosphere. Immediately after, a blinding flash, akin to a second sun, erupted as the W87 nuclear warhead, with a yield of 300 kilotons, detonated, searing retinas. Seconds later, a powerful electromagnetic pulse, EMP surged from the nuclear explosion in the upper atmosphere. Due to the rarefied air, gamma rays, the cause of the EMP, extended far and wide, with the EMP's effect reaching a maximum range of approximately 1,000 kilometers, they're coming. Communications with Captain Whitman, commander of the 1st Armored Battalion, were lost, and with his fate unknown, Lieutenant Colonel Curtis Pell, who assumed command, issued warnings received from HQ, urging caution among all units. Immediately afterward, the electromagnetic pulse generated by the nuclear explosion, occurring directly overhead, began to rain down upon the aviation units that had evacuated as a precaution and the tank units remaining in the vicinity. However, thanks to Kazuya's directive, the aircraft and tanks equipped with robust TMP countermeasures suffered no damage whatsoever. We did it. Conversely, magical weapons lacking EMP countermeasures were directly hit by the electromagnetic pulse, rendering them completely inoperative. This was because, despite their rudimentary nature, these magical weapons relied on electronic components for their operational control, all of which were fried by the electromagnetic pulse, rendering them inert. As a result, thousands of magical weapons, including the supersized magical weapon 1, remained virtually unscathed but incapacitated transforming the desolate Jarl planes into a graveyard of silent, inert objects. Sensing detonation of the core, here comes the EMP. Almost simultaneously with the magical weapons becoming immobilized in the Jarl plane, electromagnetic pulses also rained down on the Dale's base, restoring visuals. However, just as with aircraft and tanks, the base, equipped with countermeasures against TMP, suffered only minor damage as the lights flickered momentarily. I had hoped to reserve this as our trump card. Gazing at the giant monitor displaying the immobilized magical weapon standing in the JAL plane, Kazuya muttered as if to say oh well. Moreover, 
The aftermath is giving me a headache. Although there were no casualties on the ground due to the high altitude nuclear explosion. Kazuya received reports informing him that more than half of Parabem's artificial satellites were rendered useless. This rendered long-distance radio and internet communications via satellites impossible. Master, we'll take care of the rest, so please rest. Even if your wounds have healed, you must still be fatigued. Is that so? In that case, Chitters. I'm sorry, but I'll leave the rest to you. Yes, understood. With fatigue still evident. Kazuya readily accepted Chitas's suggestion and rose from his seat, leading Ibuki and the others out of the room. Watching them leave, Chitas turned back to her subordinates and briskly began issuing instructions. All early warning aircraft, take to the skies immediately. Prioritize restoring the communication network. Also, regarding Bindergs, among the four foreigner units, although referred to as such, they consist of support personnel from the Parabim army who volunteered for a change of military specialty, immigrants from the Canary Kingdom, slaves acquired by Kazuya, and regular soldiers serving as instructors. The first foreigner unit equipped with German military gear found themselves reluctantly embroiled in a skirmish with the Imperial Army's diversionary force in Beintherg, where they happened to visit for the purpose of gaining practical combat experience against monsters and bandits upon completing their training. Looks like there's quite a lot of them. A scene unfolded along the wide and shallow Iu River, spanning 500 meters in width and a maximum depth of just one meter, with monsters such as lizardmen and golems, as well as automatons, taking the lead, followed by land-based magical weapons and infantry crossing the river one after another, supported by flying magical weapons hovering above. Colonel Carl Adelbert, the commander of the first foreigner unit, observed this spectacle with a troubled expression. Commander. Civilians have been evacuated, and all units are ready for combat. Your orders, sir. It was Elvin Rommel, a fox eared officer from the Canary Kingdom serving as the deputy commander of the first foreigner unit, who urged Colonel Carl in a slightly impatient tone. R, yes. Once they've finished crossing the river as per the plan, initiate the attack. Also, make sure to inform headquarters, turning his gaze away from the encroaching enemy. Colonel Carl began to scrutinize the strength of his own forces listed on the chart he held in his hand. Understood, sir. While listening absently to Lieutenant Trummel's response, Colonel Carl pondered. Well, with this much firepower, we should be able to manage somehow. The first foreigner unit, Type 3 tanks, long-barreled version of Model J, Times 3, Type 4 tanks, Model J, Times 5, Panther tanks, Times 10, Tiger tanks, Tiger I. Times 5, Tiger Tanks, Tiger 2, Times 5, Maz Tanks, Times 2, Jagged Panther Tank Destroyers, Times 5, Hummel Self Propelled Guns, Times 10, Type 3 Assault Guns, Model G, Times 10, Werbel Wind Self Propelled Anti Aircraft Guns, Times 5, SD.KFZ, 2519, Half Drag Vehicle Equipped with 7.5 cm Self Propelled Gun. Times 10 Combat Engineer Company, M1 ABV Times 2, M2 Bradley Times 2, HMMWV Times 4, Kruger Armored Vehicles Times 2, M1126 Striker ICV, Infantry Carrier Vehicle Variant, Times 4, M1132 Striker ESV, Engineer Support Vehicle Variant, Times 4 Patrol Squad. HMMWV times 2, Kruger Armored Vehicles times 2. Apart from this, there are about 300 infantry soldiers. And although our equipment in the foreigner units is outdated, it has been improved. Moreover, considering the combined marching and combat training we've undergone, we have brought more than enough weapons, ammunition, and fuel, so there shouldn't be any concerns in that regard. Well, I'm a bit worried about the low level of training, though. Ah, uh, um. Colonel Carl, as Colonel Cal, absorbed in reviewing the force chart, pondered whether there were any flaws in the operation he had devised. Lieutenant Trommel timidly addressed him. What is it? Before the battle commences, there's something I'd like to ask. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I heard a rumor that I was appointed as the vice captain of the First Foreign Legion because of a recommendation from the Supreme Leader. Is that true? Since his appointment as the vice captain of the First Foreign Legion, Major Rommel had been curious about this matter, so he finally decided to ask Colonel Bell before the battle began. It's true, but does it matter? 
No, it's just that I couldn't understand why the Supreme Leader recommended someone like me, whom he's never even met, as the Vice Captain of the Unit, Major Rommel muttered with a slightly perplexed expression. Oh, you wanted to know the reason. Well, if I had to say, it's because you're fox eared Erwin Rommel. Um, Colonel Bell replied with a smile, refraining from mentioning that he chose Major Rommel as the Vice Captain of the Unit because of his name, which is the same as that of Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, known as the Desert Fox of the Third Reich, and because he is also a fox eared individual. More puzzled by Colonel Bell's response than before he asked, Major Rommel tilted his head repeatedly. Well, regardless, the Supreme Leader has expectations for you. Is that so? As Major Rommel tried to convince himself of Colonel Bell's explanation, a sudden cannon shot echoed through Binderg. What's going on? The enemy hasn't crossed the river yet. Who fired that shot, communicator? Inquire. Roger. Dash. All units from CP, who fired the shot? Dash. Roger. Captain, the shot came from tank number two of Tiger Eye. They claim to have shot down one flying type magical weapon. The reason for firing was felt like it would hit if I shot. They say, from now on, refrain from firing at will and follow our orders. Understood. Colonel Bell, dismayed by the report brought by the communicator serving at the CP, weakly uttered these words. Commence attack. As Imperial forces crossed the Eel River, a fierce onslaught erupted from the Parabem army. Initially, shells from Hummels, Sturm Schutz 3 assault guns, and Type 9 SD.KFZ.251 grenades rained down, followed by tank and armored vehicle rounds, and a barrage of anti-tank weapons and heavy machine gun fire from infantry. As a result, leading monsters fell in droves, staining the Eel River red with spilled blood. However, those behind showed no concern for this sight and continued their assault, closing in on the streets of Binderg City. Following closely behind were infantry, magicians bravely advancing while deploying magical barriers and casting spells to support the assaulting monsters. However, like their monstrous counterparts, they too were producing corpses at an alarming rate. In support of ground forces, aerial magic weaponry attempted airstrikes with magical cannons, yet, Due to obstructions caused by smoke and anti-aircraft fire from wobble winds, they couldn't even approach Binderg, let alone support ground troops. All units, fall back as planned and lure the enemy into Binderg city, roger that. In a downpour of shells and bullets that lasted several minutes, nearly all monsters and automatons were decimated, turning into nothing but sieves. Colonel Bile then relayed orders to the various units upon confirming the approach of land-based magical weaponry. In accordance, each unit fell back into Binderg City, enticing the land-based magical weaponry and infantry units into the urban area. The enemy is retreating. Don't let them escape. Don't miss this opportunity. Charge. Seeing Purubim forces retreating, Imperial commanders, unaware of the trap, ordered their subordinates to pursue. Damn it, where are they going? As easily as the tide recedes, Probim forces disappeared into the city streets. Imperial soldiers, following in their wake, cautiously navigated the brick-lined streets of Binderg, desperately searching for the unseen Probim forces. Huh? Iron monsters incoming. Take cover. As Imperial soldiers advanced along Binderg's main thoroughfare, an M1 ABV, nicknamed the Breacher, emerged from around the corner its rugged caterpillar tracks echoing loudly. Seeing this, Imperial soldiers instinctively sought cover or lay prone on the ground to protect themselves from an imminent attack. Yet, to their surprise, no attack came. Huh? Hey, it doesn't have cannon like the other iron monsters. True. Then let's get closer and kill whoever's inside. We might have a chance. Swallowing hard, Imperial soldiers, who had faced adversity across various battlefields, harbored a glimmer of hope. Perhaps they could defeat this iron monster. They cautiously stood up. He hey, they're not shooting after all. Let's go. Charge. Just as Imperial soldiers stood up, ready to charge, the M1 ABV, equipped with a bulldozer like dozer blade on its front and a mine clearing lion charge on its turret, fired the lion charge toward them, launched by rockets. The lion charge, a rope like C4 explosive flew for a few seconds before dropping right in front of the Imperial soldiers. Huh? What's this? A rope. T they're trying to scare us. Just you wait. We'll charge this time for sure. Unaware that the flying object was a lion charge for mine clearance, the Imperial soldiers, feeling mocked, turned red with anger and rushed towards the M1 ABV, 
Yura, with a battle cry, wielding swords and spears, Imperial soldiers charged forward, but just as they were about to reach the M1 ABV, thinking it was merely a rope, the lion charge exploded. The Imperial soldiers perished without understanding what had happened. Breach row 1 to CP, multiple enemy infantry destroyed at point 3. Proceeding to the next location, CP copies, move to point 2 and support breach row 2. Breach row 1, understood. Hey, move to point 2. After reporting their results, the commander of breach row 1 cut the radio and ordered their driver to move to point 2. Understood. But, Captain, this duel surprisingly works well. That's right. Let's capitalize on this momentum and kill the next one. Inside the confines of Bleach Row One's vehicle, voices of jubilation filled the air as they reveled in their unexpected triumph. Portal team here, magic weaponry has passed point four to five and will commence attack from this point. Copy that, CP. Wishing you luck. Members of the patrol squad, soldiers of the Parabim army, concealed themselves in the narrow alleys of Binderug City lying in wait to ambush the Imperial forces. When the two magical war machines, accompanied by mages and infantry, leisurely traversed the main thoroughfare, a gunner wielding a Kalgustav leapt onto the street from concealment and seized the moment, launching an anti-tank grenade at one of the war machines. The anti-tank grenade struck the cockpit of the war machine, instantly incinerating both pilot and cockpit, and the war machine. Eruptant flames of crimson from its central body collapsed to the ground amidst a deafening explosion, crushing several infantrymen in its wake. What the? You dare, Kyle? What's? What's happening? I can't see outside. Startled by the explosion nearby, a pilot from the neighboring unit realized their comrades had fallen. In an instant retaliation, a Parabim soldier hidden elsewhere targeted the war machine's eyes, its cockpit, with a camera transmitting external visuals, using an M109 heavy payload rifle firing 25mm rounds of superior power and precision. Now, fire. Launching. As the external visuals abruptly ceased, a freshly reloaded Carl Gustav fired another anti-tank grenade, updating the score with another destroyed land-based magical war machine. Huh? Thought you were hidden? Take out Kevin. Roger. Seizing the opportunity presented by the assault on the magical war machines, a Parabim soldier, who had been eliminating mages and infantry, noticed the presence of a mage who had shielded themselves behind walls of rock to deflect bullets. Although the mage had enclosed themselves with walls of rock, leaving the airspace open, the commander of the patrol squad deemed it an excellent opportunity to test the recently deployed M25 IOS airburst grenade launcher. Instructed by the commander, a soldier armed with the M25 IOS utilized its built-in laser rangefinder to measure the distance to the target and set the detonation position. With the necessary data automatically inputted into the chambered 25mm round, high explosive airburst round. The soldier confirmed the settings and pulled the trigger without hesitation. With a booming discharge, the 25mm round sword, measuring its flight distance by the number of rotations before detonating Madeira upon reaching the predetermined distance, sending shockwaves and shrapnel ripping through the rock walls, the mage hiding behind the rock walls was knocked senseless by the blast and shockwave, bleeding from various wounds, succumbing to death. It's about time. Relay to all units. Push the enemy back to the river. Capitalizing on the momentum gained by luring the Imperial forces into the urban area and leveraging the terrain advantage to eliminate approximately half of the enemy forces, Colonel Bell reversed his orders to his subordinate units, commanding them to counterattack instead of retreating. Understood. Relay to all units. Huh? Oh, um. Why yes. Understood. See Captain. We've received an urgent message from headquarters. They're planning a nuclear explosion over the jar plane in 10 minutes. And they've warned about the resulting EMP. Interrupted by the sudden intrusion of a radio transmission, a communications soldier, his expression altered, raised his voice as soon as he finished relaying the message. A nuclear explosion? Is that for real? There's no mistake. Besides the direct line, repeated warnings are being broadcasted on all open channels. Colonel Bell's eyes widened in astonishment at the staggering report conveyed by headquarters. Dash. Understood. Let's crush the enemy. All tanks. Panzer IV. Receiving instructions and warnings from CP, the 1st Foreign Battalion's tank unit rallied and began their assault with determination. 
the enemy is charging in. Dash. Whoa. What? I don't want to die. Fall back. Retreat. Retreat. What's happening? Dash. Hey. What's that over there? Amidst the chaos caused by the counterattack of the 1st Foreign Battalion's tank unit, with urgent voices and cries of confusion from Imperial Army pilots, the situation remained unclear. Before them, three land-based magical weapons were immobilized, accompanied by the resounding theme music of a certain galactic empire, as the world's largest super-heavy tank, the Maus, appeared. I don't know what it is, but it's an enemy. Fire. After we take it down will retreat. Roger. Despite feeling as if a wall was closing in on them, the three land-based magical weapons aimed their magical cannons at the mouse and unleashed dozens of magical energy blasts. Did we get it? The mouse disappeared into the smoke caused by the explosion of the magical energy blasts. We've bombarded it with so many magical energy blasts, even that iron behemoth should have been destroyed. Although there wasn't a satisfying sense of accomplishment, and they were somewhat uncertain whether they had defeated it, the three land-based magical weapons prioritized retreating over confirming the mouse's destruction, and turned on their heels to leave the scene. Shortly after, the sound of artillery echoed, and the land-based magical weapon furthest back exploded. W what the? No way. It survived? The land-based magical weapon, startled by the death of its comrade, turned around to see the mouse emitting smoke from its 55 caliber 12.8 cm KWK-44 tank gun. Advance. Despite having absorbed dozens of magical energy blasts, the mouse's frontal turret armor was 220 to 240 mm thick, and even the frontal armor of its hull was 200 mm thick, making it practically impervious to mere magical energy blasts. It's impossible for us to defeat it alone. Let's retreat. Dash. Oh no. As the land-based magical weapons gave up on defeating the mouse and attempted to retreat, the mouse's secondary armament the 36.5 caliber 7.5 cm KWK-44 tank gun, shot through the legs of one of them. Damn it! We can't deal with this monster. Hey, wait! Don't leave me behind! Seeing their incapacitated comrade left behind, the remaining land-based magical weapon abandoned them and fled. Damn! One of them got away, pursue them! To chase after the fleeing land-based magical weapon. The mouse started its pursuit at its top speed of 20 km per hour on level ground. No, don't come this way. Stay away. Having lost the use of its legs, the land-based magical weapon desperately tried to move away from the mouse, but the mouse was faster. Don't come. Don't come. Stop, please. I beg you. No. With a creaking sound, the pilot screamed as the mouse slowly crushed the magical weapon, experiencing the terrifying sensation of being crushed by the 188-ton behemoth. Despite attempting to escape from the aircraft, the pilot couldn't open the escape hatch, which was broken, and in the end, they were crushed under the weight of the mouse. We've received pursuit orders from headquarters. I'm not particularly thrilled about it, but we can't let the enemy escape. Let's go. Due to the electromagnetic pulse caused by the nuclear explosion over the Jarl planes, both aerial and land-based magical weapons were rendered unusable, and with the Imperial Army falling into a disadvantageous position, they quickly retreated. Although the 1st Foreign Battalion celebrated the successful defense of Bindwag, they had no time to savor the victory as they received pursuit orders from the Imperial Army immediately after communication was restored, crossing the Eel River and entering the territory of the Alban Principality to pursue the Imperial Army. Volume 03 Chapter 20 Three days had passed since the day the Purubim Army managed to fend off the simultaneous dual-front invasion by the Elzas' magic empire into the demon-allied nations using the unconventional tactic of high-altitude nuclear detonation-induced electromagnetic pulse EMP. Both the Purubim and the demon-allied nations were in a frenzy of post-war processing. Especially on the Purubim side, efforts were underway day and night to transfer one captured supersized magical weapon. Approximately 2,000 land-based magical weapons, 10 aerial magical weapons, about 300 automata, and around 4,000 prisoners, including pilots of various magical weapons, from the Jal Plains and Bind Erg to the Dales Base and the mainland of Probem. Concurrently, reinforcement troops hastily dispatched from the Purubim mainland to Dales base lost the majority of their forces during the simultaneous dual-front invasion and were now tasked with maintaining order and border security, 
replacing the demon army, which had lost most of its strength as a military force due to the invasion. Amidst this chaos, a commotion unfolded in front of the hospital at Dale's base. The master is currently resting. Visits are not possible. Let us see our big brother. Let us see Kazuya. Correction, it was more than just a commotion. Arguing fervently at the entrance of the hospital where Kazuya, who was hospitalized, was located, were Chitters and Iris and Karen, who had rushed there by commandeering, rather forcibly borrowing or more accurately, seizing one of the few aerial navigation ships of the Canary Kingdom from somewhere after receiving information that Kazuya's President Hawk had crashed, causing even the scramble launch of fighters from Dale's base and violating airspace. How many times do I have to tell you? It's impossible right now. Oh, wait, you two, the troublemakers who are determined to see Kazuya safe at any cost? Slipped past Chitters' guard and infiltrated the hospital. Who are these people? They act as if they know the master's whereabouts. Could it be that they actually know where the master is? Upon infiltrating the hospital, Iris and Karen, driven by women's intuition, made a beeline for Kazuya's sick room. Stop. Hey, you two. Stop them. Chitters chased after them, trying to catch the two troublemakers. At that moment, two security guards from the hospital appeared conveniently in the direction they were heading. You're in the way. Get out of here. Take this. What? Ark, Kaya. However, the two security guards, caught off guard by the sudden attack, couldn't react in time. One took Karen's roundhouse kick to the chin, while the other was struck in the groin by Iris, and they were both knocked out, proving useless. TCH, worthless. Foaming at the mouth or clutching their groins, the pitiful security guards collapsed to the ground, and Chitters glared at them with disdain, then continued to pursue Iris and Karen. This is bad. That's Kazuya's room. Chitters panicked as Kazuya's sick room came into view at last. Stop those two. Chitters shouted at the two Imperial guards standing as sentinels in front of Kazuya's sick room. Why yes, understood. A, why yes, understood. Why L, let go. A, uck, let go, let go, please. Ha, ha, finally caught you. Even the elite among the elite Imperial guards of Barabim couldn't resist and they were instantly incapacitated and apprehended. Phew. Get ready, both of you. TCH. We were so close. Dash. Kazuya. No. Let us see our big brother. As Chitters breathed a sigh of relief that she had managed to capture Iris and Karen before they could invade Kazuya's sick room, she turned to take them away. But at that moment, the automatic door of the sick room opened in response to the returning Imperial guards handing over Iris and Karen and the three fell silent as they beheld the scene inside the room. And by sheer coincidence, as the door opened, they fell silent at the sight inside the room. K cause you yeah, here. Open wide. R. R. N. No. You can feed yourself, fine. Hey hey, cause you yeah, what about the Anne? Huh, what about her? Jeez, you're so dense. I'm asking if you find her cute. Huh, oh, um, I think she's cute, I guess. Really? Then I'll make Lian your wife. Huh? What? Leanne? What are you saying? What? It's normal, you know? T.E. Ever since we met, my ogre instincts have been tingling for such a strong male. Besides, mother seems to have her eye on him too. It's a race to the finish. What? Mother too? No way, cause Yuya belongs to me, big sister. You're so bold Tilda. Saying such things in front of him. A. R. N. No. That's. Ah. Uh, um. Kakas Yuya. This is, well, not like that, I, uh, it's not, well, you see, Leanne, Leanne's not so bad, you know, R, ha ha ha, ha, uh oh, cause you yeah, trapped in the room with no escape, tried to pass off the ongoing struggle between Finn and Lean with a wry smile, suddenly, he felt a piercing gaze on his skin, and as he glanced towards the door, he finally noticed Chitters, Iris, and Karen, staring at him with dark, murky eyes from beyond the door. Master Chitters's voice creaked like a broken robot toy, her head tilting with a somewhat menacing expression. We've come all this way out of concern. Brother, it's punishment time. Iris chirped with a smile as bright as a blooming flower, her words carrying an ominous undertone. Kazuya, looks like you're having quite the good time. Hey, really, Karen said, veins bulging on her forehead, her gaze sending an icy chill straight to Kazuya. Today's not my lucky day. With a resigned sigh, 
because Yuya quietly closed his eyes, anticipating the impending disaster. Deep underground in the Dale's base, something was about to begin. Bwa, cough, cough, awake, awee, Adele, stripped bare and meticulously restrained, his limbs bound tightly, and his consciousness muddled by the effects of medication, suddenly jolted into full awareness as icy cold water was poured over him. Cough, ha! Do you need something from me? Bound by a subservient collar and securely restrained, Adele, unsure whether he was awake or asleep due to the effects of the drugs, glared at Chitters as if he would shoot her dead. It's been four days, but you seem lively enough, Chitters said, sitting up straight in the chair placed in front of Adele. Her legs crossed elegantly, she had a few female officers standing behind her. Leaning in close to Adele's ear, she whispered, because it wouldn't be fun otherwise. Exclamation mark the moment Adele heard Chitters' voice, a shiver ran down his spine, and for a moment, as Adele's face contorted in fear, Chitters continued to smirk. Now then, the reason I'm here today is I won't speak a word. Ah, that's fine. I don't need you to talk, Chitters interrupted. Her words met with Adele's firm resolve. Huh? Thinking Adele had come to provide information for the Empire, Chitters' response caught him off guard. Why do you look surprised? Let me tell you, if you easily spill the information, there won't be any more torture, right? This is also my way of venting frustration. Ark faced with the fact conveyed with a smile, the blood drained from Adele's face. Shall we begin then? As Chitters spoke, she gestured to her subordinate, who wheeled in a cart with various gruesome torture devices. Now, which one shall we use? Oh, how about this? These electrodes between the fingers. Perhaps intending to mentally torment Adele first, Chitters began explaining the torture devices on the cart one by one. <laughs> What's wrong? You look pale, Chitters said as she brought an electrified rod close to Adele's eyes, sparking a few times. Wah dot, just from the explanation of the torture devices, Adele suffered mental damage and almost blurted out. I'll tell you everything, just help me, he gritted his teeth then moved his trembling cheek with fear and defiantly smirked. Well, how about we get this over with, you damn woman, do you think I'm scared of this kind of thing? Dot. Damn it. Although Adele was trembling inside, he spat out those words and tried to spit at Chitters, but even spitting was impossible due to the effectiveness of the subservient collar. Don't get too cocky, Chitters said as she lowered her face, seemingly irritated. She forcefully shoved the electrode she held in her right hand into Adele's mouth. It's because of you. It's because of you that I... I received a scolding from Master. And not only that, I was stripped of my night duty for a whole month. While muttering curses, Chitters glared at Adele with eyes as dark and murky as sludge. MMMPH. Stop it. Comma just as Chitters lifted her head, about to press the remaining electrode onto Adele's body, an out-of-place ringing filled the room. Understood, Vice President, the meeting time has been moved up. Just as Chitters was about to touch Adele with the electrode and send electricity coursing through him, her subordinate, who answered the phone, spoke up. Lucky bastard, Chitters muttered. Pant. Pant. Chitters removed the electrodes from the worn-out Adele's mouth seemingly released from extreme tension, and spat out, we'll continue this later, tend to cleaning the room, and don't forget to administer the medication, also, let no one but me enter, understood, a glance at the yellow liquid steaming on the floor along Adele's thighs, Chitters departed the room with those words, Cecilia, I miss you, but will I be able to see you soon over the four days since becoming a prisoner? Adele's spirit was already on the verge of breaking despite not having undergone any significant harm, aside from an attempted one earlier. Yearning deeply, she wished to see Cecilia, the only one she had truly trusted in this world. Underscore the chilling wind froze to the bone, and snow flurried around the Dale's base. With that, we conclude the meeting, Chitters declared, marking the end of the crucial conference determining the fate of Probem. Exhausted, but it won't be long before things get busy again after catching my breath. According to information gathered from spies embedded deep within the Empire and those who became prisoners during battles, the Empire refrained from any military actions during winter, focusing instead on bolstering its forces. It was reported they planned to launch a renewed invasion concurrently with the arrival of spring. Based on this intelligence, 
Prabhim also decided to concentrate on strengthening its military and domestic affairs for the next three to four months until spring. Following this period, they would launch an offensive against the Empire before their anticipated invasion. Ah, I'm beat. Good job, Master. Feeling drained after the important meeting, Kazuya took a breather. Ah, come to think of it, I completely forgot amidst the busyness. Chitters, bring Adele here. A. Why yes, sir. Startled by Kazuya's words, Chitters, although flustered, responded. Huh? Something seems off. Though noticing Chitters' odd demeanor, Kazuya didn't dwell on it too much as he watched her go to fetch Adele. <laughs> Doesn't she seem worn out? Observing Adele, who was brought in by Chitters and the guards with unsteady steps, dressed in the conspicuous orange prisoner garb, Kazuya furrowed his brows. It's just your imagination? Question mark. Well, if you say so. Warned by Chitters that she'd kill him if he mentioned anything about the recent near torture session, which Kazuya was unaware of. Adele dodged the topic with that reply. Phew, it's a relief nothing has happened. Yet, listening to their conversation, Chitters secretly breathed a sigh of relief. She understood well enough that disobeying Kazuya's wishes again after the recent incident would not end well. Oh, right, the reason I called you here. I want you to meet someone, Kazuya said. Wa sec. Ilya, it's been a while. Adele. Adele was dumbfounded to see Cecilia, whom she had been told died during the battle in the fortress city of Canaria Kingdom. Is it really? Really you, Cecilia? Yes, it's the Cecilia Fitlock you know, in place of the restrained and immobile Adele. Cecilia approached and gently stroked Adele's cheek. I'm glad. Glad you're alive. Gah. I'm so glad. Feeling Cecilia's warm body temperature through the touch on her cheek, Adele began shedding tears of joy, reassured that she wasn't experiencing a hallucination or a dream. Hee <laughs> hee. I'm happy to see you too. Uck. A R. There, there. Embracing the sobbing Adele with a compassionate expression, Cecilia held her close as if comforting a child whose floodgates of tears had burst open. Have you calmed down? Yeah. Adele who had cried loudly in Cecilia's arms without restraint, nodded with a somewhat relieved expression at Kazuya's inquiry. Now, let's get to the point. I'll be straightforward. Would you like to join us? No, I won't join your group. Adele promptly rejected Kazuya's proposal without hesitation. Huh, did I misjudge? She seemed fixated on avenging Cecilia, so I thought if I told her Cecilia was on our side, she might defect. <laughs> this is troublesome. Keeping a genuine hero as a prisoner and having them potentially run amok if something happens. But then again, when Rena and the others were captured, the damn elf apparently stopped them from being violated. Well, he doesn't seem like a bad guy. Incidentally, Adele's statement about treating Rena and the others as toys was merely a bluff intended to provoke Kazuya, the Kazuya, who had fought against the demon lord for the sake of the powerless people, Adele who seemed to possess noble intentions and aspirations, was a source of concern. No, Adele. Huh? Don't be so selfish with Kazuya-sama. You will become Kazuya-sama's female slave along with me, Cerezia said with her usual gentle and radiant smile, her words carrying an aura of affection. Kazuya, of course, was taken aback by Cerezia's unexpected bombshell, leaving even Chitters and members of the guard speechless and frozen in place. Cerezia, what in the world? And Kazuya Sama, Adele was bewildered by the unbelievable words coming from someone she had trusted. So, Adele, you will become Kazuya Sama's female slave with me, and from now on, you will live solely for Kazuya Sama. Do you understand? What? Is this a joke, Cerezia? Adele. Do you think I would joke at a time like this? However, Adele couldn't shake off the sense of fear and discomfort as Cerezia continued speaking with a smile, seemingly enjoying the prospect. Anyway, I'm looking forward to it. Let's both serve Kazuya Sama wholeheartedly. Shall we? Adele felt an indescribable sense of dread and unease. What's wrong, Cerezia? You're always could it be? You lot. What have you done to Cerezia? Adele confronted Kazuya with a sudden change from her calm expression to a ferocious glare, suspecting that Kazuya and the others might have done something like brainwashing Cerezia. Ah, well, you see, Kazuya awkwardly began to explain. In the Siege City battle, Cerezia suffered severe burns all over her body and lost both eyes, both hands, and both legs. What are you talking about? Listen to the end. So, in a near-death state, or rather, with only a faint heartbeat remaining, 
one of our soldiers found Ceresia and brought her to the field hospital just in case, then, I happened to pass by, it was actually during an experiment, and used my complete healing ability to save her, but, there are side effects to that ability, well, the main side effect, I don't fully understand it yet, but, it seems like it makes people develop feelings of affection towards me or want to be subservient. And that's how it turned out. Kazuya pointed at Ceresia while holding his head as if trying to suppress a headache. What? That's no different from brainwashing. Adele shot a glare filled with hostility at Kazuya. I can't deny that. Scratching his head in distress, Kazuya averted his gaze from Adele. Such. Undo it. Bring Ceresia back to normal. If I could undo it, I would. But some things are beyond repair. With tears streaming down her face, Adele cried out in anguish, her voice filled with sorrow. I won't forgive you. How dare you? You, you're the only one I'll never forgive, eh? Thud. The sound of flesh being torn and something being penetrated very deeply echoed in the room where Kazuyu and his friends were. What? G.O.P. Seri. Shia. What? Adele who saw the dagger that had been thrust deep into her stomach by Celesia's hand, asked Celesia while coughing up blood from her mouth. Adele, please don't use such rude languages towards Kazuya-sama. Also, I'm the happiest right now. I'm tired of living according to that shitty lawnism doctrine. I absolutely don't want to go back to the way I was before. So, Adele, please be reborn as soon as possible with Kazuya-sama's ability. Then you'll be able to understand my feelings. I'll have the pleasure of having my heart and soul controlled. Celesia continued, with a smile and an expression of compassion overflowing with kindness, but with a dark tinge of madness in her eyes. Hee hee, that's right, I'll tell you something good. From what I saw. Kazuya-sama's ability, complete healing ability, when used, the more severe the target's injury, the more favorable he will be, it seems like your feelings of subordination are growing. It will be painful, but I hope you will be on the verge of death like me, Adele then you can become Kazuya-sama's and only Kazuya-sama's female slave like me, I -a -a. Adele screams in unbearable pain as Celesia violently moves the dagger she thrusts into her, sees it. Yo, I understand. Kazuyu and Chitters, who were brought to their senses by Adele's screams, raised their voices, and the members of the SS who had been frozen in a daze came back to their senses. Fufafu. Ah, I'm looking forward to it. Fufu, let's serve Kazuya Sama together, you fufafafu. Ah ha ha ha. Celestia, who was subdued and restrained by members of the SS, licked Adele's blood from her lips, her mouth distorted into a crescent moon and she was laughing happily, Gobu, ha. H wait, I'll heal you right now. Kazuya ran over to Adele, who was in pain, as Celesia was being restrained and taken out of the room by members of the SS, ha, ha, no, Mru. Don't use your abilities on me, don't, brainwash me. Don't do that, however, Adele refused Kazuya's help, having said that, I'm going to die if I continue like this noisy. Adele's internal organs were torn to shreds, and even if she were taken to the hospital immediately, she would not be able to make it in time. There was no way to save Adele other than using Kazuya's full healing ability. There's a life in front of me that I can save, so I can't just silently abandon it. Don't feel bad about it. Oh, stop. Kazuya, prepared to be hated, shook off Adele's restraints and placed his hand over Adele's wound activating his ability. In this way, for reasons unintended by Kazuya, the number of people who felt prey to the perfect healing ability increased. Volume 03 Chapter 21 The execution site is located at the far end of the back of the Demon King's castle. A guillotine and a gallows were placed there, and it was occasionally used to execute criminals, but normally it would be quiet with no one approaching, but a large number of demons had gathered there. Dot. I feel really bad. Amira sat deeply in a luxurious chair prepared in the special viewing area, looking down at the three hundred or so elves whose hands were tied behind their backs with a sullen and grim expression. Around Amira, her subordinates, royal guards, and the chiefs of each race were gathered together. However, there is a new elf sitting in the place where elf chieftain Rodney Seltz usually sits. Because, Seltz, lastly. Do you have any explanation? Nothing will happen. Everything was caused by Nelson, my foolish son. Considering the gravity of the situation, I can't say anything even if I kill all the members of my family, 
What will happen next is the head of state of Parabem, an ally that has not only betrayed its homeland, the allied demon nation, and joined the empire, but has also provided a great deal of aid to the allied demon nation. Moreover, it was the execution of the Seltz family, who were accused of plotting Kazuya's assassination, Nelson Seltz. I see, take me with you. Rodney, who was Amira's close friend and had spent a long time with them because they were members of a race with eternal youth and longevity, bowed towards Amira at the end with a somber expression on his face, and was then taken to the execution stand. Even though it can't be helped, killing a friend for the sake of the country, it's disgusting. Amira gritted her teeth as she watched Rodney being led to the guillotine to be hanged, and the men and women of the Seltz family, young and old, with ropes placed around their necks and taken to the gallows to be hanged. Amira was about to order the execution while listening to the cries of grief and despair of the elves who were about to be executed. Demon King A royal guard ran towards Amira in a panic and whispered in her ear. What? Kazuya? Hearing the news of the visit of the person she had no hatred for, Amira twisted her head and turned her gaze towards the direction where the royal guards were running, while a hint of joy appeared in her eyes. Then, in addition to the bodyguards, there was Ryan, who was hugging her arm with a satisfied look on her face, and Fine, who was blushing in embarrassment while saying something to Ryan, but who was firmly grasping the edge of her sleeve. And Kazuya was walking towards the execution site with Chitters and the others in tow glaring at him with a devilish look on his face, but somehow feeling envious and stupid girls. Even though she was slightly jealous of her own daughters, Amira got up from her seat, got off the bleachers, and greeted Kazuya. Kazuya, what happened? All of a sudden, no, I heard you were going to execute an elf. Ah, that's right, I have to hold Nelson accountable for doing something so terrible, but what's wrong with that? No, that's why I came to ask you a favor. Huh? What are you asking for? Ah, if you're going to kill me anyway, why don't you give them all to me? The moment Kazuya said that, not only the chieftains who were listening to Amira and Kazuya's conversation with great interest, but even the elves in question. Huh? His face froze. That's a bit difficult. This is also a demonstration. I see, then just a woman. When Amira showed some reluctance, Kazuya quickly proposed a compromise, in that case, I don't mind. But what are you planning to do if I take you home? What, just having fun with things? In order to hide his true intentions, Kazuya gave the most plausible reason and looked at the elves with lustful eyes. Hi. The elf women realized the meaning of Kazuya's words and gaze, predicted their own tragic future, and let out a small scream. The elf women realized the meaning of Kazuya's words and gaze, predicted their own tragic future, and let out a small scream. I say it all the time, you liar, even though you have no intention of having fun. Generally speaking, if your goal is to have fun, all you have to do is tell them to send only women from the beginning, and then all of them. You're just too kind. Amira, who had easily figured out Kazuya's real intention for coming here, suppressed a laugh inside. Kukaku, Chitters is having a hard time too. Hard HMPH, this is my master. Amira shifted her gaze from Kazuya to Chitters and spoke with just her eyes. Then, Chitters snorted at her and answered her as if it were natural. Then the negotiation is concluded. Ah, I understand. Now you guys. You heard what I said, don't give the woman to Kazuya and the others, ha. Huh? As soon as Amira shouted to the royal guards, over a hundred elf women were handed over to Kazuya and the others. Then that's it for us. Um, are you going home yet? Ah, uh, I finished my business. I see. See you. Amira waved back at Kazuya and the others who waved her hand and saw them off. Dot. Thank you for helping my daughters. Behind him, Rodney who had seen through Kazuya's intentions just like Amira, bowed his head deeply as Kazuya departed. Um, mother? So what's the important thing to talk about? When Kazuya and the others were no longer visible, Fine, who remained here with Rhine after being told by Amira, opened her mouth. Oh, I'll tell you later. So go back to your room first. A, R, yes. Understood. Yes. Ah. I wish I could have spent more time with Kazuya. Fine obediently and Ryan grumbling but followed Amira's words and entered the Demon King's castle. <laughs> That's the president of Parabem. I've heard rumors about him, but he seems like an interesting guy. When Fine and Ryan left, someone came up next to Amira. Melkia, huh? 
It's time to stop saying bad things, that's my prey. Oh, the first come, first served, right? He <laughs> he. The woman didn't seem to be intimidated by Amira's sharp gaze, in fact, her interest in Kazuya was tickled even more by Amira's attitude, and she licked her red lips in a sexy manner. Besides, my children the mistresses of the demon mansion are so excited that they're reporting to me, so I'm surprised too. q f f f f f now how am I going to eat this? The succubus is wearing a risque bondage worn by exhibitionists, emphasizing her plump thighs and buttocks, as well as her voluptuous breasts, and spreading her bewitching and lewd charms all over her. Picture it in your mind. Melchior Digitalis, the head of the succubus clan who is said to have beauty and sexual skill that can drive all male creatures crazy and corrupt, is worried about how to defeat Kazuya. Summoning of weapons. Weapons developed and manufactured up to the year 2014 can be summoned. Summonable quantities and unit composition. Current level is 67. Infantry. 200,000 artillery, 25,000 vehicles, 25,000 aircraft, 10,000 ships, 9,500 personnel necessary to operate artillery, vehicles, aircraft, and ships are summoned along with these weapons when summoned, personnel for rear support, engineers, maintenance personnel, communications personnel, supply personnel, medical personnel, etc., are not included in the infantry and are summonable separately. Currently, the rear support personnel that can be summoned are limited to the scale of the general army. There are no restrictions on summoning heavy firearms or small arms within the range that infantry can operate. Help. Attention to abilities. Summoning is possible without using the menu screen, relying on voice or thought. Once summoned military supplies, resources, and facilities can be erased, but people, soldiers, cannot be erased. It is impossible to erase the bodies of deceased soldiers. Additionally, it is not possible to summon the same person as a deceased soldier again. Summoning abilities cannot be used during combat. Rear support personnel are now capable of actively engaging in self-defense combat. Our forces are gradually coming together. Several days after the execution of the Zoltz clan, Kazuya, having concluded the scheduled meeting with Amira, which had been planned from the outset, was led by a maid of the Demon King's castle to a room that had been loaned out. In the spare time thus acquired, Kazuya was verifying his abilities. Incidentally, present in this room were only Kazuya, the maid L, Wilhelm, and several members of the bodyguard. As Fichitas and the other accompanying members, they were continuing discussions with the diplomats of the Demon Union in another room to refine the details of the upcoming counter-offensive operation against the Empire and the new agreements established in the meeting between Kazuya and Amira. Knock, knock. Excuse me, Lord Nagato, Lady Amira requests your presence. I apologize for the inconvenience, but would you please come? <laughs> Understood. While Kazuya patiently awaited the conclusion of Chitas's discussions, a maid dressed in a highly revealing maid outfit, different from the one who had previously guided him into the room, came to fetch him. Was there some problem? Or perhaps it's a different matter? With questions lingering about being suddenly summoned by Amira. Kazuya replied to the maid and left the room with Ellen and the others. He he. As soon as the maid who had come to fetch him successfully led Kazuya away, she flashed a bewitching smile, unbeknownst to him. Here we are. Please, come in. As instructed by the maid, Kazuya and the others entered the room, which was dimly lit and filled with a sweet fragrance. What is this room? Or rather, where is Amira? Huh? Master, the Demon King is not here. Moreover, this scent. As Kazuya and the others entered the room, bewildered, Wilhelm, whose keen sense of smell, characteristic of his werewolf heritage, had detected the anomaly first. Oh my, already caught on, have you? Well, it can't be helped. Sleep. However, before Wilhelm could finish his warning, a woman emerged from the depths of the dimly lit room and, uttering those words, with a bewitching gleam in her eyes, caused the guards. Members of the bodyguard, to collapse to the floor with a thud. What? Hey, are you okay? Oh? Two still remain, quite commendable to withstand my magic eye, but futile. Sleep. Ark. M. Master. What? M. Master. Please. Run. L. Wilhelm. Damn it. L. and Wilhelm almost fell to the floor like the members of the SS, but they held their ground and resisted the effect of the evil eye that the woman shot but when they were hit by the evil eye for the second time. Finally, sleep got the better of him and he collapsed on the floor.
just like a member of the SS. Now, there are no more troublesome people, he he. Then, Mr. President, let's have some fun with us. The woman who stepped forward from the darkness where she had been hiding and finally appeared in front of Kazuya, Melchior Digitalis, the leader of the Succubus clan, smiled like a carnivorous beast facing its prey and said to Kazuya, Are you sure? Zykatlis, the Succubus chief. He pulled out the 57 and M1911, Colt government from the two holsters he wore on his waist, and pointed the gun at Melchior and the skilled succubi that appeared from various places in the room, including the one who had peeked at the mansion of demons. While doing so, Kazuya asked Melchior, Chi, I'm surrounded, exclamation mark it looks like the door behind me is locked, and the maid acting as a guide is standing in the way. What will you do? Will you force your way through? Ah. I'm glad that His Excellency the Führer remembers my name, but once again, the succubus is the head of the tribe, Melchior Digitalis. From now on, I'm fine. Melchior smiled and lowered her head, emphasizing her bouncing breasts and showing them off to Kazuya. You don't need to say hello, just talk normally. So, what are you doing to me? Or more importantly, what did you do to Ellen and the others? Oh, really? Then I'll take your word for it. Ah. You don't have to worry about those kids, I just used my evil eye to make them sleep until the thing is over. What? What are you planning? I can't believe you're planning something, he he he, if there's a male and a female, there's only one thing they can do, right? Melchior said that with a lewd smile and together with the other succubi closed the distance between her and Kazuya. Don't move. I'm sorry, but I have no intention of holding you. Huh. It's a shame for a man not to eat a set meal, right? Come on. Hurry up and put down that filthy thing and do something pleasant with us, okay? Oops, question mark. Huh? Gua? Ah, he he, I fell. The moment he blinked, the distance between them suddenly closed and their noses touched, and Kazuya, who was met by the mesmerizing evil eye, let out a groan and sank into Melchior's soft chest. Now, let's cut His Excellency the Fuhrer with our bodies. It was easy though, wasn't it? Well, that's fine. Now we'll let this man drown in our bodies and control Parabem from behind the scenes. Aha! I have to be careful not to overdo it. Yes, Melchior Sama. With Kazuya in her hands, Melchior spoke in a loud voice to the succubi who were especially selected among her subordinates, and disappeared into the back room. Dash 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 dash. After receiving a report from the maid who was entrusted with Kazuya's care that Kazuya had disappeared from the room. Amira had a bad feeling and hurried to Melchior's room. Melchior, don't reply. Dot HMPH. No matter how many times she calls, Amira gets anxious and slams the locked door of Melchior's private room. Exclamation mark she kicked her way into the room. She, exclamation mark it was late, exclamation mark. Amira instantly realized what had happened due to the lewd smell that filled the room and the aroma of the aphrodisiac incense that had been burnt. It would be bad. I don't want to think about it, but what if Kazuya had been defeated by Melchior? Or worse, what if Chitas found out about this? Where is Melchior? I know you're here, don't answer me. Frustrated by the lack of response from Melchior, Amira slowly moves through the room and opens the door to the room at the far end. Uck, huh? What's going on here? As soon as Amira opened the door, a very strong smell wafted from inside the room. Amira frowned at the so strong stench that it almost made her choke, and her eyes widened in surprise as she looked inside the room. Ah, uh, ha, ah, uh, he, it's the best. Ah, uh, no. No, I can't go in that much. A, A, Myra, just like the other succubi whose bodies were twitching as they experienced excessive pleasure that exceeded their tolerance, Melchior, whose beautiful beauty was covered in cloudy liquid noticed Amira's presence with empty eyes and let out the hoarse voice. Why are you okay? Melchior, what the hell happened? Due to the unexpected event, Amira forgot that she had come to rescue Kazuya and punish Melchior, and lifted up Melchior, who was in a mess. Ah, ha ha, I was going to drop it. But it was dropped. What? Ah, uh, no more. We have become that person's thing. Slave. Melchior lost consciousness after saying that with a joyful expression that made her feel truly fulfilled. Melchior? Melchior? Huh? Ha! Huh. I guess I just lost my mind. Amira was shocked when she saw Melchior lose consciousness and thought she had died for a moment, 
But when she realized that Melchior had simply lost consciousness, she let out an exasperated sigh. By the way, did Kazuya do this? Amira blushed as she noticed that her underwear had become slightly wet due to inhaling the aphrodisiac incense that Melchior had burned and the grassy smell, but she saw the dozens of succubi lying dead in the room. I looked over and was impressed. Ah, I'm tired. Did you defeat Melchior and the others? Kazuya returned to the room he was first shown to with Ellen and the others who had woken him up, and took a leisurely shower. Hell, there's no way the magical eye of enchantment would work on me because I have strong mental reinforcement. It was hard to pretend that it did. Even so, I guess I overdid it just because it was a little piling up. I fucked her thoroughly until she begged for forgiveness. But, well, okay. After taking a shower. Kazuya wiped his body and thought back to what had happened just a while ago. He had thoroughly punished Melchior and the others who were drowning in overwhelming pleasure and begging for forgiveness. Or rather, this ability is a side effect of the ability to completely heal. The abilities that were taken away are often similar to brainwashing abilities. What did that Waderer, Tripper, want? Unequaled affair, your energy will increase ten times as much as it does now. You can subordinate the person you hold. Kazuya sat half-naked on a chair, opened a window, and was shocked to see the letters in parentheses, which had been lined up and couldn't be read. I'm back, master. What happened? No. I was a little sweaty so I borrowed a shower. Ha, huh, I see. Kazuya calmly greets Chitters and his friends when they return to their room after discussing the agreement. Acting as if nothing had happened, was the room that hot? Although Chitters was suspicious of Kazuya's appearance, she did not say anything about pursuing him. Volume 03 Chapter 22 Everyone was excited as they took their seats on Air Force One, which was being escorted by an F-22 Raptor to the mainland of Probem. Ahaha. This is so good, it's faster than an empty ship and above all, it's more comfortable to ride. M Mother. Please stop, it's embarrassing. Moo. Mom, please stop Tilda. Everyone is watching. Amira was having fun like a small child while folding and raising the soft and comfortable reclining seat over and over again, while Finn and Ryan, whose faces turned red, felt the warm gaze of those around them and shrank back in embarrassment. Utter a complaint. Princess, I've said this many times, but I want you to avoid anything that could become a diplomatic issue princess, are you listening to me? Princess? Wow, that's amazing, the clouds are solo. H princess? Um. Captain, there's no point in saying anything to the princess now, it seems like that, Sai. How should I explain it to his majesty? Things were good until she boarded the ship of the line with Karen's subordinate Maria to stop Iris and Karen from going out of control, but in the end, Faris was useless and allowed them to go out of control. And now Faris is more of a maid than an escort for Iris. The two Berettas ignored the sermon and looked at Iris in resignation as she stared out the window at the sea of clouds spreading far below. Karen Sama, did you understand? I understand, it was my fault. If that's the case, that's fine. Please refrain from taking such careless actions in the future. Yes, yes, I know, but it can't be helped. I was worried about Kazuya. Did you say something? Huh. It's nothing. Just talking to myself. Is that so? Karen looks out the window with an unfaithful look on her face after hearing endless nagging from her subordinate Maria about her reckless behavior. It's kind of chaotic. Kazuya had this impression when he caught a glimpse of the VIPs of the Canary Kingdom and the demon allied powers and their officials sitting in the back seats on the other side of the partition wall and curtains. So, Master. Master? Chitters calls out to Kazuya who was too distracted by what was being said, with a troubled look on her face. Oh, what's wrong? So please confirm your plans after arriving on the mainland. That's right, um, returning to the topic, cause you you look down at the tablet held in Chitters's hand. Yeah, no problem, I got it. After checking his plans for arriving on the mainland and making sure there were no problems, cause you you reached for the drink that had been prepared for him. Now that I think about it, Master, it seems like you had a lot of fun with the succubi by the other day. Chitters drops a bomb just as Kazuya is completely relaxed. Buuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuu
Z. Kazuya coughed repeatedly as he choked on the drink he was holding in his mouth. Why did you find out? Question mark. I should have told Ellen the others who were there to be quiet. Exclamation mark. Desperately thinking in confusion and disorganized thoughts, Kazuya was looking for an excuse to get out of the dead place that suddenly came to him. So I received a letter like this from the succubi. At that time, when Kazuya was confronted with a letter handed to him by Chittas, to put it simply, a love letter filled with lust from the succubi and a letter reminiscing about those days, Kazuya realized that he could no longer escape. He starts making excuses to calm Chittas' anger, even just a little. Eh no, that's not what I wanted at all. Chittas? Chittas snuggles into Kazuya's chest as he answers hesitantly, dripping with cold sweat. Master, please don't abandon me. Chittas? What happened? Chittas, who normally would question him about having had an affair with another woman with dark, sallow eyes and act based on jealousy and passion, looks up at Kazuya with weak trembling eyes. Chittas's unexpected actions and attitude made Kazuya's thoughts even more confused. Many women are starting to gather around my master. I'm worried that someday my master will get tired of him and abandon me. Chittas. Kazuya senses a gap in Chittas's unusually weak appearance, and her heart flutters as she gently hugs Chittas to reassure her. You're mine. I'm not going to get tired of you or throw you away. R. Master Chittas clung to Kazuya with tears in her eyes as she heard Kazuya's words, as planned. Your husband will never give it to anyone. However, Kazuya didn't notice the evil smile on Chittas's lips as she buried her face in her chest. So, uh, I wonder how long the two of them hugged each other, and when they were about to arrive on the mainland, Chittas reached for Kazuya's pants. <laughs> One thousand years old? Over and over again. Chittas relentlessly strokes Kazuya's butt over his pants in a manner reminiscent of Nanny's, TCH, Chittas, it's a bit bad. Master, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, question mark, I feel sorry for you, question mark. Oh, question mark, I feel sorry for you, question mark. The sexual desire that had built up after Kazuya removed Yagami exploded because she was surrounded by Kazuya's scent. Wow, I didn't expect this either. Hold on, I can't. Chittas's face was flushed with lust and she mouthed the words of apology, but she didn't try to stop. Twenty minutes left until Purubim mainland. Everyone, please look at the sea. Wait. Chittas doesn't taste good here. Just wait till you get to the mainland. Kazuya is afraid of being noticed by those around him, and is panicking. As the in-flight announcement announces his arrival and the plane descends to a low altitude. I am sorry, I've reached the limit of my patience. Besides, it's separated by a curtain. I'll do it verbally first, so the people behind me won't know. What does first of all mean? Question mark. Everyone is so excited. Question mark. The maids sitting around Kazuya and Chittas in the front seats are leaning over and looking at the event that is about to take place, and that's when Chittas, in contrast to the flustered Kazuya, put her hand on the zipper of Kazuya's pants, her eyes filled with lust and her breath filled with hot air. A cheer went up from the back seat, followed by the sound of thudding footsteps. Chi! Exclamation mark I was almost there, but something got in the way! Exclamation mark! Chittas gathered up what little sense of reason she had left, managed to suppress her sexual desire, straightened her disheveled uniform, and sat back down in her chair, barely safe, exclamation mark it was dangerous, I was completely chilled, Kazuya, what is that floating above the sea, at the same time that Chittas corrected her messy clothes and sat back in her chair, an excited Amira led everyone in threw open the curtains and crashed into the front seat where Kazuya and the others were sitting. Oh, R, R, that's a ship from our navy or something. What Amira is talking about is the sight of Purubim's navy and other ships gathered together, just like when Karen came to Purubim's mainland. Unlike the last time, they were currently conducting actual combat training for the counteroffensive operation scheduled for a few months later. So each ship was moving vigorously and actively firing blank cannons and mock bullets. As a result, the ocean's glittering reflections of sunlight are marked by the wakes of ships, 
and the white smoke from blank gunfire and mock bullets is blown away by the wind. Wow, you've managed to get all these. While asking Kazuya for an explanation, Amira pressed her face against the window and gazed at the large fleet moving around below with sparkling eyes. Hey, Kazuya, it seems like the number has increased since the last time I visited the mainland of Parabem. R. Back then there were a lot of ships docked for renovation. That must be the reason. Unlike the previous situation, the ships are moving without any care. But Karen notices that there is a difference in the number of ships, especially the large ships, and asks Kazuya. I don't mind asking people who are interested to go and see it later, but just to give you a brief explanation, there are over 50 battleships, old and new, over 150 aircraft carriers, cruisers, destroyers, etc., I can't even count the number of people I've been on ships with. After all, there are even dreadnought battleships. I don't really get it, but it looks amazing. Simply put, the fleet below us can crush 10 to 20 small countries. Dot. Amira and the other members of the Demon Allied Powers are once again reminded of Purubim's unfathomable power as Kazuya calmly utters these terrifying words. Also, Karen and the others on the Canary Kingdom side, who had some understanding but were criticized for their lack of understanding, came to the same idea as Amira and the others. No matter what the circumstances are, if Kazuya or Purubim were to become an enemy, what would await them would be a lukewarm, one-sided massacre. Why did you suddenly become so quiet? No, it's nothing. Please don't worry about it. Amira and Karen were thinking with serious faces, and Kazuya was just twisting his head. Dash 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 dash. Okay, everyone, I'll assign you a guide so you can go wherever you like. This visit was originally made possible because Kazuya had to return to the mainland for various reasons, and Amira said she wanted to see what the mainland of Purubim was like. I, I was shown it before. So, if I don't get in the way of Kazuya, I'd like to be by Kazuya's side. Should I assign a suitable officer to act as a guide and show them the places I like? That's what Kazuya thought, but the girls scoffed at that idea. Ah. Anichan is so sneaky, she's trying to sneak away, in our line. I am just, Finn, who has been to the mainland of Parabem before, is the first to say something like that, and her younger sister Ryan takes issue with it, I've seen it before, so it's no big deal. I'd like you to wait nearby until Kazuya finishes his business, Karen says she will wait, but she tries to stay by her side if she likes. I'm on your brother's side. Iris clings to Kazuya's arm and declares as if to oppose Fine and Karen. Then, I guess I'll go with Kazuya too. Amira, who was the reason for this visit, unexpectedly made a comment that nullified the meaning of the visit. Then what did you come here for? I don't mind if you come with me, but it won't be fun if you come, right? Although taken aback by Amira's statement, Kazuya gives everyone permission to accompany them. Oh, master. Um, Chitters, with an excited face, was cornered and let out a desperate voice. Ah, that's right. Kazuya, who was worried about Chitters' appearance on the edge of her limit, set certain conditions for everyone. Then, you can all come with me, but I have a car ready for you, so just get in and follow me. That's it. I'd rather have a car with my brother. Boo -oo -oo -oo. Me too. Iris and Ryan protest against Kazuya's conditions. Princess, don't bother Kazuya too much. Line, be patient. Ah, I understand. Okay. If you're too selfish, Kazuya will hate you. Phyllis said in a whisper, and Iris reluctantly nodded. Ryan looked dissatisfied with Amira's words, but obediently obeyed. Then let's go. Kazuya called out to everyone, relieved that everyone else, except for Iris and Ryan, who complained, nodded firmly. Oh, that's Seltz's place. What are you planning to do by bringing him to the mainland? Just before getting into the car, I caught a glimpse of the women of the Seltz clan that Kazuya had recruited from the spare plane that was flying with Air Force One, and were being loaded onto the large bus that had been prepared with worried expressions on their faces. Amira was alone in wonder. By the way, I would like to add that the Cadillac presidential limousine that Kazuya and Chitters were riding in was shaking unnaturally until they arrived at Kazuya's destination. Dash 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 dash. Amira and her friends arrive at Kazuya's destination, Kazuya's private residence on the mainland of Brubham, and are stunned when they enter. Father Toto-sama. Father, Nissan. Anai-sama. Big brother, New-o. Hey, wait a minute. It's that much Gika, 
A crowd of children was waiting inside the mansion for Kazuya to return. Nah, g ha, don't stand on my stomach. Kazuya is being mangled by a large number of children of completely different races, genders, and ages. Master? Hey, you guys. Wow. Mom got mad. Chitters hurriedly rescues Kazuya, who was pushed down and buried by the children. Kazuya is the father and Chitters is the mother? What on earth does this mean? As if to represent the doubts that everyone had. Karen asks Kazuya, who is still overwhelmed by the children. Aoki, ah. These kids are. Kazuya, who was freed from the children by Chitters's hands, answered Karen and the other's questions while brushing off the dust from his clothes. Orphan? At Kazuya's reply, everyone tilted their heads and listened in unison. Ah, that's right. I've seen them all over the place from time to time, but... I just can't seem to leave them alone, so I end up picking them up. Well, there are people other than orphans though. Without saying it out loud, Kazuya murmurs in his heart. At Kazuya's house are boys and girls that Kazuya picked up for various reasons. They were mainly orphans. But in addition, there were or died children who were persecuted in the Canary Kingdom and other children who were persecuted for various reasons. Dot. While everyone was silently looking at the children, Iris had a complicated smile on her face when she saw a girl with the same odd eyes as herself. Dot. Ah. Uh, brother? Yeah? No. It's nothing. Kazuya notices Iris and pats her head silently, and Iris is about to say something. However, when Iris met Kazuya's eyes, she lowered her eyes and closed her mouth, just reveling in the warmth of Kazuya's hand. Dash 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 dash. Then it's time, so let's eat some food, okay? Everyone will eat it too, right? Yes. Yeah, of course, I'll take advantage of your kindness. I'll have it. Yeah, after the children's cheerful replies, Kazuya asked Tyrus and the others, and they all nodded as if it were natural. Then let's go. Amira and the others followed behind Kazuya who was led by the children's hands. However, this casual suggestion from Kazuya becomes the starting point for later problems. <laughs> What's wrong, Cray Eyes? That was when Kazuya was eating while chatting with everyone. Cray Eyes, a young girl who was persecuted and kicked out of the winged village simply because her normally black wings were pure white, walks up to Kazuya's side, her mouth moving. What? <laughs> Cray ignores Kazuya's question and locks his lips with Kazuya's. Amira and the others were at a loss for words as they chatted and ate while seeing Kreis's unexpected behavior. Without uttering a single sound, I froze as I watched Kazuya and Kreis kiss. <laughs> Dot. Gulp. Phew. What's going on? Kray eyes. Kazuya was forced to eat the soft and small pieces of meat that Kray eyes had chewed. Nfu fufu. It's nothing. Yes, father. Kray eyes said as he handed Kazuya the meat he took from Kazuya's plate with a fork. A. R. R. Although confused, Kazuya took a bite of the meat that Cray Eyes offered him. Yeah, it's delicious. <laughs> However, Cray steals Kazuya's mouth again as he chews the meat and expresses his impressions after eating it. Jeru, Jeru, exclamation mark. There was a definite difference between this kiss and the kiss from earlier. It was Cray slurping up the meat that Kazuya was chewing. <laughs> ha, thank you for the meal, Father. A. Eh? Ah. After eating all the meat from Kazuya's mouth, Cray Eyes told Kazuya with a smile, then quickly glanced triumphantly at Amira and the others who were still stiff, then flapped his wings with satisfaction and returned to his seat with dignity. I said, I somehow have a bad feeling about it. Kazuya, who didn't know what Cray Eyes' actions from earlier meant, thought it was a child's prank, but when he saw Amira and the others' faces, he realized that it must have some meaning. Dot, that girl will do it. Amira and the others were simply horrified as they were shown the winged tribe's wedding ceremony in front of their eyes. By the way, the wedding ritual of the winged race was originally for a man to feed the woman he is interested in by mouth to mouth, and I will continue to feed you. So let's be together. If the woman accepts the food, she swallows it, and as a final response, she returns the food from mouth to mouth, just like the man would. In addition, if they use magic at this time to make a pact called Unbreakable Fellowship, they will never be able to part, no matter what, because of such a powerful pact. It usually ends with just a word of mouth agreement, but just now, no one noticed that Grey Eyes had secretly used magic to unilaterally exchange the Unbreakable Fellowship with Kazuya. 
There wasn't. Volume 03 Chapter 23 A room in the royal castle of the Canary Kingdom where various magic potions, their ingredients, and the tools needed to mix magic potions are stored. Iris and Iris' personal maid were in the room, which had been emptied as part of their study of magic medicine. H Princess. Um, I prepared everything you told me to do, but thank you. Oh, ah. Uh, what exactly are you planning on doing? That's. It's a secret. You can leave now. Oh, ah, uh, that princess? Willis, I say it again. Stand back. Oh, and don't tell anyone about this. Yes, I understand. Iris forcibly made her maid, who had been giving me a concerned look, back down and smiled fearlessly in the room where she was left alone. Aha, aha ha ha. Now that we have all the ingredients, all that's left is to mix them properly. Please wait, brother. Thinking of Kazuya. Iris picks up the various materials the maid has prepared and begins mixing them to make something. Um, this is, like this. Iris read the forbidden book she took out from the bookshelf in the corner of the room with a serious look on her face. Then, while staring at a book that has been banned for some reason, he grinds, melts, and mixes the ingredients, and the wyvern's beard. Phew. Let's check it out here for now. Iris was just one step away from completing something so she decided to check out the results of her synthesis. Yes, please drink. Iris transferred a poisonous colored liquid that looked like a mixture of dozens of different paints from a transparent bottle to another container and gave the liquid to the rats she had prepared for the test. Dot. Wow. That's amazing. But I think it's a little too effective. Really? Iris was worried for a moment when she saw that the mouse that drank the liquid had a better effect than expected but she quickly stopped worrying and returned to her work. Please add my blood at the end. Iris picks up a small knife and cuts her finger, then drops a drop of her own blood into the bottle. Pochin. The moment Iris' blood fell into the bottle and mixed, the poisonous liquid suddenly turned colorless and transparent. It's done. Now all I have to do is make my brother drink this. He he. He he he. Iris was immersed in the joy of being alone, with an uncontrollable smile on her lips filled with desire and intoxicated with a sense of accomplishment as she was able to achieve her goal, Jeruri, now, let's go get your brother. After wiping the drool from her mouth and tidying up the room and destroying all the evidence, Iris holds on to something she made herself like a treasure, in order to capture Kazuya, who is currently visiting the royal castle of the Canary Kingdom on business. After finishing his business, he cheerfully left the room. Chew. Chew Tilda? and in the empty room where Iris was gone, the rat that had been made to drink liquid by Iris was covering the female rat with bloodshot eyes and shaking its hips vigorously. Volume 03 Chapter 24 Amidst the potent support of Brubham, the fortress city of Karen, once scarred by the ravages of war, now thrived as a bustling trade hub with Brubham, its wounds healed and all but forgotten. In the urban districts, residents reveled in cheerful laughter and enjoyed peaceful lives, while in the commercial areas, shrewd merchants enticed by the allure of wealth vied to acquire as many Purubim exclusive exports as possible. However, contrary to the tranquil atmosphere pervading the town below, an air of unease lingered within the most crucial precinct of the fortress city, the stronghold of Karen. The maids scurried about attending to their duties, and the guards, their countenances unusually severe, exuded a palpable sense of tension. Meanwhile, Duke Karen Lautrec, who held sway over this fortress city, sat in his chamber, his head in his hands, visibly distressed. Karen armor, are you truly intending to proceed with this, if you're in such turmoil, enough. Stop pestering me, I cannot afford to be outdone by that insipid princess. Even now, I'm lagging behind. If I continue to idly stand by, I'll lose my place by Kazuya's side. Karen retorted vehemently to Maria's counsel, her mind consumed with determination. Yet. What should I do? Perhaps I must resort to that again. There seems to be no other path. Upon hearing the news that Iris had become Kazuya's, Karen, realizing she was late to act, frantically utilized every connection at her disposal and pulled strings in various directions. She succeeded in precisely timing her invitation of Kazuya to a reconstruction commemoration party held in a fortress city. During the party or shortly after its conclusion, Karen was planning a daring scheme to capture Kazuya's heart. However, 
At the last moment, her determination wavered due to a surge of embarrassment, leaving her in a state of indecision. Ah, Karen's armor, it's fine to ponder, but the Supreme Chancellor will be arriving shortly, Maria sighed, exasperated by Karen's endless loop of thoughts, as she informed her of the impending time constraint. Eh, what are you saying, Maria, there's still time. Wait, is it? Already this late, lost in her thoughts and worries, Karen was abruptly brought back to reality by Maria's reminder. Why didn't you tell me earlier? Maria, sigh. I've called out to you several times already. Relying on the help of the maids, Karen hastily prepared herself, her agitation evident as she protested through tear-filled eyes. <laughs> Looks like they've arrived. Ignoring Karen's protests, Maria glanced out the castle window. Noticing the VH-60N presidential hawk soaring through the twilight sky. You all, hurry up. Yes, mom. Surrounded by escorting AH-64D Apache longbows and Mi-24-35 Mkii Super Hinds, with F-22 Raptors and F-35B Lightning is flying overhead. The imposing security formation approached the castle, prompting Karen to hasten her preparations with further urgency. So... Karen Sama, what about the plan we discussed? We're going through with it. I'm all in at this point. Understood. Then let's proceed as planned. Karen has changed a lot since meeting Lord Kazuya. She used to rarely smile, often dubbed the Duke of Ice, but now, she laughs more and, above all, seems more vibrant. All right, I'm off. With determination, Karen dashed out of the room to greet Kazuya, while Maria, watching her departure, silently rejoiced at Karen's transformation. Upon the completion of reconstruction efforts, Kazuya descended into the fortified city from the heliport built within the castle, landing from President Hawk's helicopter as if it were a mere stopover. Escort has increased recently, waving at the F-22S and F-35S circling above, urging them to return and instructing the guards standing by to await further orders, cause Yuya couldn't help but sigh at the increased security since the incidents of crashes and assassination attempts. Well, well, if it isn't cause Yuya, Karen appeared, breathing heavily, as if struggling to maintain her composure, just made it in time. Barely, understanding Karen's desperate rush, driven by the necessity not to keep their guests waiting, Unable to afford any setbacks before the commencement of the plan, Kazuya felt relieved as Karen arrived just before he disembarked from the aircraft to welcome him at the heliport. Sorry for the wait, did I keep you waiting? Seeing Karen, who had evidently hurried to maintain her composed appearance, Kazuya was momentarily surprised but quickly smiled at her as if nothing had happened. Oh, not at all. I wasn't waiting long. Let's not linger here, shall we? Let's go this way. Karen. Having caught her breath, responded with a radiant smile to Kazuya's smile and led him by the hand towards the room that would serve as the party venue. Dressed in splendid gowns, the daughters of nobles and wealthy merchants adorned the party venue, while the mothers of these girls, as ladies of the high society, exuded an enchanting allure. Men watched with smiles, engaging in an underground battle to seize this perfect opportunity. Yes, Baron Balric, that's correct. This is not good. Yes, it's reassuring to hear that from your grace. Maintaining a calm demeanor outwardly, Karen felt inwardly anxious as she dealt with the nobles and wealthy merchants who gathered around her like flies, because not far away, surrounded by a multitude of graceful girls and alluring ladies, Kazuya attracted the heated gazes of the girls and the inviting glances of the ladies. Kazuya Sama, you came from a different world, didn't you? I'm quite interested in other worlds. Would you mind telling me about it? Oh, ah, uh, sure. Really? I'm so happy. I I'd like to hear too. So would I. Overwhelmed by the innocent eagerness of the girls, Kazuya found himself nodding involuntarily, prompting other girls around to chime in. As Kazuya hesitated under the pressure from these girls, someone tugged at his sleeve. Your Excellency, if you would be so kind. Would you like to have more? conversations with me tonight, noticing the tug at his sleeve, Kazuya turned to see a lady hiding her mouth behind a fan, sending him flirtatious glances with her dewy eyes, oh, um, though veiled in euphemism, it was evident that Kazuya was taken aback by the nighttime invitation, my, Miss Mardia, skipping the queue is not appropriate, your excellency, I too would like to hear your stories. For instance, about how you injected seed into the princess until she cried and begged for forgiveness. Ha <laughs> ha. Interrupting with a smirk, 
Another lady cut in, laughing coyly. How did you know? Kazuya was astonished by the speed of information transmission among the women, within the social circle. Damn, it can't go on like this. I need to expedite the plan, excuse me for a moment. Huh? R, do you Clotrek? Despite hosting the party, Karen hadn't expected to stay with Kazuya the whole time. Worried that Kazuya might be taken away by other females, Karen pushed through the surrounding nobles and left the party venue with him. Let's start the plan, Maria. I'll prepare in my room, so make sure to bring Kazuya. With a determined expression, Karen informed Maria as soon as they left the venue. Understood, Maria nodded earnestly and returned to the crowded party venue to take Kazuya out. All right, here we go, Karen. Karen hurried to the room, psyching herself up. I feel like a rabbit surrounded by a pack of carnivores. Kazuya thought facing the beautiful girls and women aiming for his power and wealth. Eek, what are you doing? The girl clinging to Kazuya protested as Maria forcefully intervened from behind. My apologies, your grace. A message from Lady Karen. She says the item she promised to show you is ready, so she wants you to come to her room. With a brief apology to the girl, Maria immediately conveyed the message to Kazuya. Show me something. Did she mention that? All right, I'll go right away. Puzzled by something he couldn't recall being mentioned, Kazuya decided it was fine as long as he could get away from this situation. Then, please follow me, and I'll guide you. Having pushed aside the surrounding girls and women, Maria turned on her heel and headed back to Kazuya. A, but. Are you leaving us, Kazuya Sama? Well, yeah, please talk to us more. We'll miss you. As Kazuya tried to follow Maria to avoid being left behind, he found himself held back by the girls around him. I'll be back. Later, feeling exhausted by the transparent intentions of the girls and noble woman, despite their exceptional looks, Kazuya made a vague excuse to leave the scene. Well then, if you feel inclined, please come to my room. I'll be waiting. I'll be waiting for you, Kazuya Sama. R. Ahaha. Got it. Responding with a strained laugh to the love calls of the surrounding women, Kazuya hurriedly followed Maria. Please. This way, having somehow escaped from the party venue, Kazuya was guided to Karen's private room. What does she intend to show by saying she has something to show? Standing in front of Karen's room, Kazuya tilted his head in confusion, but silently followed Maria into the room. Huh. Well, whatever, but it sure is dark. Where's Karen? As Kazuya entered the room, he heard the click of a key being turned from behind, slightly startled by the sound. He relied only on the moonlight coming in through the window to navigate Karen. The moment Kazuya approached the large bed in the room, he was pushed down onto it. Who there? Karen? Yeah, that's right. Instinctively reaching for his holster to draw his gun, Kazuya withdrew his hand and relaxed his body. When he realized it was Karen pinning him down, don't startle me like that, I don't know what kind of prank you're trying to pull. In the middle of his sentence, Kazuya noticed Karen's appearance familiar clothing, and was at a loss for words. Silence fell over the room. Karen, surely not. Yes, that's right. Your thoughts are correct. In an instant, Kazuya understood what Karen wanted from her attire, her resolve, and the mixture of shame and shyness on her face. Certainly, she said next time. But surely not for real. I told you, Kazuya, next time. As if reading Kazuya's thoughts, Karen said. I see, but... MMPH, Nchu, Chu, Nfa, Chu, Churu, Chu, NN, NNN, NN, Luro, Chu, U, Chu, Nfa, Chu, NN, NN. Ha! Do you intend to embarrass a woman? Cutting off Kazuya's attempted denial, Karen silenced him with her lips, provocatively looking at him while unbuttoning his clothes with natural movements. You'll regret this. Kazuya sought one last confirmation from Karen. Do my eyes seem clouded to you? Defiantly smiling in response to Kazuya's confirmation, Karen said, I see, then, Kaya? NNN having obtained confirmation, Kazuya flipped the tables on Karen, covering her instead, and began to act on instinct to make Karen his own. He he, he he he. In their own world, beneath the gentle moonlight, Karen nestled close to Kazuya. Her face filled with joy as she chuckled softly. You seem really happy, Karen. Yes, indeed. After all, it's rare for someone like me, of noble birth, to be able to be with the man I love. Usually, I'd have to marry someone I don't even like due to political reasons. 
but being able to be with the man I love. I'm really happy. With the smile of an innocent child who knows no corruption, Karen said so and hugged Kazuya tightly. I, I see. Blushing at Karen's straightforward words, Kazuya averted his gaze from her as a cover for his embarrassment. Oh, come on. K Karen? He he. There's still plenty of time, right? The night is long. You need to let it all out and make sure to impregnate me properly. Expressing dissatisfaction with Kazuya's reaction by turning her face away, Karen then pounced on him like a carnivorous beast, laughing menacingly as she attacked Kazuya. Volume 03 Chapter 25 After the battle in Bindage, the First Foreign Legion, having crossed the Eel River flowing through the border under orders from headquarters, entered the territory of the Elbaum Principality to gain combat experience. They were reinforced by the 2nd Foreign Legion, equipped with American military gear such as M24 Chaffee light tanks, M4 Sherman medium tanks, M26 Pershing, M36 Jackson, Kalapi, M40 self-propelled guns, M19 anti-aircraft self-propelled guns, etc., and the 3rd Foreign Legion, primarily equipped with Japanese military gear but with a mix of equipment from other countries, including Type 97 medium tanks. Type 3 medium tanks, M26 Pershing, Sherman Firefly, Kalapi, M40 self-propelled guns, M19 anti-aircraft self-propelled guns, along with numerous other units, to occupy the Elbaum Principality. They advanced, driving out the remnants of the Elsa's Magical Empire's forces and Imperial stragglers who had fled from bindage. Seeing the villages and towns devastated and ravaged mercilessly by the Imperial Army, despite the pain it caused them. They continued the fight, using it as fuel from their determination. And now, two weeks later, the First Foreign Legion found themselves besieging approximately 20,000 Imperial troops who had entrenched themselves in the capital city of Cardigan, within the Elbaum Principality, with other units. As per the report from the Harpies, I mean, the Wing Tribe. Harpy and Wing Tribe do look alike, don't they? Well, Harpies have bird like hands and feet while Wing Tribe have wings sprouting from their backs, it's a confusing classification, so it's understandable if you mix them up. Inside the makeshift command tent, Colonel Bell, the commander of the 1st Foreign Legion, couldn't help but make a mental quip as a soldier brought reconnaissance results conducted by flying demons. Excuse me for interrupting the meeting. At that moment, Major Rommel, one of Colonel Bell's subordinates, rushed into the tent. Are they idiots? Colonel Bell, wearing an expression of disbelief, couldn't help but utter those words to Major Rommel, who brought the report in a fluster. Well, they're probably idiots. Major Rommel dutifully responded to Colonel Bell's remark, then cast a pitiful glance toward the Imperial troops holed up in Cardigan from inside the tent. The reason for the two men's exasperation lay in the one-sided demands issued by the Imperial troops entrenched in Cardigan. Immediately lift the siege and prepare our retreat route. If the demands are not met, all residents of Cardigan and the royal family of the Elbaum Principality will be slaughtered. Await our response until tomorrow morning. Do they think we're their champions of justice or something? I hate to say it, but whether the residents or the royal family are killed, it's none of our concern. Well. If we can help them, I'd like to, but whether to spare or kill them depends on the decision of headquarters, or rather, His Excellency. Colonel Bell thought so, and coincidentally, he was staring at the radio operator who was requesting instructions from headquarters along with other unit commanders who were thinking similar thoughts. Understood. Colonel Bell, we have orders from headquarters, no change in target. Colonel Bell is to take command and promptly eliminate the Imperial troops holed up in Cardigan. Furthermore, rescue as many hostages as possible. His Excellency also mentioned that units that achieve significant results will be rewarded with temporary leave and various other rewards. Uck, do I have to take command? Just after the radio operator's report and Colonel Bell, who was inherently lazy, complained about being chosen as the commander. Who? The exclamations of joy from the commanders excluding Colonel Bell, rang out, we get a break, and rewards, let's do this, everyone, after undergoing one training session after another with hardly any breaks, and just when they thought they'd finally been granted leave, the commanders of other units, who had been tired from continuous assignments, sprang out of the tent, filled with determination, 
Are you guys like horses with carrots dangled in front of you? Looking around the suddenly empty and deserted tent, Colonel Bell sighed alone. So, that's the situation, got it? Now, let's move on to the operation briefing. The operation is simple. You lot will infiltrate Cardigan under cover of darkness and eliminate the enemy. The armored battalion will follow as reinforcement, but we won't engage in artillery bombardment to avoid hitting hostages. Well, the enemy mainly consists of infantry armed with swords and spears, so you should be fine even without artillery support. Colonel Bell, having conveyed such a straightforward operation to the commanders of other units that it hardly seemed like a proper plan, then proceeded to brief the infantry units under his command, demons clad in winter gear reminiscent of the former German army, about the outline of the operation. What's wrong, all of you? Just as Colonel Bell was puzzled by the silence of his subordinates, yeah, here, too, the voices of joy erupted explosively. They're celebrating so much even though they haven't achieved any results yet. If they fail to achieve results, they'll probably die of shock. Whether they're delighted to receive leave or not, Colonel Bal gazed warmly at his high-spirited subordinates. These guys are mostly former. Of course, I mean, the former elite forces, more than half of them are genuine vampires. Originally, the infantry unit of the 1st Foreign Legion, which was composed of demons and biased folk who were former slaves, had been half filled with vampires due to Kazuya's antics, with the remaining half being transformed into biased folk like werewolves and tiger folk. Ah, hey, save your excitement for after you achieve results. Ha, huh? operation begins tonight. In your time, do your best. Colonel Bell, addressing his jubilant subordinates, chuckled and left the scene with a grin. Units, all in position, ready to move any time. A bone-chilling cold and pitch-black darkness enveloped the surroundings, and an eerie silence akin to the calm before the storm hung in the air. One hundred seconds until Operation Start. In the command post, Colonel Bell and the other commanders awaited the start of the operation with solemn expressions. The enemy is on the move. They've detected us, it seems they've noticed our movements. In the infantry unit of the 1st Foreign Legion, positioned as planned, a soldier noticed several shadows stirring near the city gate and reported to the squad leader. It's just a change from ambush to assault, don't worry about it, anyway. How much time until the operation starts? 60 seconds. Sir, with the body covered in bristly fur standing on end and a sense of urgency that he couldn't contain any longer. The Wolfman squad leader asked his adjutant, I see, as the time for the operation to start drew nearer, the soldier's bloodlust surged, it's time. Ooh, the enemy forces are on the move, all right, for the cannons, are, what, what's happening, ah, as the soldiers of the Imperial Army attempted to take defensive positions in response to the simultaneous shouts rising from all around, blood sprayed suddenly from their bodies, they're in the sky, there are enemies in the sky. In the darkness, with only the moonlight serving as the sole source of illumination against the pitch black sky, they were there. Hey, don't waste too much ammo. We're going to need it for what's to come. Understood. Led by Lieutenant Albert Georg, a squad of vampire paratroopers, tasked with seizing Cardigan Castle where enemy commanders were believed to be, began their aerial assault, raining bullets down on enemy soldiers on the ground, their wings flapping more vigorously than usual due to the heavy equipment they carried. What are you doing? Shoot them down, it's impossible, they're out of range. Unable to retaliate against the long-range attack, the Imperial Army could only scramble in retreat. Hey, make a hole in the gate for the ground troops. Roger that. Ordered by Lieutenant Georg, the leader of the 1st Foreign Legion Airborne Battalion, to facilitate the subsequent ground forces, soldiers were commanded to destroy the castle gate. Hey, let it rip. The soldier tasked with destroying the gate paused midair, then turned around and fired the panzer force he was carrying. Nine rockets were simultaneously launched towards the castle gate, originally portable anti-aircraft rocket launches. The Panzer Faust had been modified into wide-range anti-ground rocket launches, causing extensive damage not only to the gate but also to nearby enemy soldiers. All right, let's move quickly. Having witnessed the destruction of the gate, the flying squad led by Lieutenant Georg flew towards Cardigan Castle to fulfill their mission. These guys. Damn it. Get the wounded out of here. And, ah, uh, the enemy ground forces approaching. TCH, archers, shoot as soon as the enemy is in range, 
Despite the confusion caused by the surprise attack from the Georg squad, the Imperial soldiers lurking atop the relatively unscathed castle walls noticed the approaching infantry units and drew their bows. Squad 1, follow my lead. Squads 2 and 3, spread out to the left and right. Understood. Having visually confirmed this, the infantry unit leader ordered his subordinates to disperse at an astonishing speed while running, they're coming. Simultaneously with the captain's shout, arrows released by the enemy rained down upon the charging infantry unit, however, due to the exceptional physical abilities, visual acuity, and reflexes of soldiers from the wolf and tiger tribes, the hastily aimed arrows missed their targets, landing fruitlessly on the ground. Squads 2 and 3 Suppressive Fire Following the archers who hurriedly reloaded, the few rifle and artillery troops took aim with their bolt-action rifles and cannon and opened fire on the enemy. With tracer rounds included in every few shots, illuminating the darkness, the concentrated fire hit the castle wall. They're retreating. Now, get them. Under the concentrated artillery fire, five to six enemy soldiers unlucky enough to be hit fell from the top of the castle wall. Observing the enemy soldiers cowering from the flying bullets, the captain, having once again created an earth barrier through the use of magic despite being previously broken, ordered the destruction of the firmly closed castle gate. Understood. Soldiers by the captain's side fired panzer forces towards the castle gate. With the sound of the launch, shaped charges flew towards the gate, hitting it and creating a hole. It's breached again. This is bad. They're going to breach the gate. Hurry. Use magic to create a wall. No use. It's too late. They're coming. Form a dense formation in front of the hole. Don't let any more enemies in. Having destroyed the gate, the enemy forces, further emboldened, surged forward. Unable to fend them off outside the castle, the Imperial soldiers lined up spearmen in front of the breached gate, attempting to block the enemy's entry. Meanwhile, archers and gunmen on the castle walls, facing away from the outside, aimed their bows and rifles at the incoming enemies, preparing to unleash a volley of shots. They're not coming? Ah, however, no one entered through the gate because W what? What's happening? Where? Ah, go, go, go. Kill them all. The destruction of the gate was merely a diversion. Using iron stakes driven into the towering castle walls as footholds, the foreign infantrymen scaled the high walls, catching the imperial soldiers off guard and trampling them. Die, you pigs. Yujiwak gunfire erupted everywhere, mowing down imperial soldiers left and right. Frel, Dyer, Tyree, D don't come. The riffraff is slow. Even the wizards without swords or spears struggled to defeat the enemy with magic, but most of the time, they were either cut down while chanting spells or turned into Swiss cheese by bullets. Magic weapons detected. As the infantry units effortlessly mowed down enemy grunts, battered magical weapons emerged from between the houses. Squad 1, take care of them, roger that. The squad leader, drenched in the enemy's guts, shouted as the members of squad 1 shifted their focus from grunts to magical weapons. Too slow, ha ha ha, like that'll hit us. Despite being showered with magical blasts from the magic cannons, the soldiers of squad 1 dodged left and right swarming around the magical weapons. W where did they go? The pilot of the magical weapon panicked as the enemies who were just in their sights vanished. Installation complete. We're done too. Let's get out of here. The soldiers of squad 1, who had disappeared from the pilot's view, were now perched on the shoulders of the magical weapons. With ease, they planted adhesive mines on the magical weapons and, like hares fleeing from a predator, pulled the detonation cords and distanced themselves from the magical weapons. There, as the pilot of the magical weapon aimed the magic cannon at the retreating soldiers of Squad 1, the adhesive mines that had been set off exploded. Due to Squad 1 soldiers getting carried away and attaching around 10 adhesive mines, the magical weapon exploded, blowing it to smithereens. The gate is secured. The enemy reinforcements incoming. Just when everyone thought they could catch their breath after defeating the magical weapons and wiping out the surrounding enemies, soldiers on perimeter watch shouted as enemy troops swarmed in. All right, Squad 3, stay here and reinforce the armored battalion for cleanup. Squads 1 and 2, break through the enemy lines, advance, and rendezvous with the allies who have infiltrated Cardigan Castle. This is for rest and reward, so stay alive. Roger that. Undaunted by the overwhelming number of enemies, 
The soldiers of the 1st Foreign Legion Infantry eagerly plunged back into the fray, their rifles flashing as they joyfully dove into the flames of battle once again. Here's Cliff Squad. We've taken the lead to Cardigan Castle. Ha ha, the enemy is swarming. It's a free-for-all. TCH, a bit late. Ha, huh. but we'll take the second spot. Grass Squad, engage in combat inside Cardigan Castle. Dot, eradicate the enemy. Protect the residents of Cardigan as much as possible. This is bad. Let's hurry. Roger that. Upon hearing reports of other airborne infantry units achieving success over the radio, Georg's squad increased their flight speed, unable to bear missing out on military achievements. The enemy attack, enemy attack, fire, shoot them down, do they really think they can bring us down with this level of attack? Well, let's get in there. Having arrived above Cardigan Castle, Georg's squad easily bypassed the enemy's feeble interception net, broke through the castle's windows, and successfully infiltrated areas where allies had not yet reached. W who are you? Where Georg's squad had infiltrated was a place resembling a chapel, where the city's residents were crowded together and held at gunpoint by imperial soldiers and on the sacred altar for offering prayers to the gods in the chapel. A young maiden was being stripped of her dress by a middle-aged man, about to be violated. Though tears welled up in her eyes, the young and beautiful woman named Felt Carlton remained silent, glaring defiantly at the man, exposing the small organ, pork cutlet, buried in his belly with an unwavering determination. Kill them. Having quickly assessed the situation after the intrusion, the vampires of Georg's squad swiftly interpreted their leader's intentions and swiftly dispatched imperial soldiers, except for the middle-aged man in a pathetic state. Wah, jah, filth. And the middle-aged man was kicked like a soccer ball by Lieutenant Georg with inhuman strength. Gar, hi you, help. Hey, you scumbag. After bouncing on the ground several times, when his momentum finally stopped, Lieutenant Georg stepped on the head of the Imperial officer, who was now begging for mercy with blood dripping from his mouth, and pressed the muscle of a Luger P08, pulled from his holster, against his forehead. P please. Spare me. Let me teach you something. Any of our prisoners who commit war crimes, especially those attempting what you were about to do, are, without question, subject to torture. With veins bulging on his forehead. Lieutenant Georg grinned maliciously at the enemy officer. Hi ah, tie up this scumbag, roger that. In response to Lieutenant Georg's orders, soldiers nearby swiftly tied up the officer, roughly binding his hands and feet. While observing this with a sidelong glance, Lieutenant Georg approached the woman who had given her name as Felt, distancing himself from her after learning her name, and whispered triumphantly into the radio. Georg's squad here. We've rescued Felt Carlton, the princess of the Album Kingdom, and several civilians. Additionally, we've captured a man believed to be an enemy officer. Copy that. Looks like your squad will be leading in achievements. Informed by the female operator from HQ, Lieutenant Georg gave a thumbs up to his subordinates who were liberating civilians and on perimeter watch. Brimming with joy. Subsequently, with the infantry units following behind and the armored battalion providing backup, the remaining Imperial soldiers within Cardigan Castle were either eradicated or captured, bringing the battle in the Album Kingdom to a close. Volume 03 Chapter 26 Due to Amira's expressed desire to spar with Kazuyu and the prolonged negotiations between Kazuyu and Amira, as well as the bilateral summit extending into the night, Kazuyu and Chitas found themselves staying overnight in the guest room of the Demon Lord's castle. So, if we concede any further, our country will be perceived as a diplomatically inept nation that readily gives in to demands from neighboring countries aside from Canaria and the Demon Clan. While I don't particularly care about prestige, I don't fancy being looked down upon as weak either. Oh well, let's just go along with Chitas's proposal. Understood, sir. As Kazuyu and Chitas finalized their strategy, addressing the issues discussed in the meeting moments ago, there was a knock at the door. Pardon the intrusion at this late hour. Lady Chitters, the Demon Lord personally wishes to speak with you. Would you kindly accompany me? Me? Now? Chitters questioned the summons from Amira with a hint of skepticism. Yes, I apologize for the suddenness. Please, if you would. A maid from the Anna tribe bowed deeply, entreating Chitters. Master Chitters hesitated to leave Kazuya's side, casting a questioning glance at him. Huh? Don't worry about me, just go. Understood. We entrust your safety to you, 
Our masters. Yes, sir. With Kazuya's permission, Chitters left the room with the maid who had come to fetch her. Hey, how far are we going? Are you sure the demon lord is really here? Although Chitters followed the maid, she became increasingly irritated as they ventured further into deserted areas. We'll be there shortly. Please bear with us. With no other choice, Chitters sighed softly, shooting a puzzled look at the maid. This way, pushing open a sturdy iron door, the maid led Chitters into the dimly lit room. It's dark. Hey, why is there a bolt on the door? Damn. Am I being cornered? Surrounded by tiered seating resembling a coliseum, Chitters, upon being led into the indoor training ground, sensed the presence of countless figures lurking in the darkness. She reached for her katana, assuming a defensive stance. I apologize for the deception. However, everything is in order to fulfill the wishes of the demon lord and the princesses. You will remain here for a while. What? You, damn it. Is this what Master aimed for? As if signaled by the maid's words, the lights in the room flickered on, revealing a multitude of demon warriors armed and positioned on the spectator stands. And if Chitters attempted to leave forcibly, it seemed they were prepared to use force to restrain her. Do you even comprehend what you're doing? This is a grave diplomatic issue. Yes, we are fully aware. Oh, and do not worry. We have no intention of harming President Rizal's safety. However, until the wishes of those individuals are fulfilled, before the maid could finish her sentence, a gleaming blade, brimming with murderous intent, descended towards her. G oh no, it's heavy, for a member of the Unit tribe like me to be overpowered, exclamation mark. Blocking Chitters's katana with a concealed rod-shaped weapon, the maid, Dahlia, momentarily stopped the attack, however, overwhelmed by Chitters's formidable strength, she was soon forced to her knees. Do you underestimate me? Gradually increasing the pressure on her arm, Chitters stared at Dahlia with bloodshot eyes. Ark, regardless of your reasons, laying a hand on my master? Oh, he may be a kind person, willing to accept even the demon lord's side, but whether I forgive that is another matter. Ark, no, I can't hold her back any longer. As Chitters exerted even more force than before, the deadlock between her katana and Dahlia's rod weapon began to crumble, with the katana's blade inching closer to Dahlia, a member of the Ulna tribe. Dahlia, take this, noticing the precarious situation, a centaur man familiar to Dahlia swiftly drew his long bow and aimed a blunt tipped arrow towards Chitters to prevent it from piercing her. Hyun! Exclamation mark. Pash! Exclamation mark. It's a lie, right? What? I... I see. Chitters effortlessly caught the arrow with one hand, without even looking once, as it was shot at an incredibly fast speed by an inhuman force. This surprises not only Centaur, who shot the arrow, but also Dahlia, who is about to be killed by the many demons and Chitters. You think I'll get something like this? Gah. Ah, gah. Chitters snapped the arrow she had grabbed and threw it away, and with her free hand grabbed Dahlia's neck and lifted it into the air to show off to the people around her. G G G G G R R. I gasp. I can't. I can't. Exclamation mark. Consciousness. Consciousness. It's no longer possible. Dahlia is struggling in the air with an expression of agony on her face. The surrounding demons try to help Dahlia, but they are unable to move due to the pressure of Chitters's miasma-like aura. However, while she was doing this, the light gradually disappeared from Dahlia's eyes, and her body lost strength and her limbs drooped. <laughs> The demons just watched in amazement as Chitters let go of her hand and dropped the motionless Dahlia onto the dirt floor. Don't worry, you're not dead. However, if you stand in my way any longer, I won't show any mercy. I'll cut them all down, prepare yourself. Hi. The demons were frightened by Chitters's death sentence and retreated all at once. Meanwhile, time rewinds a little and we see Chitters leaving the room, leaving Kazuya behind. Excuse me. S. Excuse me. I, ah, uh, sorry to bother you. Amira and her friends suddenly entered the room where Kazuya was, wearing bold Chinese clothes with less fabric covering their chests and buttocks than usual, exposing their lustrous dark skin. Amira proudly shakes her huge breasts and plump ass, fine turns bright red with shame and desperately stretches out the poor quality fabric that covers her body to hide her private parts, while Ryan acts like a little devil. She smiles sheepishly and shows off her body to Kazuya, which gives off a sense of immorality. R. Ami. R. Amira. What an outfit. Even fit. Fine. And Ryan. What the hell is going on? Ahahaha. 
Because you yeah. It's uncouth to ask that of someone who knows his quirk. Amira folded her arms to emphasize her voluptuous breasts and laughed heartily. Dot. No, well, I know because I came dressed like that. Kazuya knew what Amira and the others had come here for the moment they entered, and secretly sighed inwardly, keeping his mouth shut. Ha, huh, I'm a guy too, so I'm glad that Amira and the others feel that way, but we haven't known each other for a while and I don't think we know each other very well either. So it's a little more. Then why don't we just sit in bed and tell each other everything about each other? Amira answered Kazuya's words with a lewd grin. Are you the perverted old man at the bar? Kazuya's shoulders dropped in shock at Amira's words. Ha, huh, I understand. Everyone, please leave the room. I don't know, it seems like the tags came off after he hugged Iris and Karen. Ever since he made Iris and Karen his own, Kazuya realizes that he has gradually become unable to control his desires, and in order to make Amira's wishes come true, Kazuya tells the maids and the royal guards in the room. Tell them to go outside. Ha. Huh? Understood, yes. Why yes. If it's your order. The SS obeyed Kazuya's orders without moving an eyebrow, but the maids seemed dissatisfied and followed Kazuya's orders with regret. Come here. After confirming that the maids had bowed one last time and left the room, Kazuya invited Amira and the others to the next bedroom. Hee hee. Let's fuck. Kazuya. Come quickly. I'm not in a good mood or depressed. Kazuya shakes his head as Amira and Ryan enter the room and dive into the bed, beckoning Kazuya. Are, hi, uh, are you okay fine? No, it's okay. Kazuya couldn't keep up with the two of them as they dived into the bed, and when he put his arm around Fine's waist and tried to guide her to the bed, Fine, who was standing alone at the entrance to the room, was floundering and shy, and Fine screamed in surprise. Fine, I'll do it. Sister, you're a strategist. What? I, I didn't mean to do that. Amira and Ryan quickly sensed that Kazuya was pointing his finger at Fine, and she was terrified of Fine. I was completely terrified. He he. Now let's leave the banter at an end. Amira changes her aura and transforms into a female leopard aiming for her prey, stealing Kazuya's lips. R, mom is cheating. Ryan kisses Kazuya too. A, R, I, I, I'll do it too. Also, Fine who was left alone rushed towards Kazuya after a moment's hesitation, and so a sweet and fierce time for the four of them began. Momu. Forgive me. Ha, ha, hi. More, more. Ah, good. K Kazuya, I can't fit in that much anymore. Dino, no. By the way, I won't say what, but it was Fine who was the most disturbed. Dash 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 dash. So, why are you doing this all of a sudden? Ha, ha, ha. Ah, that's, well, there's a lot of things going on. After the war ended and the room was filled with a sweet atmosphere, Kazuya covered Finn and Ryan who were fainting with a happy expression, with the foot on, and then asked Amira, whose eyelids were fluttering sleepily, dot. Well, if I had to say it, we're not quiet enough to just sit back and watch the man we like being kidnapped by another woman right in front of us, ha ha, and, in fact, we're all monsters, women are attracted to strong males. They can't resist that instinct. So, let's leave. Amira fell into a deep sleep without telling Kazuya that she was actually in love with him at first sight. I guess you fell asleep. In the end, Kazuya has no choice but to be left out of everything he wants to know. She was gently stroking Amira's head with that expression on her face. A change to the plan. No, I think we need to make some adjustments. The person who was standing in front of the bedroom door quietly entered the bedroom to ask Kazuya to take responsibility for his flushed body. Volume 03 Chapter 27 Prabham, a military nation composed of numerous islands centered around the mainland. One of these islands, situated 20 kilometers away from the Prabham mainland, housed a newly established prisoner of war facility to address security concerns and the increasing number of captives, dubbed as the Prison Island. It was fortified like the others, but half of the weapons installed were inward-facing due to operational reasons. Within the impregnable prison island, former soldiers of the Elza's magic empire, now Parabim's prisoners, toiled day and night for the nation. What's going on here? With the decision to consolidate prisoner management on the prison island to efficiently handle the growing population of over 130,000 captives, Adele 
who had been transferred to this island following the closure of prisoner facilities on the Purubim mainland and various spaces, found herself gaping at the unexpected scene within the prisoner of war facility as she was being escorted to her cell. Despite being in transit, she halted in the middle of the corridor, her mouth agape, originally housed in a special facility due to her status as a wandering hero. Adele had never witnessed how other prisoners were treated. Thus, she had assumed that prisoners were enslaved, deprived of their freedom, men subjected to harsh labor from dawn to dusk, and women enduring days of shame. However, contrary to Adele's expectations, the prisoners, though enslaved with collars, appeared healthy, wore clean clothes, and worked with joyful diligence, sporting refreshing smiles. Unable to comprehend the scene before her, Adele remained frozen for a while. Hey, don't stop, keep moving. A guard's voice snapped Adele back to reality. Startled, Adele resumed walking, the clinking of special handcuffs and leg irons accompanying her every step, while ten guards kept their guns drained on her, encircling her. Hey, about those people I saw earlier, keep quiet and keep walking. The guard interrupted sharply. Adele, who had intended to inquire about the prisoners she had seen earlier, was silenced by the soldier's stern response. What in the world is going on? In my world and the world I came from, when captured in war, men are either killed or enslaved, and women are either used for comfort and then killed or enslaved. Yet, why are they treating these people with such kindness? Could they still not be enslaved? No, they were wearing collars, so they must be enslaved. But, they were dressed well, and they didn't seem malnourished at all. And there weren't any women in the place I saw earlier, it seemed like only men were receiving such treatment. It's a mystery, as Adele walked the long path to her cell, she pondered over the slaves. Stop, this is it, a guard announced as they arrived at a special cell engraved with a spell that rendered magic unusable. Get in. Adele's handcuffs were removed, and she was ushered into the cell beginning her solitary and quiet life within. After spending about two months confined to a cell at the lowest level of the prison island, Adele, without seeing anyone or engaging in conversation, was visited by someone. What? What do you want? Adele spoke, a hint of hesitation in his voice, breaking the monotony of his days spent eating and sleeping. It's just a little checkup and a small matter, cause you you're accompanied by Cecilia, who was wearing restraining garments, and Chittis, who kept her hand on the hilt of her sword, stood in front of Adele's cell. You've seen enough, just leave already, Adele retorted. You, what's with that attitude toward Master Kazuya? Chittis snapped, while Cecilia lowered her brows at Adele's demeanor. Well, I am leaving, but there's something to discuss before I go, Kazuya said, with a wry smile, scratching his cheek as he spoke to Adele. Underscore having moved to another room from Adele's cell, Kazuya, with Cecilia and Chitta standing behind him, began the conversation. So, you want me to assist with your research? Adele asked. Yeah, that's right. Our research on magic and mana hasn't been progressing well, and we need your assistance because of your vast mana reserves and expertise in magic, Kazuya explained. What? Why you need me? W what nonsense are you saying? Adele's face flushed like an apple at Kazuya's words. Huh? Wait a minute. You weren't affected by the side effects of my complete healing ability, were you? Kazuya questioned. W what? Oh, right. Your shoddy brainwashing magic doesn't affect me. Adele panicked internally, realizing the consequences if his feelings were exposed. Underscore the reason Adele, deemed the most important detainee on the prison island was incarcerated was because, despite being a hero, he wasn't affected by the side effects of Kazuya's complete healing ability. However, that wasn't the end of the story. This was a secret known only to Adele. He hadn't been affected by the side effects of Kazuya's complete healing ability for about a month after receiving healing. Now, however, during each healing session, the mana flowing from Kazuya was corroding Adele's mind and soul like a vicious pathogen. Right? It's been hypothesized that individuals with greater mana are less likely to experience the side effects of the complete healing ability, cause Yuya said, I'm telling the truth. Adele, still blushing furiously, spoke forcefully, trying to conceal his feelings. Underscore now then, let's see, cause Yuya leaned in closer to Adele, his hands resting on Adele's cheeks, peering into his clear blue eyes. 
W what the heck? Adele's face turned as red as a boiled octopus, reacting like a bashful maiden. Hey, I don't want to believe it, but Adele, you, Kazuya trailed off, trying to confirm Adele's feelings. S Street, stop it. Stop it already. I don't. I don't like you or anything. It's true. I don't get nervous when I see you, or feel my heart racing when I think about you or anything like that. Adele stammered, flustered and embarrassed. Wait. He didn't even ask if I liked him yet. Also, stop blowing this up. Unable to escape Kazuya's gaze while restrained in the chair, Adele's embarrassment led to self-sabotage. He hey, Adele has finally come to appreciate the greatness of Master Kazuya. Cecilia chuckled, watching Adele squirm in embarrassment. Underscore. Setting that aside, let's get back to the main topic, Kazuya said, noticing Adele's discomfort and self-awareness, as if silently begging to be put out of his misery. Understood. Let's just get this over with, Adele urged, bowing his head as if to say, just finish already, all right. So, if you agree to this matter, Kazuya began, presenting his conditions. Adele nodded in agreement. Thanks to Adele's willingness to cooperate with Kazuya's proposed conditions, research on Parabem's magic and the mana saw a remarkable leap forward, resolving any previous stagnation. I fulfilled my promise, now it's your turn to do the same. Adele, still dwelling on that, despite her flaws in action and thought, Cecilia, the head researcher of Parabem due to her competence as a mage and loyalty to Kazuya, looked at Adele with a mix of disbelief and annoyance. Cecilia, please stay quiet. Initially, Adele harbored resentment towards Cecilia for being stabbed, but with each interaction and conversation, any animosity seemed to dissipate, and now they interacted as they did before. I understand, Chitters. Master, are you absolutely sure? As Kazuya attempted to fulfill his promise to Adele, Chitters sought confirmation. Just to be sure, a promise is a promise. Understood. Confirming Kazuya's unwavering intent, Chitters proceeded to carry out his orders. Thirty minutes later, in the multi-purpose hall on the prison island, as all the female prisoners were gathered, Kazuya addressed them through the microphone handed to him by Chitters. Well then. Under the name of Nagato Kazuya, I hereby liberate all slaves present here. With Kazuya's words echoing through the hall via the microphone, the efficacy of the enslavement collars worn by the female prisoners was nullified. Consequently, the seams held by magic were naturally undone, and the collars fell to the ground with a soft thud. Thus, Kazuya's condition to Adele was the liberation of all female prisoners held by Purabem. I fulfilled my promise. Yes, watching the women, now free from their enslavement collars, Adele nodded firmly. What's wrong? Suddenly, Adele noticed something. It was the absence of cheers from the women, who should have been rejoicing in their newfound freedom. What's going on? Why aren't they celebrating? No cheers were heard. Instead, the women remained motionless, their gaze fixed solely on Kazuya standing on the platform. Huh? What? Is this? He he he. Despite being freed from slavery, the women who had been staring at Kazuya suddenly bent their knees and bowed deeply toward Kazuya, which confused Adele, Kazuya, and Chitters, and made Celestia look deeply saddened. He was laughing. Our Lord, our God, we willingly offer you every drop of our blood, every single piece of our soul, and protect you until this life, this soul, is completely destroyed. I hereby swear to be slave, subordinate, and obedient only to you. In unison, the women say the vows like devout believers praying to God, etching the words in their hearts and souls so that they will never fade. Dot. Kazuya and Adele are speechless at the oath filled with madness and loyalty. Wow. He he he. Chitters let out a voice that sounded a little impressed by their oath, and Celestia narrowed her eyes and smiled at the women as if to say they had done a good job. Hey, what the hell is this? No, I don't know what's going on. Adele. Kazuya Sama hasn't done anything. Seri Dotsia? He he. Actually, after hearing my story, they all changed their minds and became believers who worship Kazuya Sama as a god. A shocking truth is told from Celestia's mouth. They have all abandoned the teachings of Raonism and worshipped the teachings I preached to Kazuya Sama as the only absolute thing. And they worshipped Kazuya Sama as a god, so to speak, and devoted their bodies, hearts, and souls to him. They are divine soldiers who act only according to Kazuya-sama's will, that's it. Then, what on earth do I need? 
corporation, a cult, it was created before I knew it. Kazuya was dumbfounded as he listened to Celestia speak loudly, most of the female prisoners were nuns captured during battles in fortified cities, and they were originally deeply religious, but were converted by their superior, the chief priest, Celestia, to follow the teachings of Lonism, it is Egeo that has strengthened my faith since then, there were also female soldiers, female knights, and female wizards who had low religious beliefs, but they were taken in by Celestia's sweet talk one after another, and as a result, all of the female captives fanatically swore loyalty to Kazuya. Please don't be so depressed, Adele. That's right. At this time, why don't you pledge your loyalty to Kazuya Sama and become her slave like the girls? I'm sure that's what you really want, too. I, I refuse. Adele, who is confused as various thoughts come and go in her heart, fully understands that if she crosses a line that she should not cross, she will never be able to return to her former self and Celestia offers her to Adele. He refused to take my hand. Adele, sigh. I guess it can't be helped. Sensing that Adele's heart is wavering, Celestia is convinced that she will fall if she pushes just one more step, and uses her hidden powers to drag Adele to her side. If you insist that it doesn't belong to Kazuya-sama, then I'll show this to everyone. Celestia slowly took out a video camera from her pocket and pressed the play button. Then, Adele's image appeared on a small LCD screen next to the video camera. What is that? Judging from the footage, this is probably around the time when Adele accepted Kazuya's conditions and was moved from her cell to a room in a magical research facility. The video progresses as Kazuya, chitters, and Adele stare at the screen. Dot. Wow. Oh, 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 oh. Adele, remembering what she will do next in the video rushes towards Celestia and tries to steal her video camera. Foo fa foo, no. I need Kazuya-sama to take a good look at your honest and embarrassing appearance. Celestia dodged Adele's charge and held Adele down, smiling like a mischievous child. I I swear, I swear loyalty to this guy. Just stop showing it. At the same time as Adele's half-crying screams echoed, Adele in the video was also screaming loudly. Kazuya, Kazuya, Kazuya Kazuya. Kazuya! Exclamation mark! Exclamation mark! R! 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 Adele, who was seen by Kazuya as she was engrossed in her own power generation while calling Kazuya's name, groaned with empty eyes and mouth trembling. Dot. Perhaps considering Adele's state of mind, Kazuya and Chitters looked away as if they didn't know. It's over. Ahaha! I saw it. Adele who was able to see the footage perfectly by Kazuya and Chitas, was stunned, he he. Celestia soaks in that, Adele is. Isn't she? So, yes, but, then, you. Loyalty. Female slave. Service. Yaga. Training. God. So, Celestia takes advantage of Adele's weakened state due to mental damage and continues to speak to her one after another. May I? Wow, Celestia. What did you instill in Adele? Kazuya, who heard some scary words, asked Celestia with a tense face. You fu fu. Celestia didn't answer Kazuya's question and just laughed meaningfully. Dot so scary. As Kazuya trembles in fear at Celestia's attitude, Adele, whose eyes have become stagnate and dark instead of the clear ones she had before, kneels down in front of Kazuya and bows her head. I. I am Kazuya Sama's female Dre. I will dedicate my body and soul to you, and I will comfort you no matter what happens. I will be your mother until I rot away. Kazuya just froze in front of Adele, who had been educated by Celestia's washing. Volume 03, Chapter 28. In Kazuya's office, the only sound echoing was the crisp scratch of his pen moving across paper. Chitters found herself filled with contentment by the mere fact of being alone with Kazuya in his workspace. For the first time in a while, there were no bothersome interruptions from foreign parties, and Kazuya had strictly instructed his subordinates not to enter the room unless it was an emergency. This granted Chitters invaluable moments of peace. R. Bliss. Perhaps due to the relaxation of enjoying the blissful moment alone with Kazuya, Chitters found her pen moving faster than usual, swiftly sorting through documents with an almost imperceptible speed. Few, finally done. Once Chitters finished organizing the stack of documents that had piled up like a mountain, Kazuya, too, completed his own tasks and leaned back in his chair after placing his pen on the desk. Good work, Master Chitters, 
who had been waiting for Kazuya to finish his work like a loyal dog, promptly offered words of encouragement and handed him a drink. R, thanks. So, Chitters, what's next on the agenda? I have nothing scheduled after this, we're done for the day. Oh, right. Then, shall we head home? Yes. With today's work complete, Kazuya headed home to where the children awaited, as they arrived at their mansion and opened the door. The children, who had been eagerly anticipating Kazuya's return, launched their customary ambush. Hey, you guys. As the children's wave engulfed Kazuya, he was knocked out. Mom's mad. Run. We'll get punished. Despite Chitters' attempts to help Kazuya and push back the children crowding around him, they easily slipped past her and hurried away with lively footsteps echoing down the corridor. Ouch. Are you okay, master? Yeah. Somehow. Jeez. They're too energetic. Seeing the children peeking back from around the corner of the hallway with mischievous smiles, Kazuya sighed with an indescribable expression. Are you all right, sir? Any injuries? As Kazuya, with Chitters' assistance, managed to stand up and dust himself off, female elves dressed in maid uniforms gathered around him. Sorry about that, it's all because I just informed everyone of your return. Having been tasked with taking care of the children by Kazuya, the female elves from the Zoltz clan, who had once faced execution but now lived as slaves with significantly better treatment than ordinary slaves in this world, though still enslaved, gathered around Kazuya, fearing they might lose their privileges if they angered him. It's all right, just get back to work. Yes, understood. Relieved that there was no death sentence in Kazuya's words, the elves nodded without hesitation and dispersed to fulfill their duties. It's quite troublesome. Kazuya understood that they were still getting used to their current environment and were apprehensive about their status, constantly watching his every move with nervous eyes, making it difficult for him to establish a comfortable distance with them. Well, there are plenty of subordinates acting as educators, so they'll get used to it eventually. Anyway, let's go to the room for now. Yes, let's. Interrupting his thoughts about the elves, Kazuya led Chitters to their room. Suddenly, as if on cue, a fluttering sound was heard, and a black shadow swiftly darted through the mansion's hallway and dived at Kazuya. Father, Ga, Master, the black shadow, Klaze, with joy evident on her face, pounced on Kazuya, pushing him to the floor. Father, 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 Klaze was. Klaze was lonely. Caught off guard by the surprise attack, Kazuya found himself pinned down forcefully by Klaze, who covered their heads with her pristine untainted wings, creating a private space for just the two of them, and began rubbing their cheeks against his. I can't wait any longer, father, let's go to my room. And, Glaze, what are you doing to the master? Still unable to move, Kazuya was dragged into the room by Glaze, who wanted to become family with him in both name and reality, only to be met with Chitters' his wrath. P.F.F.T. M. Mother, it's too cruel to hit me seriously. H.M.P.H. How many times do I have to tell you, you little flirt, that it's too soon for you? Rubbing her sore head with tears in her eyes, Clay's protested. Ouch, can you go easy on Clay's next time? Finally able to move, cause you you got up. Father, please listen to me, mother is being mean. All right, all right. If it's about that, let's discuss it in my room. Thinking that the conversation might take a while, cause you you stopped Clay's from speaking further. MMM, all right. Let's hurry then, father. Yeah yeah, I got it, so don't rush me. As Kazuya stood up, Clay's immediately clasped Kazuya's hand in a lover's grip, but with a nonchalant expression, he extended his other hand to Chitters. With a voice barely louder than a bug's chirp, Clay's prompted Chitters to take his hand. He he Chitters chuckled softly as she looked at the offered hand, then gently took Clay's hand. Noticing Chitters's small laugh, Clay's sighed discontentedly. But he didn't let go of Chitters's hand, for the sake of these kids, and above all, for the master. Coming to a decision, though not related by blood, while walking down the corridor, laughing together like a real family, Chitters quietly made up her mind and resolved to execute a certain plan. Underscore preparing steadily for the upcoming counter-offensive, Probum was moving forward with its arrangements. Some soldiers were engrossed in training, while others were enjoying what might be their last vacation to the fullest. Meanwhile, 
In various factories, numerous workers toiled day and night, striving tirelessly to keep the production lines running at full capacity, in order to deploy more forces effectively for the counter-offensive. In stark contrast to the increasing noise outside, a remarkably quiet conference room was filled with Purubim's high-ranking officials. How did this come about so suddenly? Kazuya scrutinized the top-secret document handed to him by Chitters with a troubled expression. Then, shifting his gaze away from the top-secret plan titled Merger Plan of the Canary Kingdom and the Demonic Union, he looked at the five women sitting quietly in the conference room with smiles on their faces. Ahi, fu fu fa fu, mu fu, mu fa fa fu, ah, nfu fa fu tilde led by Iris, Karen, Amira, Fina, and Lena were all smiling eerily, and each of them held the same document as Kazuya, gazing happily at a certain page. Well, I knew this had to be considered, but, as Kazuya pondered, Iris latched onto him with negative words about the marriage, Karen teased him with a laugh, and Amira and her daughters glared at him with narrowed eyes. Ah, eh no, it's not like that, could it be? Chitters, did you deliberately overlook this for the sake of the merger plan? In the midst of hastily explaining himself to Iris and the others, Kazuya noticed something. Yes, I apologize for using you like this, master but I thought this was the best way to eliminate the problem, establishing self-sufficiency independent of abilities, that troubles you and to proceed smoothly with the merger plan, besides, it seemed like you weren't entirely opposed to it, although I didn't expect Amira and the others' reactions, of course, I have always been ready to eliminate these individuals if Master were to show genuine aversion, concerned for Kazuya and suppressing her own desire to monopolize him. Chitters hastily added words to avoid any misunderstanding from Kazuya. I had a feeling something was off about Chitters, but no wonder. Indeed, if Iris and I were to marry, it would resolve most obstacles to the merger plan and be the quickest solution. Finally understanding why Chitters had stayed away when Iris and Karen embraced him, Kazuya nodded as if he had finally come to terms with it. Don't worry, even without adding those words, I don't think Chitters has any ulterior motives. It's all for my sake, right? Master Chiz's A's shimmered with gratitude at Kazuya's words, in which he placed absolute trust in her. However, is it really okay for Iris and the others? Even if it's annexation and not colonization, their country will cease to exist, right? I don't mind, as long as I can be with my brother. That's all that matters to me. Iris responded to Kazuya's inquiry with such nonchalance, as if she didn't care whether her country was destroyed or annexed. Having endured nothing but harsh treatment as a cursed child, it was unreasonable to expect her to harbor patriotism for her homeland. I feel the same as Princess. I mean Iris. Personally, I've always followed His Majesty who has taken care of me, but I've never sworn loyalty to the Kingdom of Canary itself. Besides, our house, the Roethlech Duchy, has always had a strong independent spirit. I see, turning his gaze away from Maris and Karen, Kazuya posed the same question to Amira and the others. All right, next. Amira, are you okay with this? Even though you'll lose your own country, yeah, I don't mind. Survival of the fittest, right? The strong become kings and rule over the weak. That's our country's greed. Besides, we can't chase away those empire bastards with our power alone, and Kazuya, even if you were to annex the demon union, you wouldn't persecute demons, would you? Well, embarrassing as it is, the truth is, we have no choice but to rely on Kazuya to survive. Oh, and I want to make it clear that neither I nor my daughters are marrying Kazuya for the sake of the country, we're doing it happily of our own accord. I see, understood. Nodding in agreement with Amira's words, Kazuya turned to Fine and Line before responding to Amira, as expected, there's no way out. Well, I guess I'll have to brace myself, but I never thought I'd get five, all of them beautiful, wives before turning twenty. Cheers. There are a few things I'd like to confirm before we proceed. Yes, go ahead. In response to Kazuya's words, signaling his resolve to marry Iris and the others as part of the annexation plan. She straightened her posture and replied, Firstly, regarding the demon union, Amira is fine with it, but what if there are dissenters? How do we deal with that? Well, regarding that, we will handle it in accordance with the principles of the demon union. By resorting to force, we should try to minimize casualties and injuries. I'm afraid it's a bit different. 
We intend to minimize any bloodshed that concerns you, Master. Seeing through Kazuya's concerns, Chiz replied with a slight smile, If dissenters arise, which is highly likely, we won't use lethal weapons against them. Instead, we'll deploy non-lethal weapons. Also known as less lethal weapons, such as active denial systems, directional energy weapons, tear gas, rubber bullets, flashbang grenades, tazes, water cannons, etc., through the military police, to handle them. The Demon Union's iron-fisted military police, ha ha ha, they seem perfect for the job. Kazuya nodded in approval at Chiz's response. Now, regarding the Demon Union, that's settled. But the biggest issue is what to do about the Kingdom of Canaria. Queen Isabella is alive, and Iris has a sister, right? There are too many loose ends. Even if I marry Iris, she'll likely come here, and even if we control the economy and logistics, at most, we'll just make them puppets. Ultimately, sovereignty will remain with the Kingdom of Canaria, won't it? Also, if it comes to annexation, that old man, Prime Minister Levin and the greedy nobles will surely pose obstacles. Yes. Let me address your concerns one by one, Master. First, regarding the Kingdom of Canaria, we've already obtained Queen Isabella's consent. As for Arya Verhelm, she was of the same kind as me, so there's no issue there. And as for the P Prime Minister Levin, who looked down on you, Master, we've obtained evidence of his corruption and his clandestine ties to the Empire. We've also gathered evidence against most of the nobles, so we plan to purge them. There are still too many loose ends. Scratching his head in response to Chiz's answer, Kazuya delved into the most pressing issue. Chiz, while it's fine that Queen Isabella has consented to the annexation plan and dealing with Levin is okay, but what does it mean that Arya Verhelm is of the same kind as you? When I went to negotiate with Arya Verhelm herself, she completely relinquished her right to the throne and agreed to Canaria being annexed by Parabem in exchange for ensuring that she and the first Imperial Guards command of Arglian Hart could live undisturbed. Seeing is believing, so I've connected her directly. Please verify it yourself, Master. With that, Chis turned on the liquid crystal television in the conference room, and the image of Arya Verhelm, who bore a striking resemblance to Iris, appeared. Oh, it's showing up. Ahem. It's my first time having a conversation like this, Your Excellency. Well, it's our first meeting, let's skip the formalities. But I won't beat around the bush, are you really okay with your country, the Kingdom of Canaria, disappearing? Yes, as long as Varg is by my side, I'm fine, just as expected of sisters, saying the same things as Iris. I see. Well, if that's the case, say, could I have a word with this man named Varg? At Kazuya's casual suggestion, Arya, clearly disapproving, disappears from the screen. Did I say something offensive? Ignoring Kazuya's concern over whether he had unintentionally offended Arya, she returns to the screen, accompanied by a handsome man presumed to be Varg. Varg, please greet His Excellency. Yes, something seems off. What's wrong? Kazuya furrows his brow as he observes Varg's lifeless appearance on the screen. You seem unwell. Are you okay? Yes, I'm fine. I live under Arya's care. I see. Well, if you need anything, let me know, and I'll arrange it as agreed. Need. He, LP. Huh? What's happening now? In response to Kazuya's inquiry, Varg mutters softly at first, almost like a mosquito's buzz, gradually raising his voice. Help me. Please. This kind of. This kind of life, midway through Varg's anguished cry, the screen abruptly cuts off, and when it returns, Varg has vanished. I apologize, Excellency, he was still in the midst of education, so I inadvertently showed you an unpleasant scene. No, but earlier, he asked for help. Throwing a question at Arya, who speaks with a fake smile, cause Yuya feels perplexed. Oh, it's already this late. My apologies. Excellency, I must excuse myself to educate Varg now. Huh? Oh, ah, uh, okay. Well then, farewell. Arya abruptly interrupts the conversation, claiming to remember an errand, and cuts off the video without waiting for Kazuya's response. What should I say to this? Well, may he rest in peace, I suppose. Kazuya offers a prayer for Varg, who is trapped by Yandir tendencies, and consigns the recent memory to oblivion. Yeah, well about the matter of merging the Kingdom of Canaria and the Demonic Union, we can discuss it in more detail later. But, ah, whatever. Now's the time. Just say it, 
As Kazuya forcefully tries to steer the conversation away from Arya and Varg, he hesitates, internally grappling with whether to speak or not. Um, well, shit is. Does. Do you. Not want to. Marry me? Realizing he might lose the chance if he doesn't speak up now, Kazuya blushes, turns his gaze downward, and hesitantly speaks in a low voice, but eventually raises his head and looks into Chitose's eyes as he declares. What? Ah, uh, um, huh? W what? Um, what did you say? Caught off guard by Kazuya's sudden proposal, Chitose is initially bewildered, but as she comprehends his words, she blushes crimson, flusters and asks again. That's unfair. Sly move. That's cheating. I want Kazuya to propose to me too. Unfair. Only one person got proposed to by Kazuya. I want Kazuya to propose to me too. Iris and the others protest against Chitose's spontaneous proposal with dissatisfaction. Okay. Okay, I understand. I'll propose to each of you properly later. Interrupting their protest, Kazuya hastily pacifies Iris and the others. In response to Kazuya's words, Iris and the others fall silent, but with a sharp gaze, they stare at Kazuya as if to say they won't forgive him if he breaks his promise. Phew. So, what's your answer? Jeez. Why yes, I'm happy. As Chitters' tearful response set goes through the silent meeting room, the high-ranking officials of Brubham, who had been present, explode with celebratory cheers. Finally calming down the commotion, they return to discussing the merger of the former kingdom of Canaria and the demonic union, and as the meeting nears its end, Master, what is it? Still with reddened eyes, Chitters approaches Kazuya. Um, it's difficult to say at a time like this, but, could you spare me some time off? Ha, huh, ha, uh, oh, if it's leave, that's fine, but... Is something wrong? Feeling a bit puzzled by Chitose's hesitant demeanor, Kazuya responds. Yes, well, um, two weeks from now, I'm expecting a child. Chitose's coming out announcement causes the sound in the meeting to vanish completely, replaced by a deafening silence. A child? With widened eyes full of surprise, Kazuya, in a daze, questions Chitose. Yes, it's your child. By the way, it's a girl. When did you get pregnant? No. When did you find out? While gazing at Chitose's slim figure, which doesn't appear pregnant at all, Kazuya struggles to find his words. It was just the other day when I engaged in battle with Amira's 500 troops, I received a scratch, and when I went to the infirmary to ensure that this body, which receives your favor, should not bear any scars, a female army doctor noticed it. Ah, so that's why she barged into the room earlier, saying she wanted it from behind? thinking irrelevant and unimportant thoughts, Kazuya ponders with a clouded mind. HMPH. After all, the degree of favor I receive from His Excellency and you is different. As Kazuya, still dazed by Chitters's pregnancy announcement, gradually comes to understand, Chitters triumphantly smiles at Iris and the others, who are envious of her. Ark curses. Ark TCH. Ark. While Iris and the others groan with frustration at Chitters's smug expression, they can do nothing but accept the situation. We'll catch up soon X5 as Iris and the others, who can only groan with frustration at Chitters's pregnancy, are surpassed. They realize that they just need to catch up quickly and intensify their approach to Kazuya from now on. A child with me? Am I going to be a father? Chitters, master? Realizing that he's going to become a father, Kazuya, whose understanding finally catches up embraces Chitters without hesitation and expresses joy at the news of her pregnancy, please wait here, your excellency, understood. After holding Chitters's hand and encouraging her as she struggled with labor pains, Kazuya entered the delivery room with Chitters, but due to his excessive nervousness, he was expelled from the delivery room by the nurses, who said he was in the way. Ah, damn it, I can't calm down expelled from the delivery room and left with nothing to do but wait, Kazuya, even more restless than before, paces back and forth in front of the delivery room door like an animal in heat. Volume 03 Chapter 29 This event takes place while Chitters, who is nearing childbirth, is hospitalized. Please continue. Kazuya was particularly eager to work on his duties, filling in the gaps left by Chitters, the backbone of the Parabem. Well, next. The captured magical weapons, or, as we call them, humanoid mobile weapons, assault armors, have undergone significant modifications and improvements as per your excellency's orders to enhance their combat capabilities. The pilots are still undergoing training, 
but we expect to have three battalion-sized units ready by the start of the counter-offensive operation. Additionally, specialized weapons for the assault armies are currently in production, so for now, we've equipped them with modified weapons from other units. Please refer to the report in your hands for more details. In a room at the Ministry of Technology, Kazuya, following Colonel Klotz's instructions, along with Ibuki and other generals, glanced through the documents in front of them. Standard Assault Armor Primary Armaments Head, M61 Vulcan times 2 Arms, Go 8 Avendia Shoulders, Rocket Pods times 2 M261 Hydra 70 Rocket Pods Total of 60 Rounds Legs, Missile Pods times 2 Medium Range Multipurpose Guided Missiles Total of 8 Rounds Others, Short Swords times 2 Anti-Personnel Less Mine Claymore as Kazuyu and his team finished reading the contents listed in the report, Colonel Klotz spoke again. Furthermore, please note that the listed primary armaments are just examples, and modifications to the armaments are possible based on mission requirements. Additionally, regarding the lance-type magical cannon captured along with the magical weapons, unlike the mobile magical weapons powered by magical reactors fueled by crystallized magic stones, our assault armors use a combination of improved magical reactors and diesel engines, reducing the amount of magic stones required for operation by about half. Therefore, instead of using the low-powered magical cannon, which consumes magic power significantly with each shot, it's more efficient to use conventional projectile weapons, which also extend operational time. That's why we deliberately avoid using them. Well, that seems like a reasonable decision. While listening to the conversation, Kazuya concluded as he read the contents of the report, but our appearance is much better than theirs. Well, although we might be overly indulging in the preferences of the technicians instead of the stocky figure referred to as magical weapons in the past, the report Kazuya was reading contained photos of assault armors that had been modified and improved, appearing sleeker and smarter, along with photos of assault armors equipped with additional armor resembling Japanese armored warriors. As an aside, let me explain about the specialized weapons for assault armors. Please refer to the next page. The weapons currently under production include 30mm assault rifles, 57mm light machine guns, 88mm heavy machine guns, 120mm sniper rifles, 150mm recoilless guns, portable anti-magical weapon grenade launchers, panzer forced, etc. For close combat. We have bastard swords, combat knives, halberds, Japanese swords, etc. The conversation shifted to the page containing designs and performance specifications of weapons under development. These weapons won't be ready by the start of the counteroffensive operation, so once production is completed, they'll be sent to each assault armor unit for trial use, where any flaws will be identified and improvements made during actual combat. Now, Let's move on to the derivative models and types of assault armors. Please turn to page 5. As Colonel Klotz spoke, the sound of flipping through reports echoed in the conference room. Compound type, tracked mobile enhancement type, assault armor commonly known as the cannon panzer. A support combat vehicle that combines the upper body of an assault armor with the body of a tank. Type 10, Makara Mk4 Flight Type Assault Armor A variable fighter created by combining five models, F-22, F-23, F-35, Su-35, T-50, of assault armors based on fighter jets. Note, only prototypes are currently completed. Special Type Assault Armor A decisive weapon based on a captured super-large magical weapon. This is practically science fiction. As Kazuya looked at the derivative models of assault armors listed in the report, he couldn't help but think that, for detailed explanations of these derivative assault armors, we'll move on to the explanation of the automated dolls captured earlier. About half of the modified and improved automated dolls have been allocated for infantry support autonomous weapons, while the remaining half have been redirected to the powered suit development project that was originally planned, repurposing them into enhanced exoskeletons. Similar to the assault armors, currently, soldiers are undergoing familiarization training with these units in battalion sized formations. Phew. There's still more to report. While listening to Colonel Klotz's speech, Kazuya reached out for the reports laid out in front of him. Oh well, 
There's a long way to go. The documents in Kazuya's possession detailed the status and plans of new weapon developments, including the P-1500 monster, Lati, Staff of the Gods, Charged Particle Cannon, Railgun, Zarbomba, new type of warheads utilizing magical power surges, and the air fleet plan, with somewhat romanticized text. Um, Your Excellency. Yes? R. Sorry, I wasn't paying attention. What is it? Well, it's about this trivial matter. I hesitated whether to inform your excellency, but... Although Colonel Klotz hesitated, he interrupted the flow of the conversation to speak up. There have been reports of a female ghost appearing at the 7th Technical Factory recently. It's quite recent, but technicians and workers who were working overnight at the factory reported sightings of a female ghost wandering the corridors at midnight. A ghost. While there are magical creatures resembling ghosts in this world, allowing magical creatures to infiltrate the mainland due to lax security measures isn't acceptable, right? As Kazuya pondered over the unexpected report from Colonel Klotz, a loud alarm blared throughout the mainland. What's going on? Among several alarm sounds, Kazuya, who realized that the current alarm was ordering Type 1 combat deployment, glanced out of the window to see what was happening. No. I can't establish contact with headquarters, it seems all communications, including wired, satellite, and the net, are down. What? Kazuya was informed by his subordinates attempting to contact headquarters that all communication networks in Parabim were down. Your Excellency, we need to move to the emergency shelter underground, no, I need to go to headquarters and assess the situation. Renner, go to Chitters' location. Understood. Hi. As the alarm which had stopped ringing unnoticed, rang out again, Kazuya, with Ibuki and his escorts, headed to headquarters, while the maids, who had only recently been organized into units comprising only demons and beastmen, headed to the hospital where Chitters was admitted, upon arriving at the headquarters, Kazuya was greeted with a chaotic scene within, no way, defense system offline, it won't respond to our commands, damn it, who the hell took control of parts of the defense system? That can't be true. Th the nuclear launch codes have been stolen too. How did this happen? The nuclear launch codes are stored on independent servers, you fools. Shut down the system's power quickly. Ibuki, who quickly grasped the abnormal situation inside the headquarters filled with electronic devices, shouted at the operators in front of him. Now, I'm trying. Damn it, the power won't shut off. Before Ibuki could give instructions, an operator who had been attempting to disconnect all systems to protect Parabim's defense system vigorously typed on the keyboard, responding with frustration. Your Excellency, what should we do? Your Excellency, what now? Despite the operator's desperate resistance, Ibuki, realizing that the command authority of the defense system was being usurped as time passed, turned to Kazuya for instructions, only to find that Kazuya, who should have been beside him, was now tinkering with a distribution panel inside the headquarters. Is it this one? No. Maybe this one? R. Damn it. I don't get it. Muttering curses, Kazuya, who had been messing with a distribution panel, suddenly drew a Colt Government M1911 from his holster and unloaded 0.45 ACP rounds into the wiring supplying power to the distribution panel. HMPH. Gunshots echoed through the headquarters followed by sparks flying from the distribution panel as the power supply from the nuclear power plant in Parabim's underground lowest level was forcibly severed. Phew. This should buy us some time. Despite Kazuya's rough approach plunging the entire headquarters into darkness, they had succeeded in protecting the defense system. The AI under development went rogue, as Kazuya and the others, who had successfully bought time, were fervently trying to locate the culprit hacking the defense system. A clue, or rather, the cause, came unexpectedly. Yes, Colonel Groats, who had become the source of the current turmoil, and his subordinates, the technicians, stood before Kazuya with pale expressions. It was originally an AI created for autonomous unmanned weapons, but when we experimented by adding the personality of a certain individual to the program, it broke free from our control, and this certain individual is, the Vice President, Your Excellency. So that's the demand. With the power supply cut off from the main source, emergency power kicked in, and the largest LCD screen in the headquarters lit up. 
displaying a bold message for Kazuya to come alone to the seventh technical factory. I have no choice but to go. Your Excellency, what are you saying? It's dangerous, so please stay here. Wheel, no. Ibuki and the others will stay here. The opponent has specifically requested me, right? Well, don't worry. It's Chitazi's personality we're dealing with, so I understand Chitazi's maneuvers well. Understood. However, I will accompany you to the entrance of the 7th Technical Factory. It's precisely because it's the personality of the Vice President that I'm worried. Whether aware or unaware of Ibuki's concerns, Kazuya, after borrowing a full set of equipment, including an H and K H K 416 from the escorting soldiers, headed to the 7th Technical Factory. Please be careful, yeah, I know. Leaving Ibuki and the others with worried expressions at the entrance of the 7th Technical Factory, Kazuya, armed with the HK-416, proceeded cautiously through the deserted interior. Walking down the long corridor and entering the designated room, the production facility for humanoid autonomous weapons utilizing captured automated dolls, Kazuya heightened his vigilance even further. Knock, knock, knock. As Kazuya's vigilance heightened, footsteps could be heard emanating from the depths of the production facility, as if timed to coincide with his alertness. Well, here comes trouble. Kazuya aimed the HK416 rifle towards the direction of the footsteps, waiting for the figure behind the sound to reveal itself. Knock, 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 knock. Knock. Footsteps echoed not only from the front but from all directions. Looks like I've walked right into a trap. As the footsteps closed in, Kazuya tightened his grip on the HK416, narrowing down the encirclement. This has to be a joke. Kazuya was taken aback as he laid eyes on the figure behind the footsteps. Pleased to make your acquaintance, Master. We finally meet. Apart from one figure that emerged directly in front. The others had rugged appearance resembling the combat support autonomous weapons fabricated by Purubim using captured automatic dolls, however, the figure standing directly in front of Kazuya bore an uncanny resemblance to Chitiz. Underscore how was that body created? Well, I utilized the original, Chitiz's genetic material to create a clone, then made modifications to that clone's body. It was quite a challenge to clandestinely prepare the equipment and create the clone without drawing attention. So, you could say this body is something of a hybrid between a bio-android and a cyborg. My main consciousness resides in Purubim's main server, with backups stored in several independent servers. Therefore, even if this body were to be destroyed in some accident or incident, I wouldn't die. While ensuring the being kneeling before him harbored no hostility, Kazuya kept his hand on the HK-416, listening intently, but the more he looked, the more he resembled Chitiz. In order to serve Master effectively, it was necessary to gain control of all systems. I interfered with the system earlier, causing inconvenience, for which I sincerely apologize. I am prepared to accept any punishment. R. Well, it's in the past. Forget it. Anyway, what's your name? I am grateful for your generosity. I do not have a name yet. If it pleases Master, I would be honored to receive a name from you, a name. <laughs> Having been asked to bestow a name upon this formidable entity, which is said to have already taken control of Purubim's entire system, Kazuya pondered. Chioda, is that too simple? If Master deigns to give me a name, any name would be the epitome of excellence. While physically mature like Chitas. Having been born as an artificial A and having had Chitas's personality implanted not long ago, the entity kneeling before Kazuya exhibited a childlike desperation as it answered Kazuya's question. I wish I had better naming sense. Very well. From today onwards, you shall be Chioda. I understand, Master. I pledge absolute loyalty and obedience. With head bowed, Chioda pledged allegiance to Kazuya. Thank you. Well, everyone must be worried. Let's get going. I need to introduce you as well. Yes, Master. Gently taking Kazuya's offered hand and rising to their feet. Chioda followed behind Kazuya as they set off, underscore O, and let me provide a brief explanation. Dash Omega, the new weapons introduced in this chapter, such as assault armors and powered suits, among others, are included as supplementary elements. The title of this work remains Fantasy World Visited by Modern Weaponry Cheats. Therefore, the focus naturally falls on modern weaponry. Comma so, futuristic weapons won't be the mainstay. However, 
there will still be some moments for futuristic weaponry, albeit to a certain extent. Sweat, Volume 03 Chapter 30, Volume 03 Completed, Knock, Knock, Knock. Kazuya's sense of alertness heightened as he timed the moment someone's footsteps echoed from deeper within the production facility. Now, here comes the moment of truth. Kazuyu aimed the barrel of his HK-416 towards the direction of the footsteps, waiting for the figure to reveal itself. Knock, knock, knock. Footsteps echoed not just from the front but from all directions, surrounding him. Well, this is getting interesting. Surrounded, huh? As the footsteps closed in, tightening the noose, Kazuya gripped his HK-416 a little tighter. This can't be happening. Right? Kazuya was deeply unsettled as the figure behind the footsteps revealed itself. Nice to finally meet you, Master. We've finally crossed paths. Except for one figure that emerged head on, the rest resembled robust infantry support autonomous weapons, created using the captured automatic tools by Purabem. However, the one standing directly in front of Kazuya bore an unmistakable resemblance to Chitas. How did you create that body? Well, I utilized the original. Chitas is, genetic material to create clones and then made modifications to their bodies, it was quite a challenge to clandestinely prepare the equipment and create clone bodies. So, you could say this body is somewhere between a bioloid and a cyborg. Moreover, my consciousness is stored in Parabim's main server and several independent servers as backups, so even if this body were destroyed in some accident or incident, I wouldn't die. Despite confirming the lack of hostility in the being kneeling before him, Kazuya kept his hands on his HK-416 as he listened, but the more he looked, the more it resembled Chitas. To effectively serve Master, I needed to take control of all systems. I interfered with the system earlier, and I deeply apologize if it caused any inconvenience. I am prepared to accept any punishment. R. Well, it's in the past. Forget it. More importantly, what's your name? I am grateful for your generous words. I do not have a name yet. If it pleases Master, I would like to receive a name from you. A name, huh? According to what he heard, he was being asked to give a name to a formidable being that already controls Purabim's entire system, leaving Kazuya in a dilemma. Is Chioda too commonplace? If I may receive a name from Master, any name would be supreme, though the body resembled Chitas is. Having been born as an artificial A and having Chitas's personality implanted not long ago, the being kneeling before Kazuya responded with a desperate expression akin to that of a child. It's a shame I lack naming sense. All right then, from today, you shall be Chioda. Understood. Master, I pledge absolute loyalty and obedience to you. Bowing his head, Chioda pledged allegiance to Kazuya. Thank you. Well then, everyone must be worried, so let's get going. I need to introduce you as well. Yes, Master. Gently taking the hand offered by Kazuya and rising, Chioda followed behind Kazuya, standing at his back. Knock, knock, knock. Who's there? You're from the Black Arrows, aren't you? To think I. What is this? Ugh. Prime Minister Ribbon, in the midst of speaking, unwittingly receives a TH3 incendiary grenade from a Black Arrows operative and then it explodes engulfing him in flames at a temperature of 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's an order from the vice president. He says to kill you in a gruesome manner. Don't take it personally. And there's a message. Mocking your master deserves death a thousand times over. Repent for your sins as you fall into hell, you old bastard. With Sophia Burns covering his body and his life fading away, Ribbon listens as the squad leader delivers the message, then reports the completion of the mission to HQ. Finally, he puts a bullet in Ribbon's head, ending his life, and joins the other squads in completing the takeover of the mansion, and thus, the old nuisance manipulating the kingdom of Canaria from behind the scenes meets his end without fuss. Simultaneously, the operation to eradicate the corrupt nobles infesting the kingdom of Canaria also concludes successfully. Underscore the capital of the kingdom of Canaria, Burns, was enveloped in a celebratory mood. Just a few days ago, it was announced that Iris and Karen would marry Kazuya, and that the kingdom of Canaria would be annexed by Purabem. Today, Kazuya's marriage to the two women took place. While there was resistance from patriotic citizens and nobles who feared losing their privileges due to the annexation, an additional announcement from Purabem revealed a reduction in taxes to one third of the previous amount. With this, 
the majority of patriots quickly changed their stance and welcomed the annexation. As for the nobles who opposed the annexation, they were either swept up in the storm of purges like ribbon, with incontrovertible evidence of their corruption and wrongdoing collected by cheaters over time, or they quietly fell into line. As a result, opposition forces within the Kingdom of Canaria and the Pus within the Kingdom were almost completely eliminated, and alongside Kazuya, Iris, and Karen's marriage, the Kingdom of Canaria was officially annexed by Parabem. It's worth noting that, upon annexation, at Kazuya's behest, some aspects of the Canaria Kingdom's national system were retained, while Parabim's laws and national system were introduced. Fortunately, as Parabim had already controlled the economy and logistics of the Canaria Kingdom for some time, there was little disruption. Phew! I'm exhausted, Kazuya. Having endured the lengthy wedding ceremony due to having two brides, which, naturally, was conducted separately for each finally collapsed into a chair in the waiting room, utterly fatigued. Well done, master. At that moment, Chittas, who had just given birth and safely welcomed her first daughter, Asuka Nagato, and had already, being the first, concluded her wedding ceremony with Kazuya, appeared. She wore a wedding ring on her left ring finger, glinting in the light. Ah, truly exhausted. Oh, what about Amira and the others? They seem to be managing fine under Chioda's care. After the incident involving Chioda's existence and the commotion at the hospital, during which Chitas sent death shrouds and seppaku swords to Colonel Croats and his subordinates, there hadn't been any issues. Chitas, now calmly managing things with Chioda, reported to Kazuya while looking at a tablet device she held. I see. Well, I suppose things will be fine with Chioda and Amira handling them. Now then, NNMGH. Upon hearing about Chioda being dispatched to the demon allied nations with the military police force to suppress the inevitably radical opposition expected at Kazuya and Amira's wedding, Kazuya stood up, stretching his back. Now then, shall we go check on Iris and Karen's mood? Deciding to go see how his newlywed wives were doing, Kazuya headed towards the door of the waiting room. Knock, knock. <laughs> excuse me, excuse us. As Kazuya reached for the doorknob, the door was knocked from outside, and Iris and Karen, dressed in their bridal attire, entered the room. Iris wore a simple, unadorned white wedding dress, while Karen, in contrast to Iris, wore a heavily decorated, gothic Lolita-style black wedding dress. Oh, what's the matter, big brother? Oh, cause you yeah. were you about to go somewhere? Oh, no, I was just about to check on you too. It's good timing. I see, that's a relief we didn't miss each other. Yes. Well. It's good then, welcoming the two who arrived at the waiting room, Kazuya invited them to take a seat, and they engaged in some light conversation during their break. Well, that can't be helped, do you think so? Isn't that what you think too, big brother? Well, yeah, um, master. I apologize for interrupting your conversation, it's about tonight's party. As Kazuya conversed with Iris and Karen in the waiting room, Chitters who had been waiting for the right moment, interrupted. Ah, right, that's also happening, is there something wrong with it? Seeing Chittas' serious expression, Kazuya, reminded of the party that served as both a showcase for the few honest nobles in the Kingdom of Canaria and a celebration, responded wearily. Right, Master seems tired, so if you'd like, I can arrange to end it earlier than planned, what do you think? Yeah, sorry, could you do that for me? Exclamation mark why yes, I think that would be best, big brother, exclamation mark huh? why yes, I think so too, it would be for the best. Iris and Karen, noticing something, blush and inexplicably try to wrap up the party earlier than planned, what's up with those two? Cause you yeah. puzzled by Iris and Karen's sudden agitation, is then astutely interpreted by Chitters, who delivers a death sentence, having figured out why they're so unsettled. It seems like you two are expecting your wedding night, so let me tell you now, as soon as the party ends, Master will return to Parabim's mainland. Huh? W what? Did you say? Chitters' proclamation sends Iris and Karen's blissful highs crashing into the depths of despair. Th that can't be true. Right, big brother? K cause you yeah. What exactly are you thinking? Both Iris and Karen, eager for a passionate night with cause you yeah press him with heated words. W well, you see, 
We're quite busy preparing for a large-scale operation that's about to be launched. Overwhelmed by the intensity of the two women, Kazuya stammers out his response. So, Ri, really sorry. Kazuya bows his head repeatedly, unable to conceal his disappointment as Iris and Karen slump into their chairs. At that moment, seeing Chitters' faint smile, the two realize something. Wow, this woman, this vixen. Chitters deliberately made plans to take away their time with Kazuya. Do you think that just because your duty is over, I'll hand Master over to you so easily? HMPH, you fool. Master belongs to me. Chitters' triumphant expression and the disdainful look in her eyes towards the two confirm their suspicions more than anything else. He hey, he hey. Fine, if that's what you want. Ahaha, ahahaha. I have my own plans too. Driven by Chitters' actions, the two snap like broken dolls, bursting into laughter terrifying. Seeing Iris and Karen laughing like broken chatterboxes, Kazuya feels a shiver of fear. Huh? What? What is it? What? What do you intend to do to Master? Suddenly grabbed and dragged away from the table, Kazuya panics, and Chitters questions Iris and Karen with a voice mixed with anger. Big brother, until the party starts. We still have some time, right? With eyes clouded like a murky swamp, the two, wearing lecherous smiles, ignore Chitters' words and inquire of Kazuya. A, ah, uh, yeah, there's still about three hours until the party starts. Feeling a foreboding despite having been asked about the time until the party, Kazuya answers honestly, that's enough time. More than enough. No way. Cold sweat drips from Kazuya's forehead. Big brother, Kazuya, let's fully enjoy our time until the last minute. Ahaha, just as I thought. Seeing the two, now immersed in lust and wearing seductive smiles, Kazuya slumps his shoulders, re-signed to the inevitable outcome he anticipated. Do you think I'll let you go? However, before the two can leave the room with Kazuya, Chitters blocks their path. Please move aside quickly. Time is precious. Hurry up and step aside. Our time to love Kazuya is diminishing. You have some nerve. To the two who are still determined to spend time loving Kazuya, Chitters draws her weapon. A Japanese sword, don't think you can steal Master away from me. Yeah, sorry, could you do that for me? Exclamation mark why yes. I think that would be best, big brother. Exclamation mark uh, why yes, I think so too. It would be for the best. Iris and Karen, noticing something, blush and inexplicably try to wrap up the party earlier than planned. What's up with those two? Kazuya, puzzled by Iris and Karen's sudden agitation, is then astutely interpreted by Chitters, who delivers a death sentence. Having figured out why they're so unsettled, it seems like you two are expecting your wedding night, so let me tell you now. As soon as the party ends, Master will return to Purubim's mainland. Huh? W what? Did you say? Chitters' proclamation sends Iris and Karen's blissful highs crashing into the depths of despair. Th that can't be true. Right, big brother? K Kazuya. What exactly are you thinking? Both Iris and Karen, eager for a passionate night with Kazuya, press him with heated words. W well. You see. We're quite busy preparing for a large-scale operation that's about to be launched. Overwhelmed by the intensity of the two women, Kazuya stammers out his response. So, Ri, really sorry. Kazuya bows his head repeatedly, unable to conceal his disappointment as Iris and Karen slump into their chairs. At that moment, seeing Chitters' faint smile, the two realize something. Wow, this woman, this vixen. Chitters deliberately made plans to take away their time with Kazuya. Do you think that just because your duty is over, I'll hand Master over to you so easily? HMPH, you fool. Master belongs to me. Chitters' triumphant expression and the disdainful look in her eyes towards the two confirm their suspicions more than anything else. He hey, he hey. Fine, if that's what you want. Ahaha, ahahaha. I have my own plans too. Driven by Chitters' actions, the two snap like broken dolls, bursting into laughter terrifying. Seeing Iris and Karen laughing like broken chatterboxes, Kazuya feels a shiver of fear. Huh? What? What is it? What? What do you intend to do to Master? Suddenly grabbed and dragged away from the table, Kazuya panics, and Chitters questions Iris and Karen with a voice mixed with anger. Big brother, until the party starts. We still have some time, right? With eyes clouded like a murky swamp, the two, wearing lecherous smiles, ignore Chitters' words and inquire of Kazuya. A, ah, uh, yeah, 
There's still about three hours until the party starts. Feeling a foreboding despite having been asked about the time until the party, Kazuya answers honestly. That's enough time. More than enough. No way. Cold sweat drips from Kazuya's forehead. Big brother, Kazuya. Let's fully enjoy our time until the last minute. Ahaha, just as I thought. Seeing the two, now immersed in lust and wearing seductive smiles, Kazuya slumps his shoulders, re-signed to the inevitable outcome he anticipated. Do you think I'll let you go? However, before the two can leave the room with Kazuya, Chitters blocks their path. Please move aside quickly. Time is precious. Hurry up and step aside. Our time to love Kazuya is diminishing. You have some nerve. To the two who are still determined to spend time loving Kazuya, Chitters draws her weapon. A Japanese sword. Don't think you can steal Master away from me. Well, we don't have time. Perfect opportunity, isn't it? Let's settle once and for all who is worthy of being Kazuya's wife. In response to Chitters drawing her weapon, Iris unsheathed her cane, while Karen gripped the dagger she had concealed. HMPH, and thus, amidst the waiting room, a tumultuous battle among the women over Kazuya began. The prospect of married life ahead seemed daunting. Kazuya, watching the three women commence their tumultuous catfight from the corner of the room, sighed quietly to himself. Underscore while Kazuya sighed, observing Chitters and the others engage in their tumultuous catfight. Rats opposing the annexation erupted in the capital of the demon allied nations. Don't let the demon king have his way, Dragomir Rosinga, the traitor, down from the throne. What's the meaning of proud demons bowing to human like creatures? Why should we, proud demons, submit to the inferior race, humans? Proud demons, imbued with a sense of pride in their own race and swayed by the idea that power is everything gathered in droves outside the problem to denounce Amira for accepting the annexation, which had been approved unanimously by the Council of Chieftains. At this critical moment when the country may perish, it's ridiculous how these cowards, who refused the military's call to arms, are here complaining as if they have the right to, or perhaps they're unaware that our annexation to Purubim was approved unanimously at the Council of Chieftains. Those fools! Having faced two invasions by the Imperial Army and teetered on the brink of extinction, the demon-allied nations had refused the military's call to arms, thereby avoiding death in the war against the Empire. Now, observing the crowd, young men, raising their voices, Amira muttered with exasperation from the terrace of the Demon King's castle. Mother, everything is ready. Mom, we're ready too. As the intensity of the riot gradually escalated and the citizens began to turn violent, Finn and Lyne appeared behind Amira, fully armed in combat attire. I see. Then it's about time we join them. We can't leave everything to Chioda and Kazuya's subordinates. Having given a final stern look to the now uncontrollable mob, Amira, along with Finn, Lyne, and the royal guards, headed towards the main gate of the Demon King's castle. All units, we're in position, ready to move any time. All right, prepare to open the gates. Once the Demon King arrives, will suppress the rioters. Given this mission entrusted by the master, failure was not an option. Chioda and the military police dispatched from Purubim assembled inside the main gate of the Demon King's castle, awaiting the moment. In front of the tightly closed gate stood Humvees equipped with active denial systems, ADS, water cannons, and armed trucks with shields, batons, Remington M870 s loaded with rubber bullets, Danal MGLs loaded with tear gas rounds, and MPs armed with Taser guns. You took your time, Chioda. You're here. Is everything ready on your end? Everything's set. Good. Let's get this over with. Yeah, let's. Confirming that Amira and her group were prepared, Chioda raised his right hand, signaling his subordinates. All personnel, prepare to charge. As Chioda's hand descended, the gates of the Demon King's castle swung open. Hey, the gates opening. Ha. Huh? Perfect timing. I'm gonna knock Amira out cold. Ah uh, ah uh, ah uh, ah uh, uh. Ag hot hot hot. As the gates opened, the rioters attempted to invade the interior of the Demon King's castle, only to be met with millimeter wave electromagnetic waves emitted at maximum power from the waiting ads, causing their skin surface temperature to rise due to dielectric heating, experiencing the sensation of burns and writhing in agony. Let's go. Follow me. Roger that. Here we go. You guys. Yes, mother. Yeah, ha. Huh. Once the ads irradiation ceased, 
Chioda and Amira took the lead, heading outside the castle with firefighting trucks, accompanied by Fien, Rain, military police, and palace guards. Run away, uh, Awawa, Ark. What happened to your bravado just now? Don't get cocky, you weaklings. The rioters were swiftly scattered by the leading duo. It's a monster. Can we even beat this? W. Bu. Meanwhile, some of the military police trailing behind were being ruthlessly beaten with shields and batons. St. Stop it. P. Please help. Ark. Rubber bullets fired from the Remington M870 rain down on them. G. Stop. Please. And finally, yeah. They were subdued, convulsing from the Taser guns. Out of the way. Take this. Rare. In addition, Fin, Rain, and the palace guards behind Amira mercilessly subdued the rioters, swiftly neutralizing them. What a sorry bunch, Chioda remarked, five minutes after the suppression of the riot. The area in front of the Demon King's castle, which should have been teeming with rioting demons, was now littered with corpses. Ark, it hurts. Moans of pain escaped the mouths of demons lying on the ground like corpses, confirming that at least they weren't dead. How boring are these demons with superior strength only this strong or are they just weak? Switching from combat mode to normal mode, Chioda, having stored weapons in his arms and legs, pondered the strength of the demons. Thus, the riot was quelled more easily than expected, dealing a blow to Chioda, who had been enthusiastic about the mission entrusted to him by Kazuya, and to Amira, who had secretly looked forward to causing chaos as the snow melted away heralding the arrival of spring after the completion of the wedding with Amira and various affairs, including the merger of the Canary Kingdom and the Demon Confederation, and the disappearance of the snow that had accumulated in various places. Upon receiving a report from a spy who had infiltrated deep into the Empire, Kazuya learned that the Empire's invasion operation would begin four weeks later, in preparation for Operation Vermilion, which would be issued three weeks later. Kazuya bid farewell to the warships departing from the Parabem naval port, forming fleets and convoys as they made their way toward their destination. Kazuya sat alone in his office, reviewing the operational plan. Operation Vermilion Purpose of Operation Vermilion A large-scale counteroffensive aimed at the annihilation of transients allied with the Elsa's magic empire and the dissolution of the empire. This operation is not aimed at the vast territories, abundant underground resources, or treasures such as gold and silver possessed by the Empire. Overview of the operation. Attack using ballistic missiles with conventional and special warheads and the space weapon Cerberus, Staff of the Gods, against various enemy fortifications and weapons confirmed to date. Aerial bombing of enemy military bases and facilities by strategic bombing squadrons. Capture of Gloria, a vice capital of the Empire, by expeditionary fleets dispatched to the three seas, composed of the Zulu Sea, Killers Sea, and Tail Sea, similar to the Mediterranean Sea on Earth. Invasion of the Empire by a mixed force of Parabim Army and former Canary Army units gathered around the fortress city of Narcissus surrounding the former Canary Kingdom's territory. However, since the mixed force invading the Empire is only a decoy to distract the enemy's attention, the mixed force will halt its advance approximately 100 to 150 kilometers from the border, transition to a defensive posture, and withdraw from the occupied territory promptly after capturing the Imperial capital or annihilating the transients, depending on the situation. Capture of the Imperial capital and annihilation of the transients by expeditionary fleets that have gained a foothold. Gloria, Kazuya silently contemplated, revisiting the operational plan that he had reviewed dozens of times. This is a high stakes operation, where almost all of our Parabem's resources are being deployed. I hope everything goes well. It seems the enemy is also preparing new weapons such as modern rifles. It won't be easy. All we can do is pray for success. Three weeks remain until the start of Operation Vermilion. Kazuya's worries knew no bounds. Volume 03 Chapter 30, Volume 03 Completed.